Harvest Day, written by R. Kyle Hanna, narrated by Rick McVeigh, copyright 2019 by R. Kyle Hanna and Jumpmaster Press, production copyright 2020 by R. Kyle Hanna and Jumpmaster Press. Chapter 1 Chief Borda pulled on the reins, stopping his horse on a small rise. The sweat of the beast filled the air with the pungent odor. It huffed from exertion, the horse's flanks moving rapidly as it sucked in air. The black stallion whinnied, shook its mane, and stomped its foot as Borda's dark eyes scanned the grassy field before him. Dozens of warriors met in combat, hacking and slashing with spears, short swords, hatchets, and double-bladed axes. Blood stained the calf-high grass, glistening crimson in the midday sun. Dull metal glinted in the bright light, and the echo of steel on steel reached out to the big chief. Men fell to the ground, adding more blood to the already saturated ground. A great lake formed the northern perimeter of the battlefield. Borda glanced that direction, squinting at the reflective surface that stretched to the horizon. A steady breeze flowed from that direction, cooling the sweat on Borda's skin. He adjusted the bright yellow headband he wore, wiping the sweat from his eyes, he rubbed his left thigh, alleviating the pain from a spear wound. His vantage on the small rise offered a good view of the battle, his Tuscara warriors against the rival Auks. Movement to his left drew his attention to the other small rise surrounding the battlefield, this one to the south. Anger swelled, and he clenched his fists as a volley of arrows arched from the sparse trees on the rise. The two-foot-long projectiles fought the southerly wind, landing indiscriminately amongst the fighters on the field. Men from both sides screamed in pain as the arrows found their marks. Most ignored their wounds, continuing the fight. Some paused to snap the arrows protruding from their bodies. A few, those lucky few, fell to the ground, their fight over. Borda touched his left leg again at the sight of the arrows. Sticky wet blood trickled down his thigh, courtesy of the near miss in the opening salvo of the battle. The slice on his leg would heal, he knew, and add yet another scar to his body. Another volley of arrows filled the air, and he snarled. The Tuscara were losing the battle. He turned to look over his left shoulder at Phelan, his main counsel and bodyguard. The tall warrior sat atop a pinto mare, staring at the battle. Long braided hair trailed halfway down his back. His right hand gripped a long spear, the end of the shaft resting on the ground beside his horse. The warrior, his left eye blind and glassy, a wound from years earlier, turned to stare at Borda. He motioned with his head toward the rise to the south. Borda nodded, acknowledging what he already knew. Those arrows must be stopped. The chief looked past Phelan to a teenager sitting on a brown mare. The warrior-to-be gripped his reins tightly, his knuckles white. He leaned forward on his horse, watching the battle progress before him. Borda saw the anticipation, the longing to prove himself, and felt a touch of remorse. You will get your chance all too soon, the chief thought. Samish, Borda called. The boy's head jerked around, his eyes locked on the chief. Borda noticed the boy wore a headband much like his own. It, too, soaked in sweat. Ride to Duran. Tell him to attack the southern rise. Samish's eyes flicked back to the battle. Borda added an edge to his voice. Go, now. Samish nodded, pulled the reins to turn his horse away from the chief, and galloped down the slope toward a group of eight riders a quarter mile away, the reserve force for the Tuscara. Borda turned his attention back to the melee. He slid a long-handled hatchet from his belt and twirled it in the air. The weight felt good in his hand. He looked at the weapon, dried blood crusted on the blade. He bellowed a long, rage-induced war cry and spurred his stallion off the small rise. Duran listened as Simish relayed the orders from his father, Chief Borda. A smile uplifted the corners of his mouth as his eyes turned from the boy and surveyed his target. He watched as a volley of arrows shot from the hill, 
disappearing from his view as they slid behind the rise where his father had been observing the battle. Daron could not see the battle from his vantage, but heard the screams of the wounded. The sound sent his heart racing. Daron's bright brown eyes plotted his path up the small hill, noting possible ambush points as Samish finished his report. Daron rubbed his large nose and turned to address the messenger. Go now, boy, he said, pulling a bow draped across his back. His hand touched the quiver lying diagonally across his back. And stay out of our way. It is time for warriors to battle. The bow and the reins in his left hand, he produced an arrow from the quiver with his right. He notched the projectile onto the bowstring and turned to the small reserve force, seven riders. Each warrior held a spear or a bow, staring at the distant hill. Deron kicked his horse's flanks and felt the powerful muscles as the animal took off at a gallop, leaving Samish behind. He leaned forward, holding the reins lightly, and let the animal run. A quick glance behind him confirmed his warriors followed. Deron and his party crossed a 300-yard open expanse before the ground began to incline. He looked to his right and saw the battle for the first time. A melee of flesh and steel occupied the field, the brief glimpse a blur before he entered a sparse grove of trees that obscured his vision. The riders closed into a single file line, slowing to a quick trot. Deron traveled a rough dirt path that cut through the small forest and narrowed as the ground began to incline. The grassland gave way to rocky outcroppings, and the warrior slowed his mount. The trotting hooves quieted as they slowed more. He pulled the reins to stop his steed as the trail ended at the base of a steep cliff. The clang of metal and the war cries of the exhausted warriors drifted from his right. Rocks, trees, and scrub brush obscured his view of the battle, but the sounds confirmed it raged on. He kept his eyes on the incline above him, scanning the most likely ambush locations and for signs of the auks. Trees grew sparse on the rocky crest of the hill. The few trees cast shadows, providing shade for Duran and his warriors. An enemy warrior rose from behind a large boulder twenty yards up the trail, a large spear primed in his right hand. The auk released the spear, and Duran felt the wind as it soared over his head. He pulled and released his arrow as someone screamed behind him. The auk warrior clutched his chest and fell, disappearing behind the rock he hid behind. Duran glanced back as he reached for a second arrow and saw a rider lying on the ground. The spear stuck straight up from his abdomen, pointing toward the sky. Duran snarled, released the reins, and keeping the bow in his left hand, the arrow notched with his right, he slid from his horse. His leather-wrapped feet touched the hard rock path as more Auk warriors appeared up the hill above them. Duran released his arrow, drew another, and released that one before leaving the trail and taking cover behind a nearby tree. His back to the tree, he looked to his right and saw his remaining warriors taking cover as well. A hail of spears and arrows sliced through the air, impacting trees and ricocheting off rocks. The auks effectively pinned them down. But I am taking some of their warriors from the fight, Deron thought. He rounded the tree to his left and released his arrow. He pulled a second, then a third from his quiver, sending them up the incline in rapid succession. He watched an auk grab his neck and tumble down the hill. The wounded man stopped abruptly as his body fell flat on a large boulder a dozen yards away. Deron quickly retreated behind his tree as a dozen arrows impacted the wood. He notched another arrow and looked at his men. They crouched behind rocks and trees, tomahawks and swords in hand, ready to fight. A thin smile touched his lips as he pulled the bowstring back. He rounded the corner of tree he hid behind, released the arrow, and reached for another. His war cry echoed up the hillside, sounding very much like his father's. Chief Borda swung his long-handled hatchet and felt the weapon impact the side of an auk warrior's head. The chief abandoned his horse and waded deep into the melee. Blood covered his face, body, and weapon, a trail of wounded auk in his wake. He swung the hatchet again, a backhand that caught a warrior behind the knee. 
The man screamed and dropped to the ground. Borda moved on. The battle lulled momentarily, and Borda sucked in a deep lungful of air. The sweat of the men still standing and the pungent odor of the blood-soaked ground engulfed him. Only a few dozen warriors remained standing, most of them stumbling with exhaustion. Nearly four times that number lay on the field, dead or dying in the calf-high grass. Chief Borda, a voice called over grunts of those still fighting. The clang of metal on metal stopped, and all eyes on the field turned to the west. A tall, brown-skinned man sat atop a shimmering white horse fifty yards outside of the battle. He wore a brightly adorned animal-hide vest, his long black hair braided down his back. Four warriors armed with spears surrounded the Auk chief Perron. He too carried a spear, the end of the shaft resting on the ground. He took a breath, and his voice echoed over the quiet field. Chief Borda, the Tuscara have fought bravely, but you are beaten. Surrender now, and I will plead to the overseers on your behalf. I do not want to see your brave warriors die a senseless death. Borda's eyes looked skyward at the mention of the overseers. A small shadow crossed his vision. The alien drone, somewhere out of sight high above, blocked the sun for a moment. He sighed as he turned his attention back to Perrin. Either his men die here in battle, or die later at the hands of the aliens for losing the battle. There was really no choice. There is honor to die in battle, Borda replied, gripping the wooden handle tightly. The weight affirmed his decision. There is none to die at the hands of unseen overlords. Perrin nodded his understanding. To an honorable death. To an honorable death, the assembled warriors, both Tuscara and Auk, repeated. Borda twirled the hatchet. An honorable death. His heart raced as his thoughts turned to Duran fighting to the south and Serena, his daughter, in the Tuscara village a mile to the east. The thought of what the overseers would do to his village filled him with anger. The loss of life will be tremendous and without honor. The fourteen remaining Tuscara warriors surrounded Borda, forming a large circle around their chief. The Auks, almost twice in number, created a ring around the Tuscara. Chief Borda saw sadness in the eyes of the Auks. They took no pleasure in what had to be done. He felt the same way. Borda opened his mouth to speak, when a low rumble drew his attention to the west. Cavalry, he thought, turning his head in that direction. I did not think Perrin had any left. The noise grew louder, and Borda looked skyward. A fireball streaked across the sky, burning up the atmosphere as it drew closer. Many took a knee as the fireball passed nearly overhead. Borda clasped his hands over his ears, turned his head, and watched the object disappear over the horizon. The assembled warriors clapped their hands over their ears as a loud boom shook the battlefield. Heat from the fireball washed over the battlefield, the calf-high brown grass leaning sideways in the wind. The prophecy! Perrin yelled, holding his spear over his head sideways. Return to the village! Return to the village! The Auk warriors turned and fled the battlefield, leaving their weapons lying in the blood-soaked grass and dirt. Many grabbed abandoned horses, riding away like madmen as they churned up the ground. Borda watched the Auks leave the hill to the south, Duran and his band in pursuit. Duran, Borda called, waving at Duran. The young warrior pointed toward the retreating Auks, and Borda waved at him again to end the chase. Reluctantly, Duran changed course and met his father and the remaining Tuscara in the middle of the battlefield. Why did they retreat? Phelan asked, standing beside Borda. Blood soaked his coyote hide shirt. A large bruise highlighted the left side of his face. Blood trickled from a gash in his left ear. The prophecy, Borda grumbled. The warriors gathered around their chief. It was foretold that on the eve of the Tuscara's darkest period, a great ball of fire would appear in the sky. It would bring death and destruction to our enemies and free us from their tyranny. And the Auks were winning, one warrior said, his hands on his knees, as he gasped for breath. They thought it would destroy them? Maybe, Borda said. He looked skyward, 
but could not see the mechanical eyes that normally floated high above. The prophecy was not specific to which enemy. If the prophecy is true, the coming days will be very interesting. Chapter 2 Captain Gregory Mac McMillan tightened the straps holding him in the seat for the hundredth time. He rubbed his legs, increasing circulation to fight off cramps from the four-hour-long flight inside the cramped cockpit. He scratched his nose. The rough, bulky glove solved the itch in seconds. He stared out the cockpit window, counting four white, puffy clouds in the blue sky far below. Perfect day for a launch, he said. What was that, Mac? A feminine voice asked, her voice loud in his headset. Just commenting on what a great day it is to fly into space, Mac responded. He stretched his six-foot frame as best he could, careful not to hit any of the controls in the cramped cockpit. The Charger, the newest model of NASA Space Corps spacecraft, sat atop a Boeing 757 somewhere over the southwestern United States. The piggyback combo cruised at nearly 40,000 feet. Mac had flown the ship before in two test flights, but today he would take it to space. The thought made his heart race. Although the engineers ensured him this was a completely new design of ship, Mac swore he could see remnants of the space shuttle, the SR-71 Blackbird, and the F-18 Hornet in the design. This is almost the experimental $6 million man ship that Steve Austin crashed in the TV show, he thought. I hope this flight goes better than his. The Charger boasted a broad, flat, aerodynamic fuselage that curved into long, swept-back wings. The wingtips arched upwards, adding stability for atmospheric flight. Three horizontal engines promised what the engineers called unsurpassed acceleration. The cockpit sunk deep into the fuselage, creating unbroken lines and an aerodynamic profile never before seen in a spacecraft. One last time, the female voice purred through his headset, go through your mission. Max sighed. After I detach from the 747, I throttle up and achieve orbit. Once clear of any satellites or other orbital debris, I engage the experimental engines the eggheads at NASA dreamed up. If those work properly and I don't explode, scattering my atoms throughout the cosmos, I set a course for the moon. The main point of my mission is to test the engines for inter-system travel. I accelerate to the moon, slingshot around, and spend the next eight hours decelerating so I don't burn up in the atmosphere. They cover it? Minus the attitude, Captain, yes. The female voice scoffed. The countdown hold is almost over. Is there anything you need before we commence? A smile split Mac's face as he touched the play button on his iPod. He had been waiting for this moment since they strapped him in and the jumbo jet took off over four hours earlier. The steady beat of Major Tom filled the comm line. Send me up a drink, Mac joked, singing along with the song. I'll do that, she snickered, as soon as you make Major. Now turn that off, Captain and get ready to launch. Yes, ma'am, Mac replied, cutting off the music and tightening his straps again. He touched the control stick for the first time, felt his adrenaline flow, and smiled. Ready for launch. Time ticked slowly as Mac stared out the clear canopy of the small experimental spaceship. Spaceship, he thought. My dream of flying in space achieved. His thoughts drifted to his childhood, playing with toys from Star Wars, Space 1999, Battlestar Galactica, and even creating some unique craft using Micronauts. Those imaginative toys and dreams led to his pilot's license at 19, joining the Marines at 20, and joining the astronaut program with the Space Corps at 28. Now, at 31, he sat strapped aboard the first inter-system capable ship on its maiden voyage. T-30 the female voice said over the headset. Good luck, Captain. Thank you, Houston, Mac replied, lowering his face shield and going over his suit one last time. Satisfied, he placed his left hand on the throttle, his right on the control stick between his legs. His eyes scanned the controls, verifying altitude, speed, and heading. Ten. Mac inhaled sharply, calming his nerves. Just another test flight. He closed his eyes and exhaled. Five, he opened his eyes and gripped the controls a little tighter. Four, his heart raced. Three, Mac touched a button on the throttle and felt a vibration course through the charger as the main engines ignited. Two, see you on the other side, 
Mac murmured, recalling a line from an old 80s song. One, the charger detached from the top of the 747. Mac watched the wings of the jetliner fall away as the airplane dove, leaving him in solitude high above the earth. The aerodynamic vessel coasted for several seconds, gravity and inertia pulling and slowing the ship. The charger nosed down. Zero, Mac muttered and engaged the engines. G-forces pushed him into his seat as the two outboard engines accelerated the charger. Mac pulled back on the control stick, raising the nose and shooting the small craft skyward. Turbulence shook the craft. He checked his trajectory, adjusting his course to port slightly. He relaxed into the seat, scanning his instrument board as the blue Earth atmosphere gradually gave way to the blackness of space. The G-forces subsided and weightlessness released him from his seat. He tugged on his straps again as a smile curled his lips upward. He checked his heads-up display, HUD, and confirmed his course and speed. He exhaled slowly, letting the exhilaration consume him. I did it, he whispered. He activated his communication system with a flick of his right pinky on the control stick. Houston, this is Charger. I have achieved orbit. He heard a round of applause and whoops of joy over the comm, and his smile grew. It took several moments before the flight control quieted the room. The feminine voice sounded in his headset, full of pride. It has been ten years since the last shuttle launch in 2011. Today, October 20th, 2021, the United States has finally returned to space. Two hours and a dozen orbits transpired before Mac drew close enough to see the International Space Station. The massive solar panels of the orbiting station loomed ahead, passing low in port of the experimental craft. Mac, gloves off and iPod in hand, took pictures as fast as his fingers could push the button on the screen. Playtime ended with a warning beep and a flashing light on the control panel. The charger left the station behind and Mac set the iPod aside, securing it in a small zippered pocket in his suit. He slid his gloves back on as his eyes scanned the controls. Green lights across the board, and the countdown showed two minutes to the deorbital burn. Houston, I show two minutes to moon run. Confirm. Confirm, Charger, the flight controller replied. All systems show green. Computer control to standby. Flight controls to manual. It is your show, Captain. Thank you, Houston. Mac nodded to no one. Approaching burn point, he watched the seconds tick away. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead despite the climate-controlled suit. He reached up to wipe them away, bumping his gloved hand against the bulky helmet. Two small screens filled the dashboard just below his line of sight. The one on the left showed a status of his flight systems, all green, while the one on the right displayed his course. His eyes focused on that screen as a small icon that represented his ship slowly approached a tangent vector line. He took his eyes from the screen, turning his attention to the blackness of space beyond his canopy. The HUD relayed the same flight information in a light blue haze. He watched the clock in the upper right corner of the display tick down. Burn in three, two, one, mark. Mac pushed the throttle forward, activating the two outboard engines four meters behind him. He felt their vibrations through his boots, heard their roar fill the ship. He changed course with a gentle tug of the control stick, and the earth fell away. The gentle crescent of the moon gradually wove into view until the pockmarked surface sat directly ahead. The instruments confirmed his course. Houston, I am on vector and ready to engage M-Drive. Charger, you are clear and free to engage. Good luck. Mac absently nodded, his focus on the controls and displays in the cramped cockpit. The new engine, a derivative of the impossible M-Drive designed by Roger Shawyer, used electromagnetic waves for propulsion. The center engine on the charger, a specially designed microwave cavity, acted as the exhaust for the drive. Debate of the theory behind the propulsion system lasted for decades. In the end, scientists deemed microwave propulsion impossible. The critics stated that there had to be a force to propel an object forward. The reconstituted NASA, in conjunction with the Space Force, launched a satellite in 2019 and successfully used the system to maintain a stable orbit. It did not, however, actually propel anything anywhere. 
the critics continue to downplay the M-Drive system. Modifications to the engine led to a successful propulsion test in Utah's salt flats. A streamlined land car reached speeds of almost 1,000 miles per hour using the M-Drive. The test silenced the critics, leading to Mack's test flight on behalf of NASA and the Space Corps, the two agencies betting their entire space program on a successful flight. Mack's gloved finger hovered over the switch to activate the engine as all of the debate, technical specs, and tests flitted through his mind. He pushed it aside. M-Drive in three, two, one, engage. The two outboard engines shut down, letting inertia carry the ship away from Earth. The charger grew silent. Mac heard his breathing, his pulse in his ears, and nothing else. The deafening silence consumed his universe, and for a moment he felt truly alone. He drifted, weightless, against the restraining straps, a dot in the universe. Then he heard it, a faint electrical hum behind him. Gravity slowly pulled him back to his seat, and his eyes scanned the controls. The HUD shimmered for a moment, and Mac glanced at the indicator. His eyes widened, his mouth dropped open as the numbers indicating velocity increased by the second. Houston, he asked, are you reading this? Silence. Houston? We read you, Charger, the feminine voice slowly answered. We show you accelerating rapidly. Estimate you will reach the moon in two hours, 14 minutes. How do the controls feel up there? Everything is nominal, Mac replied, stunned. The M-Drive is barely making any noise. The controls are responsive. He folded his arms. So far, so good. Acceleration has stabilized, the mission director continued. Your velocity is now constant. Revised rendezvous at the moon, one hour, 58 minutes. Mac slid the helmet visor up and breathed in the cool cockpit air. He bounced slightly in his chair, the straps holding him in place. Another effect of the drive, he said, loosening the straps and bouncing again. Gravity. A myriad of questions bombarded Mac as mission specialists filled the radio. He answered each in turn, completing whatever experiment they asked him to do. He bounced more in his seat, took off a glove, and dropped it, timing the drop. All the while, the moon grew steadily larger in his canopy. He kept an eye on the controls and watched the craters and mountains take shape, their details coming into sharp focus. <clears throat> Houston? Mac cleared his throat. A question? Go, Charger. Do I maintain the M-Drive as I slingshot around the moon? Silence filled the calm. Mac verified his trajectory as he waited. The ship maintained its course, the moon now filling his forward view. Houston? he repeated. I, uh, yes. The flight director stammered, filling him with confidence. Maintain the M-Drive. The computer will make any course changes as you sling around. By the time you complete the maneuver, we will have a deceleration plan. Roger, Houston, Mac replied, feeling perspiration stream down his face. He lowered his face shield and adjusted his suit controls. The computer altered his course, the moon now looming to his right, craters glistening in the harsh light of the sun to his left. Hitting the dark side in one minute, communication loss in 30 seconds. The song Lunatic Fringe popped into his head. See you on the other side, he muttered again. See you in... The comm channel went dead. Max sat back as the computer adjusted his course to orbit the moon. The charger rolled, so the craft's belly faced space. He looked out of the canopy, the dark surface of the moon less than 50 kilometers distant. He smiled, removed his glove, took out his iPod, and started taking pictures. A weak beep from the console drew his attention to the HUD. The ship slowed, the velocity readout dropping rapidly. The pull of the deceleration pushed him against the straps. Weightlessness returned to the ship, as the M-Drive powered down. What the hell? The controls and lights on the dashboard flickered from power loss. Mac dropped the iPod into his lap and checked his screens. Green lights lit the board. All systems reported nominal. Houston, he called, knowing that the bulk of the moon blocked his signal. Houston, there is a problem with the M-Drive. A glint of sunlight flashed in the distance. He looked out the clear canopy and a chill coursed down his spine. A fleet of ships sat in the moon shadow, alien ships of various sizes, all oblong and sleek. 
Max's blood pumped as he grabbed the stick. He leaned forward, re-engaging the standard thrust engines, and pulled on the flight control. Nothing. The charger continued to slow, stopping with a lurch. The experimental ship sat, dead in space, on the dark side of the moon, before the alien fleet. A green light leapt from the nearest ship, bathing Mac and his ship in an eerie glow. The air grew cold, his strength fading. Adrenaline and fear sent a bolt of energy through his system that dissipated instantly. He fumbled in his lap, his fingers grasping the iPod. Weakly, he raised the device and began recording. His eyelids weighed a ton, and he fought the drowsiness. The light narrowed. The alien ships became a blur in his vision. The iPod slipped from his fingers, bounced off the seat between his legs, and landed on the floor. Mac closed his eyes and slumped against his harness straps, succumbing to the darkness of slumber. Mac awoke with a start, the ship jostling around him. He felt the temperature rise, sweat dripping down his face inside his helmet. He shook his head to clear his vision, the world beyond the cockpit slowly coming into focus. Instinctively, he reached for and found the controls as his eyes scanned his environment. The alien ships were gone. The moon was gone. Mac saw the blue of the atmosphere and red flames as the charger bounced through the atmosphere at a steep angle. He pulled back on the joystick with his right hand, adding thrust with his left. The buffeting of his ship drowned out the vibration of the engines. The roar of his re-entry filled his ears. The charger leveled out, and Mac could make out a small continent far below. Australia, he thought, the island continent disappearing in an instant. A much larger landmass, South America, flashed by to his left, a tall mountain range reaching for his careening ship from far below. Mac tested his pedals and controls, found them sluggish but functional. He began a series of S-turns to bleed off the speed. He gripped the control stick with both hands, fighting against the bucking turbulence. The changes in course altered his trajectory. The charger crossed the equator three orbits later, but did little to slow his speed. Flames enveloped the ship, a screaming fireball falling through the sky. A screeching metal-on-metal metal sound tore through his ship. A small chunk of the fuselage ripped away above his head, just behind the clear canopy. Wind whistled and howled. Flames from re-entry reached for him through the hole behind his head. He turned as much as he could, glaring through the hole in his ship. Mac cursed and faced forward. Houston, this is Charger, he called. Mayday! Mayday! His heartbeat pounded in his ears, competing with the howl of the wind. Houston, do you copy? He heard nothing but the wind, felt the jostling of the ship and the heat of the flames as he continued his S-turns. He crossed an ocean, the Pacific, he thought, and thought of ditching the ship there. By the time he made his decision, he was over a pristine coast. The flames subsided, the rough ride lessening in the lower atmosphere. He peered out the cockpit, watching the landscape take shape beneath him. Majestic snow-capped mountains flashed past. He saw no cities, only untouched natural beauty. Houston, he said again, his throat dry. He changed course, pulling the controls to his left. The ship groaned, resisting the turn, and Mac felt another piece of the ship tear away. The charger shimmied, the controls bucking in his hands. Warning lights flashed across his panel, but he ignored them. He activated the landing sequence. Another rip, another shudder to the craft, as part of the starboard wing tore away. The charger began a flat spin across the sky. The world spun faster and faster, and Mac released the controls. G-forces pushed him into his seat, his hands in his lap. His vision of the world narrowed, his view tunneling as the blood drained from his head. Through misty eyes, he saw a large body of water in the distance. Close enough, he thought, fighting to stay conscious. He concentrated on moving his hands down, his fingers inching slowly toward the ejection handle between his legs. Fire nipped at the cockpit, his skin burning with the proximity of the flames. The sensation provided another shot of adrenaline, and Mac pushed his fingers down. He strained, stretching his fingers to find the ejection cable. His tunnel vision collapsed. G-forces pushed him into his chair. Unconsciousness tugged at every fiber of his being. A distant scream of rage, anger, and desperation echoed in his mind, and Mac wondered who could be yelling in the seconds before his death. 
his hands jerked upwards, pulling the ejection handle for the third time in his life. The harness straps pulled him even tighter into the seat. Mac could not breathe, could not see. He only heard the far-off scream, the wind howling through his cockpit, and the ejection bolts explode in sequence all around him. A jolt propelled him upward, the force of the explosion almost breaking his neck as he tore out of the doomed spaceship. A rocket engine replaced the desperate scream, the howling wind all but dying out. The engine died, and he hung in the air for a moment, spinning in his pilot chair. Dizziness consumed him as he started falling and falling and falling. A spine-jarring yank stopped his descent. The straps released him. Max sucked in a large gulp of air and felt the weight of the world slip off his shoulders. He spun beneath his parachute for a moment, the twists in his risers slowly working themselves out and rocking him like a pendulum. With a final releasing spin, the last of the twists unwound, and he hung, suspended, above the earth. Mac gasped for air, reached for his helmet, and slid his visor away from his face. Cool, crisp air filled his lungs. He closed his eyes, breathing in ragged gulps as he fought to slow his heart rate. A distant boom and cracking of wood drew his attention to the ground below. Flatlands, with a few sprawling hills, permeated the landscape below. A large lake or ocean stretched to the horizon behind him. He moved his head back and forth, searching the ground and the surrounding area. He saw smoke on the horizon, near the shore of the water. The charger, his ship, crashed and burned at the edge of a forest. The ground beneath his feet grew closer, and Mac reached above his head for the toggles to guide his parachute. He turned until he faced his crash site, plotting the distance and route that he would have to take to get there. A gust of wind sent him oscillating, and he realized his mistake. Mac faced the crash site, not into the wind, in preparation for landing. The ground raced toward him. Mac tried to turn the parachute, adding to the oscillation. He braced, felt his feet touch the ground, and knew that the landing would hurt. His head smacked the ground, the helmet absorbing most of the blow. Captain Mac saw stars. Spots of light filled his vision. Then the world went dark. Chapter 3 Max sniffed, the smell of burning wood filling his nostrils. He opened his eyes slowly. He blinked and focused on the ankle-high grass lying beyond the open visor of his helmet. He moved his head, stiff neck and sore muscles protesting. He groaned at the pain and heard an animal's panicked squeal. He sat up with a burst of adrenaline. A family of three, maybe four, small furry rodents scampered away in fear. Mac placed his right hand on his chest and felt his pounding heart. Sorry, he offered to the small beasts. Darkness blanketed the sky to his right, fading light from a spectacular sunset to his left. Mac sat upright and rubbed his back for a moment. He removed his helmet and set it to the side before cracking his neck and stretching. A gust of wind tugged him backwards, and he remembered the parachute. He reached up with his right hand, found the quick release, and popped the canopy loose. He turned his head to watch the nylon fabric flitter in the wind for a moment before dropping unceremoniously to the ground. Max stood slowly, conducting a self-examination as he slipped out of the flight suit. He found a couple of sore ribs, a stiff neck, and a large bruise on his left thigh that he had no idea where it came from. A thin film of sweat covered him by the time he unencumbered himself from the bulky suit and finished the exam. He claimed a small first aid kit, a knife, and a small packet of chewing gum from the pockets on the suit. He popped in a piece of gum, chewing loudly as a breeze cooled his skin in the waning light. Without the warmth of the sun, the night chilled him, and it did not take long for him to start blowing into his hands for warmth. Maybe I should put the suit back on, he mused aloud, then shook the thought away. He needed to find the crash site to see what he could salvage. He turned to his left, east, when he heard a distant rumble, followed by a faraway thunderclap. He spun toward the sound, facing the western sky and the last vestiges of light. Flashes of faded blue light arched from the sky to impact the ground, beyond his line of sight. Strike after strike descended, lighting the clouds as they descended from the heavens. The distant horizon flowed red with fire. What the hell? 
Mac murmured. His crash and the cold forgotten, he began to walk toward the distant glow. He watched, mesmerized, as the clouds lit with each bolt of light. Within minutes, the barrage stopped. The horizon continued to burn a brilliant red in the darkness. He stayed on the banks of the lake, keeping it to his right as a reference. He found a long straight stick near the shore and confiscated it as a walking stick. Animal sounds filled the near pitch black night. Tiny eyes peered at him from the darkness. The clouds obscured most of the stars, the moon not yet risen. The shoreline eventually fell away to the north, his course leading him west toward the distant fire. The lights from heaven resumed an hour later. The rumble of atmospheric disturbance reached him a few seconds later. He was closer now, halfway between his crash and the unnatural lightning storm. He heard the whomp of impacts, followed by the rumble of explosions, as the light rained down. The bombardment lasted ten minutes, then stopped as abruptly as it began. The glow on the horizon remained constant. Night consumed the environment. Clouds obscured most of the stars. A quarter moon peeked through the clouds, offering some light for Mac's journey. He paused in his trek to stretch occasionally, working out the soreness and stiffness of the crash and parachute landing. He kept the stick close, leaning on it more and more as fatigue crept through his body. How long since you ate? his inner voice asked. That thought made him pause. How long has it been? What happened in orbit? How did I get back to Earth? Questions flooded his mind. He sat down, his mouth parched. He longed for a canteen of water. He watched the horizon glow and tried to remember the events after the launch. His hands moved, mimicking his actions on the charger as he recalled the details of the flight. Throttled up, he remembered, lost contact with Houston, rotated ship to the moon, a green light, alien ships. He stopped the playback and leaped to his feet, eyes wide. Alien ships? he exclaimed, the cool breeze whisking his words away. Instinctively, he looked skyward, but the clouds obscured the stars. He grunted, sat back down, and tried to remember more. The green light, draining energy, controls frozen, he muttered. I had my iPod. A thin smile crossed his lips. My iPod! If it survived the crash and the battery still works, he contemplated the possibilities. His smile faded, replaced with a smirk, even with evidence of aliens. He looked around at the dark prairie land. It does me no good unless I can find someone from the government. He sighed and looked into the darkness to the east, toward his downed ship. He saw nothing but darkness. A cool breeze from the distant lake chilled him. He shivered. He exhaled again and resumed his course west, toward the glowing horizon. A flash of blue light streaked from the heavens, accompanied by a growl resembling long, rumbling thunder. The light struck the ground a few miles from the Tuscara village, shaking the earth with its impact. Dust, smoke, and debris filled the sky from the resulting explosion. Fire lit the night as another bolt of light fell from the heavens. Chief Borda watched the blue fire erupt through the clouds and descend to the earth. The light, even from miles away, momentarily lit his face. He no longer cringed with the impact. That emotion left him long ago. He simply watched dispassionately as flames from the Auk village reached for the stars. Borda, along with Phelan, Diran, and Samish, stood on the perimeter of the Tuscara village, watching as another bolt of blue fire streaked from the cloudy night sky. Borda knew the bombardment would last most of the night. Images of a half-dozen other bombardments flooded his memory, the fate of others that lost the fight. None ever survived. The overseers were thorough, and the attack would continue until they were confident that the auks were no more. A single tear streaked down Borda's face, and he let it stream unimpeded. He shook his head, the sadness not for the auks or Chief Perrin. He sealed their fate when he left the battlefield. Borda shed a tear for the Tascara, and how close he had come to failing them. This could have been my village. Behind him sat the village, basking in the glow of campfires. 
Two concentric circles of thatch and adobe huts sat nestled around a circle of six small fires. The women and young of the camp busily put away dishes, clothes, and generally straightened the common area. No one spoke. Only a few continued to jump with each impact of blue light. Another bolt of blue energy flashed through the clouds, impacting beyond the horizon. The accompanying boom sounded moments later, rattling the village and shaking the ground beneath Borda's feet. He waited, anticipating the next beam, and felt a profound sense of relief when it never came. It is over, he murmured, for now. He turned to his son, pointing to the west. Deron, take a few warriors and ride over to the Ork village. If there is anyone still alive, bring them here. Why? Deron protested. Why should we save any of them? It is our way, Borta said softly, pain in his voice. There is no honor in dying this way, from an unseen enemy high above. We can offer them sanctuary, or at least a warrior's death. But it is also the Tuscara way to obey your chief. Go now. You have little time before the overseers resume the attack. We should let them die, Deron said, but turned to enter the village. Borta watched his son gather three warriors, obtain four horses, and gallop off into the night toward the fires on the horizon. He is correct, chief, Phelan spoke softly. Borta faced his bodyguard. The orcs would let us die, and you know this. Borda nodded and turned back to the distant fiery glow. I know, my friend, just as I know that our numbers are down. We need warriors. He pointed towards Samish, standing transfixed, staring at the horizon. Semish and the others may be ready for the next harvest day, but how many of them will we lose? Will we even have enough for the new enemy the overseers are sure to bring? I am ready now, father, Semish said sheepishly. Next harvest we will crush the enemy as we always have. Yes, as we always have, Borda repeated, tasting the words. Until today. He turned to face his adopted son, staring into the boy's dark, intelligent eyes. The chief saw sadness and fear. Today we lost, he continued. Had it not been for divine intervention, our village would have suffered the fate of the ox. It would be our family lying dead or dying. Borda looked toward the night sky. The clouds thinned, stars shining through the breaks. He watched a small glob of light scoot across the sky. The overseers watched. The appearance of the fireball saved our village. The prophecy, Phelan stated, bowing his head slightly. Borda simply nodded. What is the prophecy? Simish asked, adjusting his headband. Borda shivered as the night breeze blew across the plain. He motioned toward the village, and the three Tuscara left the dark perimeter. The three settled around one of the fires, each sitting cross-legged. Borda waved for the other villagers to gather around, and soon most of the village sat amongst the fires. The wind remained steady, feeding oxygen to the fires. They flickered with the breeze. Someone added wood to the fire, the blaze lighting Borda's face in a mesmerizing glow. He kept his voice low, conspiratorially, knowing that the hushed tones would enhance his story. Borda felt the heat from the fires, saw the anxious faces of his villagers staring back at him. Long ago, the overseers arrived. They are an alien race from far away. They have pale skin, deep, ice-blue eyes, all of them the same. Like the Tuscara, a young girl with long, braided black hair said. She sat in her mother's lap, her eyes wide as she soaked up the story. A wide smile split her face. Borta raised an eyebrow. Oh, how so? We all have black hair and dark brown eyes. The overseers are like us, only different. A snicker filtered through the assembly, bringing a frown to the girl's face. Yes, Borta confirmed. Like the Tuscara, only different. You are very observant. Borta offered the girl a wink. The snicker died, and the girl's smile returned. The overseers brought the promise of peace and long life, as invaders often do, the chief continued. They lied and attacked. Our ancestors fought back with great weapons, 
weapons more powerful than you can imagine. But it was not enough. He shook his head to emphasize the point. Humanity suffered greatly at the hands of the invaders. Borda took a stick and stirred the fire before him, the glow lighting the gathering. He gazed upon his people and saw pain, loss, and fear, but very little hope. He tossed the stick into the fire, listening to it crackle as the flames engulfed the wood. Then one man stood tall, defiant in the face of the invaders. Borda's voice boomed in the quiet night. The crowd jumped at his change in tone, listening intently as he continued. The man stood before the alien leader and swore that one day his descendants would rise up and fight the overseers. His offspring would bring destruction to the overseers and drive them from earth, never to return. And the fireball? Samish asked, sitting beside his father. The overseers would know their time on earth was at an end when a ball of fire lit the sky, Borda answered. He looked into the eyes of his people and saw a glimmer of hope. The overseers scoffed at the man, but did not kill him. They imprisoned him, but the tale of his prophecy spread far and wide and remains today. Many years have passed since his act of defiance. How did he know, chief? the little girl asked. How did the man know about the prophecy? Faith, young one, Porter replied, smiling. Faith. Today we saw the power of his faith. Today a ball of fire saved the Tuscara on the field of battle. Sometime soon, this man's faith will save us all. Did the man have a name? the girl asked, her eyes wide as she listened. No, the prophecy says we will know him as he will arrive in a ball of fire. The villagers sat in quiet reflection, staring at the fires. The fires flickered in the breeze, smoke drifting toward the cloudy sky as Borda watched them, his face an emotionless mask. It had been many months since the village gathered for a story, and Borda vowed it would not be that long before they gathered again. Murmuring rippled through the villagers as they discussed the prophecy. The story sparked life within the Tuscara, repelling the horrors of the day. Borda nodded. That was its purpose. He rose from his seat, Phelan and Samish standing with him. Many of the villagers stood as well. The uninjured warriors went about preparing the village for the night, tending fires and standing watch. The injured warriors returned to their adobe huts, under the supervision of the village healer, Borda's daughter, Serena. Samish bid a good night and headed toward a distant hut. Borda watched him disappear into one hut, only to reappear moments later with a long spear in hand. Samish looked around nervously before disappearing into the darkness, Borda's eyes following the boy as he left the village, heading east in the direction of the fireball. Phelan grunted beside him. Should I follow? No, Borda smiled. Let him prove himself. If he has not returned by midday tomorrow, we will go find him together. Phelan nodded. Borda bid the village a good night and headed back toward the perimeter to wait for Duran and any Auk survivors. Space Force Captain Gregory Mac McMillan walked on through the night until sore muscles demanded rest. Sweat soaked his clothes, despite the chill in the air. He trudged through a forest, tripping and cursing in the darkness. He sighed in relief as he exited the trees and saw cloudy sky again. The gentle gurgle of flowing water drew him to a stream near the edge of a forest, and he drank until he felt sick. He belched loudly, the sound echoing in the night. A pack of small animals scurried away at the noise. Waterlogged, he lay down in the damp grass near the babbling brook and watched yet another bombardment from above strike the horizon. His eyelids grew heavy, and the last thing he remembered was watching a blue bolt of light illuminate the clouds, followed by a distant rumble. He awoke before the dawn. He rolled over onto his back with a groan and watched the stars. The clouds had disappeared dissipating in the night. He watched a blob of light slide across the sky, disappearing to the north. Someone is still up there. That's good. He sat up slowly, his clothes soaked, his body shaky. He stood with the help of his walking stick 
and watched the sunrise. Fingers of light pierced the eastern sky. Purple and orange tendrils held the promise of a bright sunny day. Mac rubbed the exhaustion from his eyes, stifling a yawn as the first of the sun's rays touched his skin. He turned his back to the sun and stretched, his stiff joints cracking in the early morning. Beautiful sunrise, he said aloud. His voice seemed to hang in the still morning air. Another drink from the brook, and he continued his westward trek, entering another forest. Mac made his way along a clear path through the trees, finding it much easier to travel in the daylight. He noted the fading tanglefoot and scrub brush. Must be fall, he mused as he wound his way along the trail. The path branched off several times, but Mac stayed on course thanks to the rising sun at his back. Beams of light streamed through the colorful leaves and tree branches, providing illumination in the forest. He paused to rest, leaning his tired body against a tree. He slid down, the bark scraping at his thick shirt. His stomach growled, How long since I last ate? Snippets of survival training surfaced, and he foraged for anything edible. He scraped off more bark and found three small grubs. He picked one up, holding it between his thumb and forefinger, watching it squirm. His stomach growled again, while simultaneously threatening to vomit. The hunger pains won, and, closing his eyes, he plopped the wriggling grub into his mouth, swallowing it whole. He shook his head at the taste, then grabbed the other two still clinging to the tree. He swallowed them in the same manner. He stood, moved to another tree, and repeated the process. Then another, and another. Twenty minutes later, eight trees stood naked in the forest, their bark laying in shards on the ground. Mac sat back down, propping his back against one of the debarked trees, and patted his belly. It'll do for now, he mumbled. But what I really want is a nice fillet with sautéed mushrooms, some french fries, and a cold beer. His stomach growled its concurrence. The sun sat high overhead by the time he lifted himself off the ground. He felt better with something, anything, on his stomach. The rest offered sore muscles a much-needed respite. With the walking stick probing the area before him, Mac continued westward. The forest thinned, allowing more sunlight to brighten the path before him. Mac stopped, leaned against a tree, and wiped the sweat from his brow. He stood there in silence, propped against the bark, and listened. A wisp of a breeze, barely enough to cool the sweat on his skin, rustled the leaves above. The forest noises, small footfalls, and the braying of woodland creatures vanished in an instant. I'm not alone. Mac gripped the walking stick tighter and scanned his surroundings. The sunlight beamed through the trees, the ever-shifting leaves creating and dissipating shadows in an instant. The dirt path continued onto his front, leading out into a knee-high grassy plain. A smattering of trees, the edge of the forest, surrounded him. A twig snapped to his left, near a gathering of dense bushes. Mac turned, holding the walking stick in both hands, and faced that direction. He peered into the thick green leaves and thought he saw something. Someone move. The hair on his neck stood on end. He twirled the stick in his hands like a staff, checking the balance. I know you're there, Mac said, his voice dry, hoarse. Come on out. I mean you no harm. The movement stopped, and Mac froze. His eyes locked on the bush. His heart pounded in his chest, the pulse loud in his ears. More sweat popped on his forehead as he watched the bush. Come on out, he said again. See? He moved the walking stick back to his right hand, leaning it against the closest tree. I mean you no harm. A young boy with dark skin and bright yellow headband slowly crept from behind the bush, a long spear in his hand. The boy wore an animal skin around his waist and leather sandals. His hair hung down his back in a braid. Muscles rippled from the boy. Mac estimated him in his late teens. Dark eyes narrowed, glaring at Mac. Hello, Mac smiled, holding up his empty hands. Do you understand me? The boy held the spear in both hands. A slight tremor shook the weapon, his eyes wide. Mac pursed his lips, shaking his head slightly. He knew the look, having seen it a hundred times while in the Marine Corps. Rookie pilots caught between insecure 
and cocky. Those that survived their first encounter grew out of it. The others? Mac tried not to think about it. The boy took a step forward, thrusting the spear in a well-rehearsed, choreographed move. Whoa, Mac said, taking a step back. I mean you no harm. Let's just put that away, shall we? The boy took another step, his confidence growing as Mac backpedaled. He thrust again, this time with a grunt, an abbreviated war cry. Don't, Mac warned, standing up to his full six-foot-two-inch height. He shook his head and waggled his finger at the boy. Don't do it. The change in his tone made the boy pause, but the tip of the spear remained only a few yards away. Listen, kid, Mac said, tired. I've had one hell of a couple of days. I don't know what happened, yet, but I'll be damned if I made it all the way here to be skewered by your spear. So, tell you what, why don't you put it down and take me to wherever you call home, huh? The boy lunged, shoving the spear at Mac's midsection. Mac grabbed the walking stick, stepped to his right, and blocked the thrust. The former Marine rolled the stick in his hand, spinning it above the spear before striking the boy on the right shoulder. The boy staggered backwards, his face burning with anger. He let out a war cry that echoed off the sparse trees and attacked again, this time swinging the spear like a baseball bat. The sharp flint on the end of the long pole sliced through the air. Mac heard the whoosh of the blade as he leapt backwards. He felt a tug at his shirt, the spear point nicking the cloth and popping off a button. Mac dropped the walking stick and stepped inside the boy's swing. He grabbed the boy by the shoulders, drew him nose to nose, and offered the boy a marine war cry. Mac saw deep, dark, intelligent eyes filled with terror. The boy screamed and dropped the spear. He flailed his arms, breaking Mac's exhausted grip, turned, and fled the forest. Mac fell to his knees as he watched the boy leave, enter the clearing beyond, sprint over a small rise, and disappear. Mac sat for a moment, breathing heavily from the brief fight. Sweat poured from his body. I must be tired, he mumbled as he struggled to his feet. The world spun lazily for a moment, his legs shaky. He shook his head to clear it. I need food and sleep. He picked up the walking stick, paused, then retrieved the spear as well. He tested the tip with his finger and found it sharp. Mac grew up in Pennsylvania with his parents and two younger brothers. His father, also a Marine, took the boys hunting often. At 16, his father took him spearfishing, their guide teaching them the finer points of hunting with the weapon. Mac proved adept and speared three fish. The memory brought a smile to Mac's face as he hefted the spear, testing its weight and balance. At least he's heading in the right direction, Mac said, staring at the boy's path. Leaning on the two wooden poles, he left the forest. The sun beat down on Mac as it moved across the afternoon sky. He kept the sun directly in front of him, limping slowly through the grassy plain. He used the two wooden sticks to probe the area ahead of him and as supports as he walked. His legs grew weaker and wobblier with every mile. Smoke on the horizon, remnants from the blue lightning attack the night before, grew closer, thicker. Rocky hills broke up the pristine prairie land. Distant trees held the promise of vast forests. He squinted against the sun, now directly in his face, as afternoon clouds formed overhead. The familiar scent of water hung in the air. Mac stumbled, catching himself and shifting his hurt ribs. The bruise on his thigh flared. He sucked in a sharp breath, fighting the discomfort. The ground rose, putting more strain on his exhausted leg muscles. The sun disappeared as he ascended a small hill. He chose his steps carefully, slowly climbing his way to the top. Reaching the crest, he squinted, quickly turning his eyes away from the bright sunlight. Dropping the spear and putting his weight on the walking stick in his left hand, he used his right to shield his eyes. A small valley lay before him. Two concentric rows of adobe and thatch huts surrounded a central area where small figures stirred fires. Dozens of people, too distant to pick out details, moved throughout the small village. A stable of horses sat behind the huts on his right, near a stream that wound around the perimeter of the village. Mac looked past the village and saw smoke drifting skyward. He stared almost directly into the setting sun, but could not see the source of the distant smoke. A small rock slide drew his attention to his left. Mac turned his head 
and saw the young boy from earlier standing near a boulder halfway down the side of the hill. Dark, hostile eyes bored through the Space Force captain. Movement in his peripheral vision confirmed the boy was not alone. A dozen men, all wearing leather wraps around their waists, stood along the small ridge line. The men carried a collection of spears, swords, and hatchets. Mac turned his head to see another dozen or so to his right, equally armed. A small smile crept across his lips as he dropped the walking stick. He laughed at himself for walking into the trap. Fatigue, hunger, and thirst fought for supremacy as he dropped to his knees on the hard, rocky hilltop. He placed his hands on his head, his ribs spreading fire through his chest. Mac stared into the distance, watching the sun drop toward the horizon. A cool breeze drifted across the hill, and he sniffed the water in the air. Footsteps approached, and Mac's shoulders slumped in surrender. Rough hands grabbed him, wrestling his arms behind his back. The young boy appeared before him, bent down, and retrieved his spear. He said something Mac did not understand before turning and walking away. A light drizzle began to fall, the cool water soaking his shirt and sliding down his back. Mac lifted his face to the sky and opened his mouth, the rain soothing his parched throat. Rough hands gently lifted him from the ground. The world began to spin, and Mac slumped in their arms, unconscious. Chapter 4 Mac blinked open his eyes. He lay on his back on a small wooden cot covered with animal hides. Light streamed in through an open flap, also made of skins, of the small hut. He saw layered straw above him, small pinpricks of light peeking through the thick roof. He inhaled deeply through his nose and smelled the sweet aroma of something cooking outside the mud-walled hut. He attempted to sit up, felt fire in his ribs, and immediately laid back down. Lay still, a feminine voice called softly, a hint of humor in the voice. You need rest. Mac craned his neck to look behind him and saw a young woman, black hair braided down her back, sitting nearby. A large pot sat between her legs, one hand strategically holding the bowl, a grinding stone in the other. With practiced strokes, she mashed the contents of the bowl. She offered a smile before returning her attention to the bowl. You... You speak English? Mac croaked, his throat dry. The woman nodded, set the bowl aside, stood, and retrieved a jug nearby. Some. She poured water into a gourd cut in half before helping Mac sit up enough to drink. Only a... Uh, she paused, as if searching for the word. Small number do. Few. A few do. He sipped the lukewarm liquid, the water soothing his dry throat. He fought the urge to guzzle, settling on sipping the drink. He finished the gourd, and the woman poured another. He drank again, a little faster this time, feeling the liquid slide down to his stomach. Satisfied for the moment, the woman helped him sit up on the side of the cot. He planted his bare feet on the dirt floor, but did not attempt to stand. Uh, I am Captain Gregory McMillan, United States Space Corps. My friends call me Mac. I am Serena she replied, touching her chest with her right hand and bowing slightly. I am the healer of my village. Village? Mac repeated, looking around again. The interior of the hut was what he imagined the interior of a mud hut would look like. Windowless, barren walls, a dirt floor, piles of animal hide blankets, and small pieces of wooden furniture comprised the inside of the adobe. The remnants of a fire sat in the middle, and Mac's gaze went upward to a small vent in the roof. He turned to look at Serena. Where am I? She returned the water jug to its spot, picked up her bowl, sat, and began crushing the contents again. This is Tescara. Where? This is Tescara, she repeated. We are Tescara. The light dimmed inside the hut, and Mac turned his head to see the same boy that attacked him. He wore the same headband, carried the same spear as before, his eyes stared at Mac and moved inside. He crabbed sideways, keeping his body and spear pointed toward Mac as he moved to stand beside Serena. The two spoke for a moment in their own language. Serena laughed. Samish, she said, pointing at the boy, does not like you. 
Mac shrugged and offered a smirk, but said nothing. His body still ached from the crash and subsequent trek through the forest. The aroma of the cook fire outside the hut drifted in again, and his stomach let out a long rumble. Zemesh stepped back at the sound, his spear up and ready. Serena laughed again, motioning for the boy to lower the weapon with a wave of her hand. Zemesh placed the blunt end of the pole on the ground, but maintained his gaze on Mac. You are hungry? Serena asked, raising an eyebrow. Apparently. Mac nodded. He pushed himself off the cot, his joints cracking as he stood. His legs felt as if they weighed a ton each, but he stayed upright. He took stock of his belongings and found that the only thing missing were his shoes. The ground felt coarse and cool underfoot. It has been years since he ran around barefoot. He flexed his toes together, digging into the dirt. Come, Serena said, taking his right arm in support. We eat. Mac let her guide him from the adobe hut into the bright sunshine. Samish, spear at the ready, followed a few steps behind. Thalen stood beside Chief Borda and Duran, watching Serena escort the stranger through the camp. The newcomer walked slowly, bending over from his injuries, and Serena moved in close to support him. Thalen stiffened, eyes narrowing as he watched the two process through the village. He gripped his spear tighter in his right hand. A low growl escaped his throat. The trio stood on the perimeter of the village. Phelan wore a leather vest decorated in warrior colors. Bright yellow and red stripes adorned the vest. Duran stood bare-chested, bows and arrows slung across his back. Borda, also bare-chested, talked with the mostly female survivors of the Auk camp. Chief Borda, hearing Phelan's growl, turned his head to look at Phelan, and followed his gaze back to Serena. You need not worry, old friend, Chief Porter said, turning his head back to face Phelan. She is the village healer. She is simply doing her duty. He is not of the Tuscara, Phelan replied. Duran nodded his agreement. He should be given to the overseers. Sheltering him will bring death to the village. We do not know anything about him, the chief stated. Exactly, father. Duran interjected. We know nothing of this man. I agree with Phelan. He nodded his assurance to the older man. Borda stood quietly as the three of them watched Serena escort the stranger, with Samish following a few steps behind, spear at the ready. Who told Samish to watch over the man? Phelan and Duran exchanged glances, then shook their heads. He is finally thinking for himself, Borda said proudly. He will be ready for the next harvest. There may not be another harvest, Duran replied, an edge creeping into his voice. We have vanquished all that opposed us. Borda looked at his son. And that does not concern you? If we have no one left to fight, do you think the overseers will simply let us live in peace? No. They will surprise us with yet another twist, another challenge. Or destroy us, Phelan said, his eyes still following Serena. Chief Borda nodded. Not to worry, my old friend. I will not let that happen. He nodded toward his daughter. As for Serena, she will be yours, as I promised you long ago. Phelan nodded, gripping the spear tighter. The days passed quickly for Mac as his body healed under the watchful eye of Serena. Two days she tended to his wounds. Two days Samish stood nearby, spear ready. The sun began to set on the third day as he stood in the doorway of the mud hut and watched Serena gather herbs and plants. She crushed them into a powder, smiling and humming softly to herself, content in her work. As the rest of the village lit fires for the evening, she handed him a vile-smelling green concoction. He sniffed the drink, crinkling his nose at the smell. Drink, she ordered. With a deep breath, he downed the medicine in one gulp. It tasted as horrible as it smelled, and left him with an irritating headache. Sleep now, she said, pulling a thick animal hide blanket over his body. Feel better tomorrow. Mac awoke the next morning and felt amazing. His ribs, although sore, no longer throbbed with every movement. He felt energized as he tossed aside the blanket and put his feet on the dirt floor. He padded quietly past a sleeping Samish, lying propped up near the door to the hut. The former marine bent over and slowly removed the spear from the boy's hand. 
Without a sound, he slid through the door flaps and into the bright morning sun. A strong wind blew from the west, and Mac shivered. A cloudless sky promised a bright sunny day, and he tilted his head toward the east. He closed his eyes and reveled in the warmth from the early morning rays. He stood there for several minutes, letting the sun energize him. Finally, he opened his eyes and looked around the Tuscara village. A few women, all with long dark hair, squatted around cooking fires, preparing breakfast as children ran around the central courtyard of the village. They played quietly until they saw Mac. The eight children let out joyous yells and shouts of glee as they ran toward him. Each of them spoke to him in their language, a chattering noise incomprehensible to Mac. He simply nodded, rustled each one's hair in turn, and moved toward the nearest fire. Mac sat cross-legged and held his hands out to the crackling fire. He smiled at a woman on the other side of the cook fire, an older woman with wrinkles stretching from her eyes to her ears. She shooed the children away before returning his smile, revealing two rows of perfect pale white teeth. She turned her attention back to her task as she stirred a pot of something over the open fire. A yelp from the hut behind him put a smile to his face. He heard the animal hide flap fly open, a drowsy grunt and heavy footfalls approach his back. Samish stopped a few feet behind Mac, his breathing heavy in the early morning air. Spear, the boy ordered. Mac turned to face Samish. The boy stood, arm outstretched, with a pouty look on his face. Spear, he repeated. Mac smiled and tossed the spear to the boy. Learned a little English, did we? Mac inquired, as Samish deftly caught the weapon. He twirled it in his hand before placing the end on the ground, sharpened flint pointing skyward. The children elicited another chorus of yells and whoops as they danced around the two men. Samish rubbed the sleep from his eyes before running a hand through his tangled hair. His eyes never left Mac. Serena appeared like an apparition, stepping between them. Mac stood as she spoke briefly with Samish. The boy snarled at Mac, turned, and stomped away without a word. Serena watched him go before turning to face Mac. You took his spear? Why? Look, Mac said, ignoring the question. I've been here going on four days. I do appreciate your medicine. He touched his ribs. It worked great, by the way. I appreciate everything you and your people have done, but there are some questions I'd like answered. Such as? The deep bass voice from behind made Mac jump. He turned, spinning on his heel, his hands coming in a reflexive defense. Never heard him. A tall, scarred man stood a few yards away in the middle of the courtyard, a bright yellow headband, like Samish's, around his head. He stood, arms crossed, staring at Mac, the wind tussling his long, gray-streaked hair. He wore a smirk, dark eyes boring into Mac's soul. Two other men, one on either side, stood beside him. An older man with a spear on his right, a younger man with a bow across his back on his left. Mac, Serena said, Chief Porta, my father. Mac nodded his head, received a nod in return. Phelan, she continued, and the men exchanged nods. Duran, my brother. No nods this time. Both men simply stared at each other. You have questions, Borta restated. Serena will provide answers. He turned his attention to his daughter. Teach him. He must learn our ways if he is to survive. Without another word, the three men turned and strolled away, heading toward a large expanse of farmland north of the village. Max saw dozens of other men, farming tools in hand, already in the distance. He recognized several from his capture. What is going on? He asked. Three days ago, those guys were warriors. Now they're farmers? Serena procured a cup, filled it with stew from the cook fire, and handed it to Mac. Eat. I will explain what I can. The two sat near one of the early morning fires and ate in silence. He stirred his stew, potatoes, carrots, a smattering of other vegetables, and thin slices of meat with a wooden spoon. He tasted it, recoiling from the hot liquid. He blew on it until it cooled a bit, then ate heartily. He finished his cup, asked for and received seconds. He nodded his thanks to an older woman as she took his dirty cup and spoon. Serena picked up an animal skin canteen, slung it over her shoulder, and motioned for him to follow. The two began to walk, leaving the village behind. 
The sun sat well above the horizon now. The cool early morning breeze diminished to a slight stir. The two traveled north toward the farmland before turning east, heading for a large distant lake. A few clouds dotted the sky. Ask, Serena said without preamble. Mac opened his mouth and closed it. Where to begin? The two strolled along the lake shore, the sun glinting off the still water. How do you know English? It is an old language. She struggled with a word here and there. Her soft tone and her slow speech mesmerized Mac. It is passed through chiefs and the healers. It is the language the overseers use with us. The overseers? Tell me about them. They are not like us, she explained. She bent down and plucked a flower from the ground. She stripped the stem of dirt before sliding the yellow and pink flower into her hair above her left ear. Tall, blue, always cold. I've seen them twice. I do not like them. Why are they here? Matt continued with his questions. Why is everyone a farmer today? The harvest. What harvest? The overseers arrive every six moons, months, Serena answered. They make villages fight. The winner keeps the harvest. The loser, her voice caught, and she involuntarily looked over her shoulder to the west. The loser is killed. Max stopped, turning to the west. Is that what I saw the other night? The overseers destroying your opponent? The blue lights? Serena nodded. And now you've... What? Simply go back to farming for six months until the next battle? Yes, Serena agreed with a nod. It is our way, has been our way, for as long as I can remember. Once, long ago, there were many villages. Now that the auks are gone, only the Tuscara remain. I fear that they will destroy us next. Tears welled in her eyes. She choked them down. Mac began walking again, following the shore. In an effort to change the subject, he pointed to various objects and asked her to translate into her language. Her tears disappeared as they walked and talked. With the sun high overhead, they reached the forest where Mac first met Samish. Tell me about you, Serena said, as they sat in the shade of a tree at the edge of the wood. She drank from the canteen and handed it to Mac. He quenched his thirst with a long drink before handing it back to her. Not much to tell, he said. I'm from Pennsylvania, joined the Marines at 19, and got my pilot's wings at 23. Applied for the astronaut program a few years ago. Astronaut? Mac laughed. I guess that would be a foreign word. I was picked to fly a ship in space, he pointed to the sky. Among the stars, I was supposed to test a new engine when I was, well... I don't know what happened. I was orbiting the moon when I saw an alien fleet. Alien? Um, different, like the overseers. You flew with the overseers? She shrieked, jumping to her feet. No, no, Mac explained, rising as well. He held his hands out disarmingly. I flew a ship to the moon. I was knocked unconscious, and when I came to, I was crashing. That was four days ago. Serena's eyes widened. You crashed four days ago. A ball of fire? Mac laughed. Yeah, I guess it would have looked like a ball of fire. Come. Serena grabbed his arm, tugging him toward the village. Mac saw panic and fear in her eyes. We must talk to father. Why? Is something wrong? When she turned to look at him, Mac saw something else in her eyes. Hope. The prophecy, she said, and pulled him back toward the village. Serena ran through the knee-high grass, her hand interlocked with Max. She pulled him, yelling at him to hurry as they ran along the lake shore. His ribs ached from her constant tugging. The sun had begun its descent to the west, and Mac had to shield his eyes from the glare. He stumbled, catching himself before he tumbled, and he felt something tear on his left side. Slow down, he yelped, holding his ribs. I can't keep up this pace. Her pace reminded him of basic training and the drill instructor's relentless running. Cannot, she replied, gulping for air. Your arrival, a prophecy. Grimacing and bracing for what was about to come, Mac yanked on her hand, stopping her momentum. 
She stopped and spun to face him. She trembled with exertion and anxiety. We must hurry. Why? Mac asked. What is this prophecy? She tugged on his hand, but he refused to move. She pulled him, gentler this time, and he began walking with her toward the village. She tried to pick up the pace again, but Mac kept her at a brisk walk. It is said that a ball of fire will appear in the sky, she said as they walked. It will bring death and destruction to our enemies, she pointed to Mac's chest. You are the prophecy. You arrived during harvest day. You sent our enemies running. You can free us from the overseers. The two reached the farmland. The warriors turned farmers, already done for the day. Mac smelled fresh plowed dirt, the aroma reminding him of Pennsylvania. They headed south, toward the village in the distance. Smoke from the cook fires filled the distant air. Mac could see the children running through the village playing games. He thought he could hear their laughter, even from a mile away. We must find father, Serena said, and let go of his hand. Hurry! She sprinted away, leaving Mac alone with his thoughts. He continued toward the village, holding his ribs, and thought of the conversation. I am no prophecy, he said aloud. He looked toward the bright sky. The sun would set in another hour. Alien spaceships sat in orbit, probably watching the village and everything around it. He rubbed the four days of growth on his face and shook his head. Sooner or later, I'll come face to face with these overseers. Maybe I can get a few answers then. He continued on in silence, wondering what the psychiatrist at NASA would think about him talking to himself. He laughed at the thought. The throbbing in his ribs subsided as he reached the outskirts of the village. He saw the Tuscar gathered around Serena and her father, the chief, in the center of the village. Name is Mac, Serena's voice drifted to him. He is a warrior. He is the prophecy. A low murmur erupted through the village. Borda's voice boomed through the still afternoon air, demanding silence. The crowd quieted immediately, all eyes on their chief. Mac had no idea what they said, but from the body language, Borda was not happy. Your proof, daughter. Talk to him, she pleaded. He arrived with the ball of fire. He flies among the overseers. Flies among the... Duran scoffed. Do not be so gullible, sister. Talk to him, she repeated. Duran made a show of looking around, exaggerating his movements. Where is he? Where is our savior? Mac opened his mouth to speak when a low rumble filled the air. He turned, as did the Tuscara, toward the north. Three dots appeared in the sky, growing larger by the second. The growl of landing thrusters roared. Mac moved in the shadow of an adobe hut as the three ships flashed by overhead. He crouched, waiting. All three ships appeared identical, with the middle craft twice the size of its outliers. Broad wings formed a crescent around a cylindrical fuselage, one large exhaust protruding from the rear of the cylinder. All three banked to the west toward the setting sun before the two escorts peeled away, flying in opposite circles around the village. Landing struts lowered from the belly of the larger ship as it descended, preparing to land in an open field less than a mile away. Find the stranger, Borda commanded, looking at Serena. Hide him. The overseers must not know he is here. Everyone else, gather around and say nothing of him. The villagers nodded and began moving toward the overseer ship. Serena pushed her way through the crowd, her eyes scanning the village perimeter to the north. She glanced upward as the escort ship circled a few hundred feet above. Mac, she called. Mac! Over here, he replied as she broke through the crowd. He waved her toward the shadow where he hid. She crouched next to him. Follow me, she ordered. We must hide you. What is going on? The overseers have arrived, she explained, taking his hand. She pulled him toward one of the huts, and he felt his ribs shift again. If they find you, they will kill us all. Chapter 5 Commander Devry stifled a yawn as his shuttle descended through the atmosphere. He adjusted the collar of his jacket as the craft shook slightly with turbulence. The bored yawn returned, and Devery allowed it, adding a joint-popping stretch. He cracked his long, pale neck with a quick side-to-side -side motion. The ship rocked again, this time with more fervor, 
and he heard a gasp from the human beside him. He turned and offered the belega equivalent of a smile as he recognized the fear and panic in the woman's eyes. Her white knuckles on the armrest added to his pleasure. He patted her hand condescendingly. You wanted to travel and see the world, my dear, he mocked. Now it's time to return home. He laughed, mocking the woman's fear. I've had my fun. You have your stories to tell your friends. Relax and enjoy the ride. The woman's face paled. She turned and vomited all over the shuttle's deck. Devry sneered and backhanded the woman, knocking her unconscious with a single blow. The woman slumped against her restraining harness, limp. Ugh, Devry grimaced as the smell hit him. This is why I prefer Belega females, Stith, he said, turning his attention to the subordinate sitting across from him, Sub-Lieutenant Stith, his second in command. They can at least travel without making a mess. Stith remained quiet. Devry knew the two had this conversation every six months, and he relished the consistency. Belega women knew how to travel, but human women knew how to treat their overseers. A smile touched his cold, pale blue lips. Two more human females waited for him aboard the Extrinzi, the flagship of his command. Two minutes to landing, the pilot announced. It appears the natives are already having a meeting. The monitor on the bulkhead next to Devry activated, showing the Tuscara village. It did appear the entire population, to include the children, had gathered around the fires. Good, I won't have to wait for them to gather around. As he watched, every head in the crowd turned to look directly at him. Devry turned off the monitor and sat back in his seat, ignoring the sleeping woman and the smell beside him. She had served her purpose and would now be discarded, like all of the others before her, one of the perks of his governorship. The assignment on Earth would be his last. For nearly 120 years, Devry had served the Belega. One more harvest and I can retire, he thought. I will turn this over to Stith, find a female or three, and live the rest of my days in luxury and comfort. His eyes scanned the interior of the shuttle, not confined to steel walls. Although born to wealth and power, Devry had rebelled and joined the military at a young age, 52. Adventure called to him in his dreams, and he wanted to see more than the Belega homeworld could offer. He rose through the ranks, not because of his ambition, but because of his family influence. He did not care the reason. He simply consolidated his power and did only enough to continue his upward mobility. Now he wanted to be left alone. He had his adventures, fighting the Centrilogy off of Alpha Centauri, commanding the first excursion into Khalitib territory, and watching fire consume the Dorsenic Nebula. All great memories. But now Devry knew it was time for a simpler life without the burden of command. His eyes moved to Stith, the young, 84, sub-lieutenant watching him intently. He did not come from money. He clawed his way up from poverty to the cusp of power. Stith will make a suitable replacement. For a time, he is ambitious, but I believe he will be cruel to these people, and that is not our mandate. One minute, Commander, the pilot announced. Devry nodded. After we land, have someone clean up this mess, he ordered and deposit our guest with the Tuscara. They will welcome her, his smile broadened. And after today, they will need more breeding stock. Devry folded his arms across his chest and leaned back into his plush seat. Yes, his governorship was the culmination of a long career, and it had its perks. His eyes cut to the sleeping woman beside him. A small drip of blood oozed from her nose from his slap. It is time to put all of this behind me, he thought. A simple life, he muttered. He heard the landing gear descend from the belly of his shuttle and prepared to meet the natives. Chief Borda, Duran, and Phelan each turned their heads as the overseer's ship issued a gust of exhaust, churning up loose dirt, rocks, and grass in the field. The whine of the engines faded, and the chief heard the hiss of the escaping steam. The maelstrom of loose grass in the air died down. The heat of the exhaust rushed past, and he turned his head back toward the craft. The ship sat a quarter mile from the Tuscara village on the edge of the battlefield. 
crimson stains spotted the grass, the ground tilled by hooves and combat. The Tuscara spent two days removing the dead from the field, but many of the weapons remained. Stubby landing struts held the ship off the ground. The large crescent wings of the ship cast long shadows across the meadow. A mechanical whir drifted across the grassland as a small stairwell descended from the bottom of the craft, digging into the soft dirt. Chief Borda heard Duran sneer as long legs stepped into view. Quiet, Borda ordered, careful to keep his own expression neutral. He shared his son's distaste for the overseers, but knew that showing disrespect would result in the destruction of the Tuscara. He exhaled slowly as Commander Devry stepped from the stairs, followed by Sub-Lieutenant Stith. Another alien, carrying a young human woman, appeared next. Devry and Stith proceeded toward Borda, while the third alien dropped the woman unceremoniously on the ground. He shook his hands in disgust and re-entered the ship. Devry, wrapped in a thick coat despite the heat, waved cheerfully at Borda. Medals dangled from both sides of his chest, a silver metal cylinder sat holstered on his left hip. Stith, also wrapped in a coat with medals, kept a hand on his holstered weapon. The pair of overseers stopped a few feet from the trio of Tuscara. Devry shivered. Greetings, Chief Borda, Commander Devry began, and congratulations on your victory this past harvest day. Thank you, Borda replied, keeping his voice neutral. Thoughts of reaching out and strangling the thin blue alien flitted through his mind, and he dismissed them quickly. I did not wish to see Perrin die. He was my friend long before he was my foe. Devry offered a human expression of sympathy, pursing his lips and nodding slightly, before his salesman's smile returned. My condolences, but that is the price we must pay. I understand Perrin retreated after a meteor hit nearby. Is that true? Borda narrowed his eyes. What do you mean, meteor? Devry spread his arms wide. Of course, you do not know about meteors or other cosmic bodies, he paused. After a ball of fire fell from the sky, he spoke slowly, mockingly, like an owner to a disobedient pet. Borda nodded again, silently. Why would he retreat? The meteor... The fireball knocked out our main viewers for several minutes. All we had was long-range surveillance without sound. Can you explain? Borda looked thoughtful for a moment. He could have thought it a bad omen, perhaps a new weapon. I do not know. But you talked with him for several moments, Devry persisted. He must have said something. He only displayed his panic, Borda treaded carefully. He had no intention of mentioning the prophecy to the overseers. Whatever it was, it frightened him, and he ran. Devry nodded thoughtfully. He motioned with his left arm toward the village. Borda mimicked the motion, and both of them walked a few steps away from the others. They stopped, and Devry leaned in, his voice low. Chief, that is in the past, Devry said. We need to discuss the future. Borda clasped his hands behind his back, but said nothing. Devry continued, I am sure you would love nothing more than for the Tuscara to live in peace. The overseer shook his head sadly. That is something I cannot offer today. We all have our superiors, Devry shrugged, another human trait he mimicked, and waved his hands in the air as he talked. Mine have demanded a change to how we manage your harvest, Devry stepped back, his eyes roaming the grassland around him. You do know that you have vanquished every other village within a hundred miles, yes? Borda nodded, but remained silent. Devry looked to the north, his eyes narrowed. You've already started planting for the next season, haven't you? We must eat, Borda stated gruffly. That is what I like about you, Chief, Devry nodded, turning and pointing a long blue finger at the human. You are a leader. You take care of your people. That is why it pains me to do what I must do today. And what is that, Commander? Devry waved off the question. We have traveled a very long way to find you another opponent for your next Harvest Day games. 
Another? Would you like to meet them? Borda stood in silent shock. Another village? Already? Even as the thoughts entered his mind, the sound of engines filled the air. Six ships descended through the waning sky. The sun headed toward the western horizon, the shadows growing longer with each passing minute. Now? he croaked. Of course, Devry laughed, clapping the chief on the back. He pointed toward the descending ships. Five of them continued on toward the west, toward the former Auk village, while one rotated on its axis and lowered gently to the ground near Devry's ship. My people are on their way to construct a small village for them. From the remains of the Auk, a new competitor will blossom. The engines died down and Devry motioned Borda toward the newly arrived ship. It belched steam and popped as it cooled. Commander Devry waved it stiff, and Borda saw Duran and Phelan move toward the new ship. The five of them met at the base of the craft as the stairs descended. A tall, pale overseer wrapped in a large fur coat walked down the steps. Borda bristled at the alien, who stood well over seven foot tall. The aliens spoke with Devry in their native language, the taller overseer nodding his understanding of whatever orders Devry issued. The commander motioned for Borda and the rest to step back as the taller overseer turned and yelled back up the stairs and into the ship. A half minute later, a group of trembling humans descended the stairs. Their normally dark skin appeared pale, sickly. They huddled in groups of three or four, eyes wide as they surveyed their new surroundings. One thin woman slipped, missing the next to the last step. The man next to her stopped her headlong fall into Devry. The overseer stepped quickly out of the way, sneering. The assembled overseer troops raised their rifles. The group, about thirty-five men and women total, exited the ship and began milling around the prairie. Borda felt their eyes on him, as they compressed into a tight-knit ball. A well-muscled older man with streaks of gray in his short, raggedly cut black hair stepped from the crowd and approached Devry. He moved slowly, favoring a limp in his left leg. Borda watched the man closely. He stood tall, despite his obvious distaste for the overseer. A flat nose spread across his tanned face. Large ears protruded from the side of his head and Borda noticed a missing right earlobe. He wore a buffalo hide jacket without sleeves. His dark eyes continuously studied those around him. His hands hovered near the pair of daggers at his waist. Chief Borda, Devry called, and Borda nodded, stepping in front of the newcomer. This is Bultry, the leader of the Kaya. Borda nodded. Welcome, Chief Bultry, Devry laughed. He is not the chief. No, no, my friend. He is the current leader of this faction, this tribe. Borda's eyes narrowed in confusion. If he is not chief... All will be explained soon, Devry interrupted. In the meantime, would you be so kind as to lead these fine people to your village? I think it best if we continue there, so I only have to explain everything one time. Borda stood for a moment, mind racing. What is he up to? Yes, Commander, of course. He motioned for Devry and Bultry to follow him, turned on his heel, and headed for the Tuscara village a quarter mile away. The sun set at their back as the forty or so people and overseers trekked across the field. The two escort ships stopped their circling, opting to hover over the procession. Borda glanced at Bultry from time to time, thinking of Devry's words. He is not the chief. His eyes roamed over the three dozen Kaya, noting their malnourished bodies, torn clothing, and the obvious fear in their eyes. Borda unconsciously shook his head. We will slaughter them in combat. Something on your mind, Chief Borda? Devry asked with a smile. I am concerned, Borda stated. About? These Kaya, they are not ready for the harvest. Borda saw the perimeter guards to his village, waved, and signaled that everyone gather in the center. He quickly scanned the village, relieved that he did not see Serena or Mac. We are still months from the harvest, Devry assured him. Plenty of time for them to gain their strength and grow accustomed to this area. You will assist them, of course. 
Chief Borda stopped so suddenly that Duran and Phelan nearly ran into him. The trio stood at the edge of the village, many of the Tuscara within earshot. The chief whirled to face Devry, saw Stith touch the weapon at his side. You wish the Tuscara to assist the Kaya to make them fit so that we fight them? That is madness. Devry touched a small silver medallion on his collar. His voice boomed from the two ships hovering overhead. My congratulations to the Tuscara on your latest victory. You have made the overseers very proud. The crowd remained quiet, alternating their stares between Devry and the ships overhead projecting his voice. Borda watched the overseer. He had never addressed the Tuscara in this manner. Something about this made Borda's skin crawl. I would like to introduce to you the Kaya, Devry continued. They are the victors in their own Harvest Day competition. Your peoples share a lot in common. I want to build on those common traits. Borda watched a smarmy smile spread across the alien's face. He absently touched the handle of the tomahawk on his belt. Sharing is the key word, Devry continued. I am leaving them here with you for a short time while we build them a new village. I want you to share your knowledge, your hospitality, your very essence with the Kaya. He turned to look at Borda, humor in his eyes. I will return in two weeks, at which time you will also share your village, your sons and daughters. Borda's hand grasped the handle of his tomahawk, but froze when Stith pulled his silver cylinder and placed it next to Duran's head. Enjoy your last few weeks with your family, Borda, Devry stated, the humor and levity in his voice gone. When I return, I am splitting the Tuscara. Your next harvest may very well be your last. Serena lay beside Mac on a buffalo hide rug, peering out of the door of an adobe hut. Her heart pounded, and she trembled with fear. Her eyes wide, she stared at the overseers, listening to the conversation. She glanced at Mac. He appeared calm, watching the spectacle in the village courtyard. What if they found Mac, she thought. She shuddered at the thought of the blue light streaming down from the clouds, destroying the Tuscara. She jumped as she envisioned the impact. Sharing is the key word. She turned back to the conversation as the overseer spoke. I am leaving them here with you for a short time while we build them a new village. I want you to share your knowledge, your hospitality, your very essence with the Kaya. His smile sent a chill through Serena. She looked past him at the weak Kaya. Many would need her attention. She glanced to Mac again, knowing that he still needed care as well. The overseer's next words stopped her thoughts and drew her attention back to the courtyard. She saw her father's hand on his tomahawk. She tensed, held her breath, and waited. I will return in two weeks, at which time you will also share your village, your sons and daughters. Enjoy your last few weeks with your family, Borda. When I return, I am splitting the Tuscara. Your next harvest may very well be your last. The overseer turned on his heel and walked away. The other aliens stood still, gleaming silver sticks in their hands. Serena did not know what type of weapons they held, and shuddered again at the thought of what they could do. She exhaled slowly as the rest of the overseer delegation turned and retreated toward their ships. Chief Border released the grip on his tomahawk, standing in stark silence. Tears welled in her eyes, and she lowered her head to the buffalo hide blanket. She wept softly, her body rocking gently with the sobs. She felt hands gently touch her back and jumped. She looked up to see Mac, staring, compassion filling his eyes. Quickly, Serena wiped the tears away. The overseers are combining the Kaya with the Tuscara, she explained to Mac. Then they are going to split them into two groups for the next harvest. She stifled another sob, sucking in a deep breath as her voice cracked. They are going to separate the families of the Tuscara. She sat up, moved closer, and buried her head into Mac's chest. She felt his hands gently rub her back to comfort her. She let the tears flow. Mac held the sobbing woman, cradling her in his arms. He heard a heated argument outside in the courtyard, but only caught a few words. 
he stole a glance out of the door and saw Chief Forda, arms crossed, standing perfectly still as the village erupted in chaos around him. The roar of alien ships paused the commotion as everyone looked toward the darkening sky. Mac craned his neck to look out of the door and upward, but could not see the ships. He heard the engines fade into the night, and the village remained quiet for a moment before shouts began again. Mac sat back, relaxing his tired and sore muscles. His ribs still ached, but he ignored the pain while he held Serena. This is going to tear the Tascara apart, he noted, listening to the commotion outside. Serena's tears slowed, and she relaxed in his arms. Chief Borda's voice boomed across the night, and Serena sat up, listening. The crowd quieted. After a moment, Serena began translating for Mac. We'll continue to work the fields. We will also welcome the Kaya. Find them beds and food. Duran, find Serena. She will be needed. Mac felt the woman stiffen at the mention of her name. Time for you to go to work, Mac said, pushing the woman away with a smile. I'll be fine. Serena hesitated a moment before she stood, straightening her coverings and wiping away the tears from her face. She exhaled, nodded, and left the hut without a word. Mac lay back down, sliding backward, away from the door, on his belly. He listened to the conversations outside, the language foreign, but he recognized the tone. Fear and confusion filled the Tuscara. Nestled deep in a shadow, he wargamed the possible scenarios confronting him. Fight? Flee? Join the Tuscara? The Kaya? Throughout all of the various thoughts in his mind, only one thought remained constant. What happens if one of them report me to the overseers? Chapter 6 Mac slipped from the dark hut, hugging the adobe's shadow. He squatted, listening. A full moon sat high above in a cloudless sky. He paused a moment to soak up the sight of a billion stars unencumbered by city lights. Only once before had he seen a night like this, survival training in the Mojave Desert. The stars held a hypnotic effect on Mac, and he smiled. That's why I joined the Space Corps. The howl of a wolf in the distance brought him from his reverie. He listened another moment, heard nothing stirring nearby, and left the hut's shadow heading east. Leaving the village behind, Mac slipped past a perimeter sentry, nodding to the warrior as he moved through the darkness. Samish returned the nod, pointing with his spear toward a distant tree-covered hill, barely discernible in the darkness. After the overseers had left the village two weeks earlier, Mac voiced his concerns about being discovered to Chief Borda. The village elder knew he could trust the Tuscara, but did not know the Kaya, and therefore could not vouch for them. The two, with Phelan, Duran, and Samish, worked out a plan for Mac to leave the village and hide when the overseers returned. For two weeks, Mac stayed sequestered in his hut. Serena brought him food and water and tended to his injuries. He did not see much of her, only those occasional visits, as she spent most of her time with the Kaya. Samish became Mac's new best friend, guarding the hut from the Kaya. The young man started learning English and continued Mac's lessons with the Tuscara language. To pass the long hours inside the hut, and to test his healing body, Mac began teaching the boy hand-to-hand -hand combat. The young warrior scoffed at the thought at first. Why would I need to know such things? he inquired. I will kill my enemies before they get close, he said confidently, brandishing the spear in his hand. Mac knocked the spear from the hand with a single swipe the wooden pole clanging on the dirt floor. He stepped between the boy and the weapon. What do you do now? Samish charged. Mac stepped aside, grabbed the boy's shoulder, and shoved. The young warrior flew across the room, landed hard on the dirt, and slid into the far wall some twenty feet away. Samish jumped to his feet, dirt and blood from scratches covering his chest. He looked ready to charge again, and Mac tensed until a smile split the boy's face. Teach me. The two weeks passed quickly for the two. Samish proved a quick learner and an excellent language teacher. When the time approached for the overseers to return, Samish volunteered to guard the perimeter to ensure Mac left unseen. Good look, Samish whispered in the darkness. Mac smiled at the sentiment, even if mispronounced. He nodded 
and left the village behind. Mac moved quietly through the night. Animal sounds, the howl of a wolf, the hoot of an owl, the chirping of crickets, guided his way across the prairie. His silent footfalls disturbed nothing, and a smile crept upon his face. The entire scenario, with the exception of the alien ships overhead, reminded him of training exercises in the Marine Corps. The thought of the aliens made him pause. He crouched, listening, and looked toward the night sky. There, he thought, watching a light move across the stars, that's one of them. He studied the lights above, identifying three more alien ships. The thought of them sitting there, watching the village, made his skin crawl. He shuddered, shook off the feeling, and continued on his journey. He walked for over an hour, taking a long, winding route through the prairie and along the lake to the north. He paused to fill up three bladders given to him by Serena. The makeshift canteens filled, he set course for the same hill where he initially met the Tuscara. Another hour, and Mac began the short climb to his hiding spot. There is a small depression, Samish told him, halfway up the north side of the hill. Three boulders hide a shallow cave. Hide there. You will have a good view of the village, and you will not be seen. How do you know of such a place? Serena inquired accusingly. I... I used to hide from you there, he replied sheepishly. The thought of the conversation returned the smile to his lips as he found the three boulders in the waning moonlight. He tossed one of the bladders in the small depression, heard some small animal scurry away, and nodded. At least it wasn't a snake. Max settled into the depression and found that he did have a perfect view of the village. The distant fires glowed with dying embers. He spotted a sentry on the perimeter, moving from his left to his right. Nothing else moved in the night. He exhaled slowly, calming his body after the hours of walking. It felt good to get out and move, after two weeks in the adobe hut. The glowing fingers of daylight slowly spread across the eastern sky, and the sounds of the nocturnal creatures died away. The village sprang to life as children, under the guidance of two warriors, moved toward the forest. They returned minutes later with handfuls of wood for the fire. The village women stirred the fires and began preparing for the morning meal. The smell of food drifted into the air. Mac's stomach growled. Mac watched the village and took several long drinks from one of the bladders. With the village day in full swing, he settled into the shallow depression waiting for the overseers. Commander Devery raised a hand to shield his eyes as he stepped off the stairs to his ship. He shivered and pulled his thick jacket tighter. It was not often he longed for home, but today he ached with the feeling. The ship reminded him of home. The sterile environment and warm temperatures kept him comfortable. Although tired of the steel walls, it beat being planet-side. He squinted against the bright light and this damnable yellow star. The bright sunlight touched his skin. It burned more than warmed. He adjusted his jacket sleeves and the sensation passed quickly. The brief flash of pain reinforced his disdain for the planet and its inhabitants. Devery remembered his reason for the visit, plastered a cocky smile on his face, and moved toward the waiting Tuscara and Kaya. He left the safety of the ship, noting that two other vessels sat nearby, disgorging troops into the meadow. Dozens of armored Belega spread out in a large semicircle, rifles in hand, ready to quash a rebellion if warranted. Three Belega craft circled overhead, their shadows running across the grassy plain. Chief Borda, flanked by his bodyguard and his son, stood at the head of the crowd of villagers. A young female moved to stand close to Borda, and Devry's smile grew. The woman, Serena, enamored him, even though they had only met once. She will make an excellent retirement gift after the next harvest. She shrank away from his gaze, moving to stand behind her father, and Devry shifted his vision, scanning the crowd. He recognized Bulltree of the Kaya, but no one else. He stopped fifteen feet from Borda, watching the chief closely. The human stood calmly, arms crossed, dark eyes staring at Devry. Good morning, Chief Borda, Devry began, his voice soft and even. 
and good morning to the Tuscara and Kaya people. A murmur flitted to the crowd, but no one returned the greeting. Devry laughed lightly. I see there is no love lost. Fine. To business, then. The commander motioned with his right hand, pointing to an area near his ship. If the Kaya will move over there, we will begin. He watched about a quarter of the crowd shuffle to his right. No one moved quickly, their desperation and fear palpable in the air. Devry glanced upward, noting that a dozen small drones floated over the crowd. Most of them were programmed to pan through the crowd to catch the reactions of what was to come. A few targeted certain individuals, Borda, Duran, and Boultry specifically. He returned his gaze to the chief. Chief Borta, today is a day of rejoicing. He fought a smile, knowing that a team of writers spent four days working on how to spin this as a positive. Today we ensure that a part of the Tuscara will survive, no matter the outcome of the next harvest. Two overseers stepped forward, carrying a large metal barrel between them, and set it down in the knee-high grass. Devry watched them step back paused, then moved with practiced ease to stand before the pot. He reached in and ran his fingers through the wooden chips inside. The sound of the crackling wood drifted across the plain. There are an even number of wooden chips in this barrel, Devry explained. He held up a handful. Some are white, some are black. Every Tuscara male will come forward and draw a chip. He dropped the handful of wood into the barrel. Once everyone has chosen, then I will tell you which are Tuscara and which will become Kaya. A murmur rippled through the crowd. Chief Borda held up a hand, silencing the village. Devry locked eyes with Borda. With one exception. Deron, please step forward. The young man took six steps forward, chest puffed, bow in his hand. The Tuscara stopped, his dark eyes held daggers of hate. The overseer motioned toward the Kaya nearby. Join your people, Chief Deran. A collective gasp chorused through the crowd. Perfect, Devry thought, and hoped the hovering cameras caught every shocked look. The commander motioned Deran toward the Kaya, and the young warrior moved off slowly, his eyes never wavering from the overseer. Devry turned back to Borda and saw the big man watching him, the chief's fists clenching and unclenching. Devry smiled. Chief Borda, please ask your warriors to draw a chip. Borda took a step toward Devry and then stopped as a shadow covered him. He looked skyward to the three overseer craft overhead. The craft stopped their circling, hovering over the crowd. With a snarl, the Tuscara chief issued the appropriate orders. Devry watched as the Tuscara men formed a line and, each in turn, reached into the barrel and blindly took a wooden chip. Very professional, the Belega admitted to himself. I may yet get out of this unscathed. The last man stepped forward, a spear in his hand. Devry watched him closely as he approached the barrel. He was young, muscled, and wore a yellow headband like Borda. The overseer held up a hand, stopping the man. Not you, Devry stated. You are too young. Stay with Tuscara. The young man's face contorted into a snarl, and Devry heard one of the cameras zoom in close, capturing the Tuscara's anger. The sight of the hovering drone further angered the young boy. He took a single step forward and launched the spear in the blink of an eye. Devry, startled, turned his head and watched the spear sail through the air. The drone, a small rectangle with four small repulsor engines and a camera, took the spear in the aft engine. The hardened flint blade sparked, overloaded the machine, and ignited the fuel cell deep inside. The drone exploded, flinging plastic and titanium pieces across the grassland. Devry ducked as debris rained down, metal fragments pelting his jacket. The sound of metal striking the ground faded, and he stood upright. He turned to see the young man standing, breathing heavily, staring at him. Devry's soldiers raised their weapons. Tension filled the air. Commander Devry laughed.
Sub-Lieutenant Stith stood off to the side, watching his commander lord over the humans, careful not to show his distaste for his commander's theatrics. He pulled up the collar of his thick jacket and simply observed. Stith did not enjoy his assignment on this planet. He was a belega of action, and thus wanted to return to the far-off battles of the ever-expanding Belega Empire. He missed the camaraderie of soldiers fighting together, the bond, the adrenaline of battle. His assignment, overseeing this miserable planet, felt like a step backwards for him. The post had been lucrative. Stith's bank accounts, official and non, prospered greatly during his tenure with Devry. Money isn't everything, he said on many occasions. Stith wanted to return to combat, to lead Belega in battle, to vanquish enemies without mercy. Devry denied his numerous transfer requests, and his hate for his superior grew. Now they stood in the cold, watching his latest plot twist for the humans. Stith touched the butt of his pistol, hoping that the primitives would revolt over the splitting of the tribes. That would solve several problems, he thought. End the humans, end the assignment, and end Devry. A grunt of exertion brought Stith back to the present. He watched a young boy with a bright yellow headband step forward and launch a spear. Stith reacted, drawing his pistol as his eyes tracked the projectile. He felt his fingers tighten on the trigger, but paused as he realized the spear flew high overhead. One of the drones exploded, a muffled boom that echoed in the still morning air. Debris rained down on Stith, and he raised his left arm to shield his face. He turned his attention back to the Tuscara, the pistol centered on the boy's chest. The debris stopped falling, and Stith lowered his arm. He sighted down the barrel, his fingers bluing on the trigger. The sound of Devry's raucous laughter filled the early morning, turning the tension in the crowd into curiosity. Stith paused, turning his attention to his commander. What is he doing? Thoughts of shooting his superior entered his mind, and he dismissed them quickly. The time for that would come soon enough. Stith watched as the boy's mask of anger morphed to bewilderment. The Tascara's confusion made Devry laugh harder. It took almost a minute before he regained his composure. Stith lowered his weapon and watched the crowd. "'You will make a formidable opponent, my young Tascaran friend,' Devry announced. "'Stay with your chief. For now, I look forward to seeing you at the next harvest.' Commander Devry turned to address Duran, who stood nearby with Akaya. Stith alternated his view, watching both the Tuscara and the Kaya with equal attention. The pistol remained in his hand, ready. Deron, Devry touched his collar, activating the speakers in the hovering ships. Chief Deron, five miles to the west you will find a village that we have graciously prepared for you. Take your people and build a new life. In five months we will return to observe your next harvest. One last thing before we go. Devry smiled. Stith felt the tension grow in the Tuscara, in both villages. Several nervous glances from Borda to his daughter, the one that Devry wanted, piqued his curiosity. What did they fear? As you can see, we have only selected men in our lottery. There is a reason for this. The winner of the next harvest day will be granted possession of the Tuscaran women and a one-year reprieve from fighting, Devry stated, his voice still booming through the speakers. This will afford you the opportunity to live in peace and begin to repopulate your village. The commander turned, looked up into one of the drone cameras, and nodded. Stith stood stoic, resisting the urge to shake his head. Devry may be old and nearing retirement, but he still held considerable sway with the emperor and his council. Devry's leadership raised the profitability of the harvest. That gained favor in the royal court. Soon, thought Stith, and motioned his men to return to the waiting ships. The sub-lieutenant paused at the base of the stairs and took one last look at the humans. The Tuscara stood on the outskirts of their village, face forlorn, some in tears. Chief Borda stared at the back of Devry, who approached the ship, unaware of the Tuscaran's gaze. The Kaya moved away quietly. Duran rode on the back of a black steed, 
back straight, head high. He headed west, never looking back, leading his new people. A warrior, perhaps someone to strike a deal with when the time is right. The rest of his people, all men, did not share his enthusiasm. They walked away, heads down, several of them dragging their weapons behind them, leaving ruts in the grassland. A few stole glances toward the Tuscara. Devry arrived at the steps, blocking his view. Very good, sub-lieutenant, the commander nodded. Ensuring all of your men are aboard before boarding yourself. A nod. You will make a fine commander one day. Devery ascended the stairs without another comment. Stith shook his head and exhaled slowly. The old belega baited him, but now was not the time. He took one last look at the Tuscara. Most of the villagers had turned their backs on the overseers, returning to their morning rituals. The spear-throwing warrior watched Stith, anger in his eyes. Borda's daughter stood beside him, arm around the boy, coaxing him back to the village. The young boy succumbed to her reasoning, turned, and the two disappeared into the crowd. That boy will be troubled, Stith mumbled, turned, and ascended the stairs. The warm interior beckoned him, and he shivered as the ramp closed behind him. The sub-lieutenant bypassed the passenger area and Commander Devry and headed for the cockpit. He took a seat at the navigation station behind the co-pilot and activated the exterior cameras and drone feeds. The ship's engines roared to life and the pilot expertly lifted the ship off the ground. Stith watched the ground fall away on one of the six monitors before him. The other monitors showed a myriad of images, the Tuscara village, the Kaya procession, and the areas surrounding, including the farmland for both villages. At 20,000 feet, Stith ordered the pilot to hover. The fighter escort widened their circles, chasing shadows across the morning prairie land. The pilots obviously enjoyed the freedom to stretch their legs, and Stith encouraged them, gaining their trust and respect, allies when needed. The other two shuttles continued on toward the Extrinsy in geosynchronous orbit at the very edge of space. Stith adjusted the monitors, zooming in as much as possible on the Tuscara village. The drone's focus at this range grew blurry, but he could discern movement. He positioned the ship's cameras with higher resolution to zero in on the village. They sat there hovering for minutes as Stith watched. What is the holdup, sub-lieutenant? Devry's voice sounded through the comm line. What are we waiting for? We will be underway in a moment, Commander, Stith replied, eyes watching the screens. There, movement to the east. He adjusted the focus of the cameras. I am documenting their reactions to your announcements. Good idea, Stith, came the response. But let's not take all day. I have other duties to attend to. Stith clicked off the comm. The women will still be there in a few minutes he mumbled, drawing a chuckle from the pilot. The camera zeroed in on a figure moving from the eastern hills toward the village. He stood tall, although he walked slightly hunched over. The man's brown hair and pale skin drew Stith's attention. This was not a Tuscara. This was something else. Check the files, he ordered the pilot, a belega named Chidra. See if any of the other camps have reported a runaway. Two figures ran from the village toward the man. One was Serena, the object of Devry's affection. The other was the young warrior with the yellow headband. They met the man well outside the village. The woman embraced him. Stith nodded his head. They were hiding him, hence the tension. He ordered Chidra to proceed to the extrinsy and activated the comm. Put three drones on each village, he ordered the controller that answered his hail. Pipe all six feeds to me and me alone. Do not disturb the commander with these mundane details. I will prepare the reports personally. Chidra turned his seat around, facing Stith. There are no reports of anyone missing from any camps. He returned his seat forward, leaving the sub-lieutenant with his thoughts. Stith sat back in the chair and watched the blue atmosphere fade to the black of space. Who was this newcomer? Where did he come from? A rare smile touched his lips. And how can I exploit his presence to get rid of Devry? Chapter 7 
Chief Duran of the Kaya sat tall on the back of the black steed. The horse's powerful muscles yearned to run. He could feel it, and he pulled the reins to keep the animal at a slow, clipped pace. He stared straight ahead, trying to set an example for the men that traveled with him. A quick peripheral glance showed they did not share his stoic persona. The warriors trudged ahead, heads down, weapons dragging behind them, demoralized and downtrodden. Those were the Tuscara, leaving everything and every one they loved behind. The others, the Kaya members of the group, appeared more upbeat, happy to be alive. He led the group over a small rise, and once out of sight of the village, turned to look behind him. He saw the tops of the village huts, the smoke from the cook fires, but none of those left behind. A myriad of emotions flowed through him, exhilaration of being chief, sadness at those still in the village. An odd thought struck him, jolting him on the bare back of the horse. I will have to fight father, to kill my own family. At that moment, he hated the overseers more than ever. Duran faced forward, leading the thirty or so men toward the setting sun. None of the former Tuscara, save Duran, glanced up as the overseer ships lifted off. The crescent-shaped craft circled the barren grassland before shooting into the cloudless sky. The noise of the engines faded, and a welcome silence filled the group. Duran released the reins, lost in thought, and let the horse carry him. The sun inched toward the horizon, and a cool, welcoming breeze rustled the calf-high grassland. The new chief sniffed the air and smelled burning wood. He looked forward and saw wisps of smoke ahead. The group traversed another rise, and he grabbed the reins, pulling back on the leather to stop his steed. Before him, nestled in a small valley, lay his new home. Fifteen prefab mud huts sat in a rough circle around a central courtyard. One hut, larger than the rest and made of wood, sat near the center. Three small fires crackled softly, their smoke curling into the pre-dusk sky. A stream, overseer-made or natural, Duran could not tell, wound its way along the western perimeter. A large wooden fence pen for animals sat empty to the north. Duran waved his warriors forward. As he approached the village, he noticed stacks of wood for the fires, piles of animal hide blankets, and baskets of fruit and pre-cooked meat. The overseers want us to survive, at least for now, he thought. He stopped his horse at the edge of the village. The animal shook its head, releasing a plume of dust from its mane. Duran exhaled slowly as his eyes scanned the village again. Claim your hut, Duran ordered. Get food and rest. Tomorrow we prepare for the harvest. The Tuscara warriors took a few steps toward the huts to the left of Duran, the Kaya to the right. He opened his mouth to order them to integrate when a voice called out from the Kaya warriors. The sky people may have made you chief, but you have not earned it. Duran turned his head to see the largest of the Kaya standing in front of the assembly, a long spear in his right hand. His hair was cut short, barely to his neck. Dark, piercing eyes bored through Duran. The new chief felt a chill as the monster of a man took a step forward. I challenge you for chief. Boultry, the oldest of the Kaya, stepped in front of the warrior, halting his progress. Boultry's usually narrow eyes grew wide in trepidation, and he held up his arms to stop the challenge. The old man looked from the warrior to Duran and back. He shook his head. No, the sky people have spoken. Duran is the chief of the Kaya. There is no challenge. He lowered his arms and pulled his buffalo hide jacket tighter around him. The warrior stood quietly for a moment before nodding. Bultry sighed in relief and turned to walk away when the Kaya warrior raised his spear, took a quick step, and launched the weapon at Duran. Bultry cried, No! as the spear soared, the sharpened flint weapon barely missing Duran as he rolled off the back of the horse. He landed lightly on his feet as the horse, startled, reared on its hind legs. The Tuscara pulled a long-handled tomahawk from a leather hide belt around his waist. He moved to his right, away from the panicked horse, his eyes locked with the Kaya warrior. 
His attacker produced a short steel sword from a sheath across his back. The Kaya twirled the sword, testing the feel of the weapon in his hand as he too moved to his right. The two circled as Bulltree pushed the assembled warriors back. The two groups, Kaya and Tascara, formed a rough circle around the two fighters. Everyone had a hand on a weapon, but no one drew as they watched the two men vie for leadership of the village. The Kaya struck first, a simple thrust of the sword toward Duran's abdomen. The Tuscara parried with his tomahawk, stepped forward, and swung the axe-like weapon at the Kaya's head. The warrior, anticipating the move, stepped backward, ducking to his left. The men circled again. Duran made the next move, feigning an attack from the right, waiting for the Kaya to raise his sword to block, and then spun, attacking from the left. The Kaya reacted quickly, blocking the attack, but not before the edge of the tomahawk touched him, slicing through his skin. Duran drew first blood. The Kaya counterattacked immediately with a series of slices and lunges. Duran blocked the fierce strokes, the impacts against his tomahawk numbing his right hand. He heard a crack, felt the wooden handle tremble as he backpedaled from the warrior. He stopped his backward motion and stepped forward, locking his tomahawk blade with the Kaya's sword. The two stood nearly nose to nose. The assembled Kaya yelled their support. The Tuscara remained silent, watching. No need for this, Duran said through gritted teeth. Your strength is needed for the upcoming battle. You are weak, the Kaya spat, anger filling his voice. Surrender, and I will allow you to live. My life is not yours to give, Duran replied, or take. He leaned forward and bit the Kaya's nose. The Kaya screamed in pain and pulled away from Duran. He dropped his sword and grabbed his nose. The warrior peered around his hands as he cradled his wound, eyes fixated on Duran. The man's chest heaved with quick, ragged breaths, rage building. Duran sped out the tip of the Kaya's nose, blood and spittle splattering on the ground. He wiped his mouth with his left hand and raised his tomahawk. A crack split the handle of the weapon, a long sliver of the wood missing. The flint head of the axe lay at an angle that made the weapon useless. Duran snarled and tossed the tomahawk aside. The Kaya roared and charged, his big arms spread wide to wrap up Duran in a bone-crushing bear hug. Duran stepped forward into the attack, extended his left hand, and stabbed the warrior with the missing piece of the wooden handle. The Kaya's battle cry turned into a scream of agony. Duran grunted and shoved the wooden dagger deeper into the warrior's chest. The fight drained from the warrior as he slumped, sliding against Duran as he fell to the ground. Duran released the makeshift dagger, leaving the end of the wood protruding from the Kaya's chest. He stepped back, post-combat fatigue filling his body almost immediately. It was the end of an emotion-filled day, and the chief felt every minute of it. He fell to his knees, hands on his thighs, and gulped in air. Finally, he exhaled. Remaining on the ground, he motioned for the warriors to gather round, both groups. He waved them closer and inhaled slowly. He heard the exhaustion in his own voice and wondered how the others would perceive it. It did not matter. He was chief, and he had to act like it. The first step, healing the divide between the two factions. Whatever our differences, our backgrounds, we are one village now. We must work together, become one, he shook his head, or we will die. It has been a long day, he stood. Get food, get rest. Bulldry, he called, looking toward his elder. The man stood nearby, stoic, quiet, his face an emotionless mask. Assign two men to each hut, one Tuscara, one Kaya. We must learn to live together, and that will be the first step. Bultry nodded. Wipe the past away, Duran stated. Tomorrow is a new day. We need horses, a Kaya warrior named Reland stated. Reland, along with a handful of other Kaya, sat cross-legged around a small fire in the center of the village. Each took turns holding their arms out, warming themselves. Relan placed another piece of wood on the fire. He watched the embers race skyward toward the starry night. He listened to the crackle of the logs as they burned. Without horses, we will not be able to farm effectively, 
another warrior reiterated, the glow of the fire casting his features in light and shadow. We need them to pull the plows. Without them, there will be no harvest. We are less than five moons from harvest and have nothing planted. We need them to fight, another interjected. With horses, the Tuscara have the advantage. The discussion raged into the night, each man voicing his concern on an item the Kaya needed. Horses, tools, additional weapons, seed. There appeared to be no end to the list of things the Kaya lacked. The warriors grew tired as they argued over priorities. The first fingers of light lit the eastern sky. The cool, steady breeze of night died as the dawn slowly grew brighter. The warriors stretched but remained seated. The conversation died off as Bulltree emerged from a nearby mud and thatch hut. The older man stretched, shivered, and pulled his buffalo hide coat tighter around him. He moved toward the assembled warriors and, without asking, sat with them. The warmth of the fire felt good on his old bones. He raised his arms, letting the warmth slide along his arms to his body. His eyes locked with each warrior in turn. He saw a combination of anger and fear in each, anger at their forced integration, fear of the future. Bultry finally lowered his arms, dropping them into his lap, and laughed softly. Did you know your voices carry in the night? He watched the anger and fear morph to shock and nodded his head. Yes, I heard your conversation, and it may surprise you, but I agree. We need many things, but discussing them in the middle of the night amongst yourselves will not solve the problem. You need to discuss them with the chief. You are taking this well, Bultry, Roland stated with accusing eyes. I am an old Kaya, Bultry replied with a shrug. I have only a few harvests left, one way or another. Either I die in battle or from the years. Death is the only certainty in life. I choose to live while I am alive. You have embraced Deron without question, Roland answered. Why? The sky people, or overseers, as the chief calls them, are powerful beings. They could swat us away as we do a fly. They wish Deron to lead, then he shall lead. But can he? Roland responded. We know that he can fight. He defeated Merle in open combat, but can he lead? Yes. Deron's confident voice floated in the early morning air. The assembled warriors turned to see their chief emerge from the shadow of a nearby hut. He approached slowly and took a seat around the fire, his legs crossed. He took a moment to stare at each man. In answer to your question, yes, I can lead. My father, Chief Porta, knew that one day I would be chief. I have been trained since I was a young warrior to take over the village. He shrugged and offered a snort of a laugh. <laughs> No one thought it would be a different tribe. No one joined him in his laugh. Bultry saw Duran look in his direction. Uncertainty filled his dark eyes. The old warrior nodded his support, and the chief continued. I have listened to your discussions, and you are correct. There are many things that we need. Most of these things are available in the Tuscara village. Tuscaran warriors filed out of the surrounding huts. They stretched and yawned in the early morning. The Kaya tribesmen watched their brethren approach. That is our point, Roland continued. They have everything. We have nothing. No, Duran smiled as the rest of the warriors drew close to the fire. We have knowledge, knowledge of the Tuscara and their village. Knowledge does not farm the land, Roland said, or win battles. Duran laughed. Knowledge does both if applied properly. How? We need horses, seed, and weapons, yes? The assembled Kaya nodded, the former Tuscara fidgeting nervously. And the Tuscara have these items? Another nod. Then we will use our knowledge to take them from the Tuscara. Chapter 8 My Connie and Keha, mother, died when I was little. Mac and Serena strolled around the lake to the north of the Tuscara village. Samish trailed a respectful distance behind, spear at the ready. 
The evening breeze rustled their clothes, the lake wind adding a chill to the air. Mac exchanged his tattered flight suit for a buffalo hide jacket and pants that hung just below his knees. Serena wore a traditional woven dress like the rest of the women in the village. Three days had passed since the overseers split the Tuscara. Tensions and emotions ran high. Talk in the village ranged from surrender to the aliens to pure defiance, demanding Chief Borda lead a party to retrieve loved ones. Borda remained passive, saying he would think on the matter. Many turned to Serena to use her influence on her father, and the loss of her own brother to sway his decision. Sensing her need to get away, Mac and Samish snuck her away from the village at dusk. The peace would not last. But for now, Mac provided a much-needed distraction. Killed during a harvest, a stray arrow shot into the air at random. She felt his hand encircle hers as she told him her story. Father raised Iran and I with the help of other women in the village. When Samish was orphaned during a harvest, Father took him in as a favor to Samish's family. The women took him in as well. The entire village became our family. Father was often distracted, as you can imagine, but he did the best he could. The thought of Duran threatened to tear down her emotional walls. She quickly changed the subject. Tell me about you. Where are you from? What did you do besides fly in the sky? Mac told her of his upbringing in Pennsylvania, joining the military, flying, and joining the reconstituted NASA and the Space Corps. Serena walked with him hand in hand, enjoying his deep voice. A shooting star drew her attention to a cloudless night and a billion stars that provided a romantic backdrop. Romantic? Is that how she saw Mac? Yes, she realized. Although promised to Phelan for his bravery in battle and loyalty to her father, Serena wanted Mac. The thought made her smile, and she squeezed his hand. That star there. Mac's voice interrupted her musings. That looks like Vega. She saw confusion on his face, and his voice became distant. But maybe not. Something isn't right. Not right? She repeated. The stars, he pointed again. They look like Earth constellations, but they're different. Like the planet is slightly out of orbit. He shook his head. Not important. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Flying in the Iraq War. The two continued for another mile, skirting the lake's edge in the moonlit night. Max stepped over the small running creek and turned to Serena. She felt his hands engulf hers, and he hoisted her over the water. She landed softly on the other side of the creek with a laugh. The moon continued its rise, adding more crescent light to the area. Serena heard fish jump in the lake, smelled a decaying animal in the woods off to her right, the hoot from an owl startled her, and she jumped. Mac pulled her closer, wrapping his arm around her. Occasionally, he would point to an object, and Serena would pronounce it in her language. He is learning quickly, she mused as they walked. A twig snapped, and Serena turned to see Samish drawing closer. His wide eyes continuously scanned the environment around them. His actions contagious, Serena found herself searching the darkness also. What is it, Sam? Mac asked. Serena marveled at the two men and their friendship. The unlikely pair, after their initial fight, spent most of their time together, training each other. Mac taught Samish fighting skills. Samish taught Mac hunting and the Tuscara language. I think we are being followed, he reported. He pointed toward the woods. Something is spooking the wildlife. Human or animal? Mac asked. I do not know. Serena watched Mac as his eyes searched the darkness his piercing eyes moving slowly, peering into the shadows. Serena shivered. The eyes that had shown so much life and love a few moments earlier now displayed a cold, warrior gaze. He pulled her closer. I think it's time we head back, yes? Yes, Serena confirmed. She allowed Mac to steer her back toward the Tuscara village. Samish moved with them, closer this time, spear at the ready. A deathly animal scream followed a few minutes later the sound echoing across the lake. Serena jumped, and chills covered her body. She pulled Mac closer. All three paused, looking back at the forest, before continuing toward the village at a quicker pace. 
Phelan stalked his prey. He stayed low, crouching. Every step made with precision, soundlessly, his eyes locked on his target. An arrow lay notched on his bowstring, the weapon at the ready, but undrawn. The crescent moon provided ample light as he tracked the three figures moving along the edge of the lake. He watched Mac help Serena over a small babbling brook. Her smile lit up the night. His joy at her smile turned to rage as she laughed along with the stranger. No, the invader. Sweat covered his body despite the cool breeze. He stole a glance to his left, turning his head enough to use his only good eye. The young boy, Samish, followed behind. The young fool should have killed the invader when he first encountered him, thought Phelan. He raised the bow, thought about killing the boy, and then lowered the weapon. Borda would not be pleased if he killed the only son the chief had left. Instead, Phelan turned his attention back to Serena and the newcomer. The pale skin pulled Serena closer, his arms wrapped around her. The elder Tuscaran raised the bow again, but dared not take the shot with her so close. Patience, he chided, but the anger did not fade. He grunted in frustration, turned, and moved into the trees at the edge of the woods. Hopes that they would pass close by filled his thoughts. He watched as Samish approached. The three spoke for a moment, and all of them began to study the land. Had he been discovered? Had the boy progressed further than Phelan expected? Yes, he thought, as the three of them turned and made their way back toward the village. Phelan crouched by a tree, perfectly still, and let the rage consume him. His heart pounded as he watched Serena disappear into the night. The old warrior gritted his teeth, seething and shaking. The brush to his right rustled, and he turned his head. A small deer emerged from the foliage only a few yards away, staring in his direction. The young creature sniffed the air, took a step tentative forward, then two steps back. The wide, innocent eyes stared directly at Phelan and sniffed again. The animal turned to flee, but Phelan moved faster. He brought the bow up, knocked the arrow, drew, and let it fly in an instant. The arrow struck home. The deer staggered a few steps on wobbly legs and collapsed with a faint grunt. Phelan stood, drawing a stone-sharpened knife from a sheath at his waist. The animal kicked and thrashed weakly, and the Tuscaran smelled the fear and desperation of the deer. He drew closer, and the animal kicked harder, the arrow protruding from its flank. In his mind, Phelan pictured Mac lying there, fearful, panicked, with no hope for escape. That thought brought a smile to his lips as he plunged the knife deep into the side of the deer. The wounded animal emitted a gurgling scream. The wind carried the sound through the trees, the cry echoing through the night. Phelan raised the knife and stabbed again and again. Sticky, wet blood covered his hands and splattered his face as he eviscerated the animal. Finally, he stood, breathing heavy, heart pounding. Blood covered his face, chest, and clothes. He staggered slightly from adrenaline overload and stared down at the destroyed animal carcass. He backed into a tree, gasping for air. His pulse pounded in his ears. With the knife still in his right hand, he wiped his face with his right arm, smearing the blood across his skin. Jaw clenched, his eyes turned slowly toward the west, following the direction where Serena led the invader toward the village. A cold smile crossed his lips, and Phelan left the woods at a slow trot. A roundabout path would take him to the village, and he would arrive ahead of them. Thoughts of killing the invader filled his mind, spurring him into a run. Tonight, he would rid the Tuscara of the menace and win the heart of the woman promised to him. Phelan ran into the night. The village fires blazed despite the late hour. Mac, Serena, and Samish entered the village from the north, from the farmland that sat on the banks of the adjoining lake. A few warriors kept lookout. A few women stoked fires and stirred the cook pots. Most of the camp, however, slept. The trio stepped into the circle of firelight that filled the center of the village, all out of breath from their hasty return from the walk. Serena placed her hands on her hips, as did Samish, sucking in oxygen. Mac stretched his back, relieved that his ribs had finally healed, even though he felt them pull slightly as he arched. One of the women left her cook fire, produced a bladder of water, and offered it to Serena. 
She drank and passed it to Samish. The woman produced a second bladder, offering it to Mac. He took it with a slight bow to the woman. She smiled, embarrassed, and returned to stirring her pot. He drained half the water in a long gulp, wiping his mouth with his arm as he finished. He offered the bladder to Serena. She looked past Mac into the darkness. Her eyes widened in terror. She gasped, dropping the water bladder. Mac turned his head, following her gaze, and saw Phelan standing at the edge of the firelight. Blood smeared his face, mixed with sweat, and ran down his body, covering his brown animal hide jacket. He held a bloody knife in his right hand. His wide, crazed eyes stared at Mac. Serena shrank back as Mac stepped in front of her, arm out in protection. Samish stepped forward, the spear out and ready. Mac waved him back. Phelan? Serena asked, peering around Mac's shoulder. Are you all right? The Tuscara warrior wiped his face with his right arm, smearing the blood further. His breathing ragged. He took a few steps forward, eyes maintaining their lock on Mac. I challenge you, he addressed Mac, ignoring Serena's question. Serena is promised to me. By right, I challenge you for her. Wait, what? Mac asked, confused. He turned his head slightly towards Serena. What is he talking about? Even in the dim firelight, Mac could see Serena blush. She stepped back from Mac, head lowered. Phelan was, is, one of our best warriors, she began. He was wounded a few harvests ago, lost his left eye. He felt helpless, useless to the village. My father made him his personal bodyguard and promised me to him. A strong warrior begets a strong warrior. And now he's jealous and wants to kill me? Mac implied. Great. He turned to face Phelan. He offered empty hands to the Tuscara. I do not want to fight you. If I overstepped my... You do not want me? Serena's voice, her unexpected words, killed his train of thought and stung him to his core. Mac turned to face her, placing his hands on her shoulders. He stared into her brow. Of course I do. I... Phelan's battle cry destroyed the moment. Mac pushed Serena away and whirled to face the attacking warrior. The Tuscara charged, closing the distance between the two men in seconds. He held the bloody knife high, moved in close, and executed a downward thrust toward Mac's neck. Mac stepped to his left, shoving Samish out of the way. Phelan missed, recovered, and slashed sideways as Mac hopped backwards. The two circled. Phelan flicked the knife back and forth between his left and right hands, the blade constantly moving. He lunged with a quick feint with his left, tossed the knife into his right hand, and stabbed. Mac felt the blade touch his abdomen, heard the whoosh of the knife as it sliced the ear. He leapt out of the way, and Phelan followed, pressing the attack. Mac blocked Phelan's backhand stroke with his left hand and captured Phelan's wrist with his right. He twisted and heard the warrior gasp with pain. Mac slapped the knife away, the blade disappearing into the darkness. He released the warrior, shoving him away. Phelan stepped back, rubbing his wrist as he stared at Mac. A crowd gathered as the awakened villagers left their huts. Murmurs filled the air as the Tuscara questioned the fight. The women, previously tending fires, became play-by-play -play announcers. Mac stole a quick glance at Serena, Chief Porta and Samish flanking her. Shadows danced across her face from the fires. Concern lit in her eyes. Mac looked at Borda. The chief wore a neutral mask, but Mac thought he saw a hint of doubt or disappointment. He turned back to Phelan, putting the woman out of his mind. I do not want to fight you, Phelan. He chose his words carefully, hoping to end the conflict before someone got hurt. He reached down and touched his stomach, his hand coming away with a smear of blood further hurt. The challenge is made, invader, Phelan bellowed. Are you warrior or coward? I don't want Phelan attacked again. The Tuscara stepped forward, kicking dirt toward Mac. Mac turned his head, but not before specks of dirt infiltrated his eyes. Momentarily blind, Mac tried to blink away the debris while he listened to the footfalls closing in. He feigned to the left as he had earlier, before moving to the right. Phelan grunted as he lunged. Mac sidestepped, listening to the Tuscara's footsteps. Mac cleared his eyes enough to see and lashed out with a kick. The attack connected. Phelan groaned. 
Mac blinked again, clearing more of the dirt from his eyes. The big Tuscara filled his vision as he finally focused. The warrior pummeled Mac's midsection with a series of punches, each strike harder than the first. Mac backpedaled, but Phelan stayed with him, hammering his abdomen. Mac heard the cheers of the villagers over the thump of Phelan's fists. The Tuscara shifted to his face, and Mac raised his arms to ward off the attack. The warrior's fist connected. Pain flashed from Mac's injured nose. His head rocked back from the impact. His eyes watered. Mac stumbled back a step. Tears from the pain streamed down his face, washing away the last of the dust from his eyes. Mac saw his assailant clearly and lashed out with both hands, concussing Phelan's ears. The attack stopped immediately. The Tuscara yelled in pain and backed off. Mac gulped in air and, after another moment to blink away the tears, counterattacked. Phelan blocked his first punch, but not the second, a right hook to the Tuscara's jaw. Mac grunted as he delivered an uppercut to the abdomen the force of the punch lifting Phelan to his toes. Another one-two punch to the stomach, and Mac stepped back winded. Phelan staggered back as well, putting space between the two men. The crowd continued to encourage the fight, but now Mac heard a distinct section rooting for him. He nodded and wiped away blood from his nose with his arm. He stared at Phelan a few feet distant, seething in rage. Mac forced himself to relax as he squatted into a defensive stance. Mac stared Phelan in the eyes and motioned with his fingers for the Tuscara to attack. The crowd grew quiet in anticipation. The Tuscara approached wearily and Mac waited, watching. The warrior began to circle, but Mac did not move, letting Phelan get behind him. Mac watched the crowd. Their eyes widened and he knew that the Tuscara attacked. Mac dropped to his hands in a plank position, coiled like a spring, and kicked Phelan in the stomach. The force of the blow sent the Tuscara flying. Mac jumped to his feet and turned in time to see the warrior land hard and roll to the edge of one of the cook fires. The man screamed and rolled away, patting his back as he stood. Phelan's face flushed with anger, and he charged Mac in a mindless rage. Mac stepped to his right, clapping the Tuscara on the back as he passed. Phelan fell forward, scraping his face and hands on the hard ground. He leapt to his feet, turned, and charged again. Mac grabbed an arm, planted his foot, and spun, sending the warrior flying again. Phelan landed hard, missed the fire by less than a foot, and rolled to a stop on his hands and knees. The Tuscara grabbed a log from the fire and approached Mac. Phelan waved the flaming log, and Mac felt the heat from the flames. Mac sidestepped the fire, staying one step ahead of the flailing log. Phelan raised the log over his head and charged. Mac met him halfway, grabbing the warrior's arms and keeping the flaming weapon high overhead. Both men stood nose to nose, arms extended overhead. A glint of light to his left revealed Phelan's discarded knife. Mac's arms quivered with the strain, and he felt Phelan gain the upper hand. The former Marine's body shook with exertion. Phelan snarled. Mac did the only thing he could think of. He fell over backwards. Shock filled Phelan's face as he fell with Mac. The Space Force officer rolled into a ball, tucked his legs, and catapulted Phelan over his head. He heard the log hit the ground. Phelan screamed. The Tuscara landed hard, flat on his back, knocking the wind out of him. Mac leapt to his feet, retrieved the knife, and straddled the Tuscara. Panting, Mac leaned forward and placed the knife to Phelan's throat. The night grew quiet and still. The animal sounds faded. The wind died. The crowd froze as they saw the blade at the warrior's throat. Mac struggled for breath. His arms and legs quaked with exhaustion. His gaze crossed the crowd, anxious and astonished faces staring at him in the darkness. No one moved. He found Serena staring at him, fear and horror etched across her face. He turned away. He could not bear to see the hurt in her eyes. He pulled the knife away from Phelan's throat and looked into the man's good eye. Mac shook his head. If you ever attack me again, his voice cold, I will kill you. Serena is free to choose whoever she wants, Mac continued with a quick glance at the woman. If she wants you, so be it. If not, he let the sentence hang. Mac stood and stepped away from Phelan, the knife still in his hand. He felt someone approach and turned to see Chief Borda. The light from the fires flickered across his face, giving his features a demonic look. 
When he spoke, there was sadness. The challenge is not complete until one of you is dead, he explained. Leaving an enemy alive is a sign of disrespect. I'm not going to kill him over this, Max stated, dropping the knife. Your culture says it is disrespect? Forda nodded. Mine says it is a life debt. I spared his life. Now, Phelan owes me. But, no, Max said, more forceful than intended to the chief. He owes me his life. If he attacks me again, it is forfeit. Now the choice is his. Mac addressed both Borda and the assembled Tuscara villagers. All eyes turned to Phelan, who sat on his knees. Mac tensed, ready to defend again, wishing he had not dropped the knife. The Tuscara stared at Mac for a moment, hatred in his eyes, before he turned to Borda. The warrior bowed, turned, and with head hung low, moved toward the edge of the village. The crowd parted, and Phelan disappeared into the night. Chapter 9 Dark storm clouds on the horizon greeted Chief Duran as he exited the adobe hut. Naked from the waist up, he stretched his muscled body. A myriad of dim scars, a testimony to his warrior prowess, crossed his chest and shoulders. A long-handled tomahawk, resembling his father's, hung from his waist. The ornately carved handle bounced on his right thigh as he walked. A steady wind rustled his unbraided hair. A rumble from the east promised a stormy day. He left the doorway and moved toward the center of the Kaya village. The trio of fire pits sat dormant. He shivered slightly, missing the constant fires in the Tuscara village. Have to assign someone to tend the fires, he thought. He grabbed a few pieces of wood from a nearby pile and stoked the few embers that remained. He found the effort to restart the fire calming, soothing. He blew on the embers, scattering bits of dried leaves on the glowing orbs. Once aflame, Duran added a few small twigs. The fire caught, and he tossed the wooden logs onto the fire. He glanced up and saw that his efforts had drawn a sleepy-eyed crowd. Two warriors, one Kaya and one Tuscara, moved to the other fire pits, stoking the other embers. The crowd dispersed, returning minutes later with kindling, wood, and cooking pots. The village fires roared. The smell of cooking meat and stew filled the gray morning. Duran stepped back and watched, noting that the two different groups were working together, integrating. Relief filled him. We may have a chance. Ashal drew his attention and he moved toward the perimeter of his village. Two warriors, again one Kaya and one Tuscara, flanked a bound prisoner. Blood ran down the prisoner's face and buffalo hide jacket. Duran's blood boiled. Who beat this man? he demanded as he intercepted them. Unbind him at once. He arrived this way, chief, one of the warriors replied. The other produced a knife and cut the horsehair rope binding Phelan's hands. He asked to be brought to you. Duran took a breath, calmed himself, and nodded. Return to your post. I'll make sure you are relieved shortly. Warm yourself and get food. Yes, chief, the warrior said, turned, and disappeared toward the perimeter of the village. Duran turned his attention to Phelan, surveying his longtime friend. What happened? Is father all right, Serena? They are all fine, Chief Duran, Phelan replied. He rubbed his wrists where the ropes chafed him. It is the invader. Duran offered a curious look. The newcomer, Mac. He has cast a spell, has them entranced. Phelan shook his head. Serena has declared her love for him. She is promised to you, old friend, Duran offered, but the words rang hollow. Serena was strong-willed. The woman would definitely make her own decisions about marriage. He guided Phelan into the village toward the fires. The assembled warriors parted, making room for the older man. Phelan nodded his thanks and extended his arms toward the fire. Things have changed, Phelan said, his voice low in the quiet morning. Another rumble, closer this time. Duran sniffed, smelled the moisture in the air. The invader and the splitting of the village has changed everything. Invader? Several of the Kaya asked in unison. Duran looked over his assembled warriors and nodded. There are many things we need to discuss. He looked to the sky as a light drizzle began. There will be no prepping of the land today, as we planned. Get rest, eat, get to know your... your tribesmen. 
Bultry, he called, looking over the crowd. The elder Kaya appeared at his right elbow. Pull in the sentries, make sure everyone is safe in their huts. Then pick four of our best warriors and join me in my hut. Chief, Valen is the missing piece to our plans, Duran stated, pointing toward the elder Tascara. Duran looked skyward at the dark clouds, the flash of lightning in the distance. The drizzle turned into a light rain that promised to grow harder. A smile formed on his lips. And this storm is the opportunity we need. Go now. I will explain everything shortly. Yes, chief, Bultry replied. The old Kaya turned and began barking orders to the assembled warriors. Duran guided Phelan away from the chaos, and the two entered the largest hut in the village. The building sat twice as long as wide, with a door on each end. Four support beams split the center of the building. Two fire pits lay dormant. A Kaya warrior bent over the closest one, rubbing two sticks together. The two men stood quietly as the man worked. The fire sprang to life, filling the dark hut with light and warmth. Duran felt Phelan's shiver beside him and led the older man to a spot by the fire. Duran thanked the warrior, and the Kaya left. Duran and Phelan stood near the fire, letting the warmth fight the chill in the room. Duran added another log, stoking the embers. The dank, damp air dissipated, and the large hut took on a more hospitable feel. Bultry arrived with four warriors in tow, and everyone crowded around the fire. The rain outside grew heavier, pounding on the thatch and mud roof. A steady drip announced a small leak near the door, the dirt floor churning into mud with each drop. Flashes of lightning created a strobe effect through the open door. The wind howled, blowing through the open door and fueling the flickering flames. Shadows danced along the walls of the hut. Chief, Bultry began, who is this and what invader is he talking about? Duran studied the faces of the men standing around the fire. He saw two wise elder warriors, two Tuscara whom he knew, and two Kaya warriors that he did not. The two Kaya stood tall, fierce, and formidable. Duran trusted Bultry to provide the best of the best. His survey of his audience complete, he began. This is Phelan, a family friend and the bodyguard to Chief Porta. He paused, letting the words sink in. He comes to us with news from the Tuscara village, and an opportunity. Duran circled around the men huddled around the fire, collecting his thoughts. The invader is a man called Mac. My people believe he is part of a prophecy that will lead the Tuscara to victory over their enemies. The Kaya have a similar belief, Bultry acknowledged. Did he arrive in a ball of fire? Duran nodded. We share the same history, Bultry mused. Somewhere in time, our ancestors fought together. He looked at Phelan. This Mac, you fought? Phelan nodded. He has strange ways? Another nod. Pale skin? Using the Sky People's language? Yes, Phelan mumbled. Hmm, Bultry said, rubbing his chin. It is told that a pale man from the stars will unite the Kaya with ancient relatives to fight a great evil. His eyes locked with Duran's. Could this man be the one? The tales are similar, but they are just that. Stories, Duran corrected. He returned to his spot in the circle around the fire. Whatever his purpose, he has beaten my friend, my mentor. He is dangerous, and he will be dealt with. An uneasy silence descended on the assembly. The steady pounding rain, the raging wind, and the crackle of the fire filled the room. Duran stared into the flames, mesmerized. Bultry broke the silence. Phelan, the Kaya welcome you. Chief, what is this opportunity that you spoke of? Duran lifted his eyes from the hypnotic fire. Two days ago, we discussed the need for horses. He saw several heads nod. We also need a healer. My sister is the healer for the Tuscara. We are going to raid the Tuscara and take what we need. It is not yet harvest, one of the Tuscara cautioned, obviously nervous about attacking his former village. The overseers may not like it if we attack early. Duran offered a reassuring smile his confidence making the smile genuine. We are not attacking the village. This will be a simple raid for supplies. No casualties, no fighting. How? one of the Kaya asked gruffly. 
We will use this storm as cover, Deron nodded. A small force, one for the horses, one for the healer. The Tuscara warrior looked doubtful. You do not agree, Gillen? Deron asked. Gillen stood up straight, staring Deron in the eyes. You are chief. You say go, I go. Deron nodded. Then we will plan the raid. And before the rain ends, we will have what we need for the next harvest. Rain continued to fall throughout the day as Duran, Bultree, and Phelan met with many of the Kaya warriors. Each man reported to Duran's hut, warmed themselves by the fire, received instructions and their tasks for the raid. Duran's shoulders slumped with exhaustion by mid-afternoon. He was a man of action, but understood the necessity of thorough planning. Chief Borda taught him well. The rain continued to fall as night closed in on the village, Duran led a dozen men from the village heading east. Lightning, so prevalent during the heat of the day, had long vanished. Dark clouds blocked the stars, concealing their presence. The soft ground hid their footfalls, although each man at some point splashed through a puddle in the dark. The warriors paused short of the Tuscara village, each man climbing the small rise to the south of the village. Rain had soaked the fires, dousing the central courtyard in darkness. Duran saw the outline of huts, a few shifting shadows thanks to the clouds above, but no movement. Borda, like Duran, had pulled in the sentries for the storm. Perfect. The plan called for Phelan to enter the village, alerting Duran of any hidden sentries. Bultry would take the bulk of the force in a wide arc around the village to the horse pens to the north. Duran, with three Kaya, would enter the village and find Serena. Satisfied with the event so far, Duran motioned for Bultry to move out. The elder warrior smiled and nodded. Duran recalled the man's words. I haven't felt this useful in several harvests. He watched Bultry and his group disappear into the darkness, their forms blending into the night. He counted to a hundred twice before nudging Phelan. The old man looked tired, demoralized, the opposite of Bultry. The Tuscara warrior nodded, stood, and moved toward the village. Duran lay in the light rain, flanked by Kaya warriors. He waited. The rain stopped. The clouds parted, revealing a sliver of a moon high overhead. Duran lay, soaked and shivering, on the hill, watching the village. Nothing moved in the village. No sounds emerged. He began to wonder what happened to Bultry and Phelan when the horses to the north began to bay and whinny. Let's go, Duran whispered and rose from his spot. He led the two warriors down the hill quickly, their footfalls nearly silent as they approached. Duran entered his former village, surprised that he felt no remorse for leaving them behind. Not my decision. That was the overseer's. He pushed that thought from his mind and searched the central courtyard for signs of Phelan. Sounds grew from the horse pens, the frightened animals stomping and baying loudly. Duran pointed to Serena's hut, and his two Kaya warriors moved in that direction. Phelan appeared from the shadows, a long spear in his hands, heading for the hut assigned to Mac. Duran locked eyes with the elder warrior and shook his head, but Phelan ignored the motion and crept toward the door. The Kaya emerged from Serena's hut empty-handed. Both shook their heads. She was not in her hut. A shout from the horse pen split the night. The heavy hide door flaps flew open on several huts, spilling light into the center of the village. The flap to Max hut opened. A silhouette figure peered from the interior. Duran opened his mouth to shout a warning as Phelan thrust his spear at the figure. The weapon struck flesh, and a young man's scream echoed into the night. The bay of a horse roused the mish from a deep slumber interrupting his dreams of conquest and vanquishing the overseers. One moment he stood in a field littered with dead alien bodies, spear held over his head, foot on the throat of the alien commander, as Samish screamed his battle cry. The next he sat up, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. The hut sat dark except for a dying fire in the center of the single room. He looked across the room to see Serena and Mac lying together in a bed of animal hide. His sister's head lay on Mac's chest, a smile on her face. He snored loudly, the sound reverberating off the walls. 
Samish looked around the rest of the hut, but saw nothing that would have interrupted his dream. A horse bayed, and he heard the animals stomp. Wolves, he thought, as he rose from the bed. Someone shouted. Not wolves! He grabbed his spear lying on the floor beside his bed and hefted it to ensure it sat balanced in his hand. He padded softly to the door and flung open the heavy buffalo hide door. Faint light from the hut's dying fire streamed into the darkness, casting his long shadow across the center of the village. The light from other huts lit the area as other villagers rose to investigate the noise. A figure stood in the courtyard, swathed in pale light. It took a moment before Samish recognized Daran. He saw his brother open his mouth to shout, but movement drew his attention to someone standing in the darkness. The figure stepped into the light, an older man with hatred in his eyes. Phelan. Fire erupted on his left side as Phelan lunged with his spear. Samish screamed in pain as the sharpened flint split his side, just under the ribcage. He stabbed with his own weapon, the weak thrust easily blocked by Phelan. The elder warrior yanked the spear from Samish's body, and the boy screamed again, a long gurgling sound that hung in the still night air. He fell to his knees and toppled over into the wet grass. Mac rose with the sound of Sam's scream. He tossed the covers aside and jumped out of the bed. Bare-chested, he wore the traditional loincloth covering the Tuscara warriors favored. Serena untangled herself from the blanket, asking what was going on. A cool, damp breeze filled the hut. In the dim firelight, he saw Samish standing in the doorway. The young man screamed again, this one long and chilling, and Mac saw the wooden spear disappear from his field of view. Adrenaline flooded his system, and Mac charged across the room. Samish fell, and Mac reacted without thinking. He dove over the boy's body before it hit the ground outside the hut. Mac, landing on his right shoulder, rolled and jumped to his feet. He whirled to face Sam's attacker surprised as he recognized Phelan. Son of a... Phelan's eyes widened in fear. Panicked, he threw the spear at Mac. The weapon flew high and wide, clattering away in the darkness. Mac took two steps forward when he heard his name. Mac! He turned slowly, face flushed with rage. Duran stood a few yards away, a tomahawk in his hand, watching. Let him go, Duran said. This is between you and me. No! Mac responded, spitting the words into the night. He heard retreating footsteps and turned to see Phelan disappear into the night, the old man running hard. Coward! Mac bellowed, the words chasing the fleeing Phelan. Mac moved to the wounded Samish. The boy lay near the door to the hut, blood seeping from the long gash in his side. Mac grabbed the boy's hand and placed it over the wound. Hold here, tightly. He turned his head toward the door. Serena! I challenge you! Daron called, still standing in the center of the village. He raised the tomahawk over his head, eyes centered on Mac's back. For Phelan's honor and that of my family, I challenge you. Samish is your family, your brother, Mac retorted over his shoulder. I'm trying to save him. Where's your honor? Serena appeared at Mac's side, her eyes wide with terror as she saw Samish lying in a pool of blood. Mac grabbed her hand, placing it on the wound. Hold here. Stop the bleeding or he will die. Do you understand? Face me, invader, Duran's voice boomed in the darkness. Mac turned his head and saw a crowd gathered around Duran, keeping him away from Mac and the wounded Samish. Serena's hands trembled beneath Mac's, and he took a breath to calm himself, knowing his fear would transfer to her. Listen, he said, turning to face her and keeping his voice level. Apply pressure to stop the bleeding. My med kit is in the hut. I'll be right back. He stood and re-entered the hut, leaving the scene behind. Deron shouted, Coward! Mac heard the same word and tone he used when Phelan ran. Mac ignored the taunt, rummaging through the hut, tossing items everywhere until he found the small med kit. Nodding to himself, he rushed back outside and knelt beside Serena. Opening the med kit, he pulled a small pair of scissors, suture material, and a needle. It took him three times to thread the needle in the darkness. He gently moved Serena's hands and moved the needle to the open wound. What? Serena asked with a gasp. Suturing the wound, Mac explained, closing the wound to stop the bleeding. The shouts behind him had stopped, and he turned to see everyone, including Duran, staring, mesmerized by his actions. I don't know if the blade hit anything vital inside, but I do know that if I don't close this off, he will bleed out and die. Face me, Duran called with less enthusiasm. Give me a minute. Mac replied, wiping a sheen of sweat from his brow. 
Although trained in basic first aid, he usually had a qualified medic nearby to take over. He looked at Serena, her bright eyes wide in the darkness, as she watched Mac work. He completed the stitch, tied it off, and told her, Watch him. I don't think the spear hit anything vital, but the gash is deep and probably broke a rib. If the area begins to swell, then he's bleeding inside. We have to do something more invasive. Invasive? she repeated, tasting the word. Yeah. He sighed, standing. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Stay with him. I'll be right back. He bent over and retrieved Sam's discarded spear, turned, and faced Iran. The Tuscara villagers separated, creating a clear path between the two men. Duran spun the tomahawk in his hands as Mac gripped the spear in both hands, holding it like a staff. You did this, Duran, Mac spat. Leading a raid on your own village, wounding your own brother. You are no chief. I am chief of the Kaya, Duran replied as the two men began to circle each other within the confines of the assembled villagers. The soft, muddy ground made each movement slippery, and Mac took care with every step. This is no longer my village. Duran continued. Duran moved forward, slashing downward with the tomahawk. Mac stepped sideways, slapping the kaya in the back with the wooden shaft of the spear. Duran stumbled forward, recovered, and slashed blindly behind him. The tomahawk missed its mark. The two circled again. Galloping hooves filled the air, and the entire village looked to the north. The horses! someone cried, and several warriors left the village courtyard, slipping and sliding on the muddy ground. They disappeared into the night, leaving Duran, Mac, Borda, and a handful of women alone in the center of the village. Duran attacked again, keeping Mac off balance. Mac leapt backwards, avoiding a left-to-right slash, parried with the shaft of the spear, and swung the blunt end of the pole toward Duran's head. The Kaya ducked the attack, but Mac let his momentum carry him into a spin. He completed the turn, lashed out low, and took Duran's legs out from under him. Duran hit hard and immediately rolled away as Mac thrust the sharpened flint blade into the mud. Both recovered and circled again. A scream split the night, and Mac turned to see Phelan standing over Samish, Serena, in his arms. The woman struggled, stomping, biting, and flailing her arms at the elder warrior. No, let me go, she screamed. Phelan picked her up off the ground and tossed her over his shoulder with a grunt. She continued to thrash, bite, and flail. Mac moved in their direction, but Duran stepped in his path, the tomahawk spinning in a dizzying figure eight. Mac stopped his advance and took a step backward. He looked past Duran to see Phelan and Serena disappear into the darkness. Her cries and the sound of her struggling diminished as Phelan carried her away. Mac attacked Duran, thrusting the spear at the Kaya's midsection. Duran easily parried the move with the tomahawk, knocking the blade away. He countered with a backhand slash that scraped Mac's abdomen, slicing his skin. The Space Corps officer staggered backward, out of range. Duran pressed the attack, feigning with a tomahawk and getting inside the spear's range. Mac felt the hard, wooden handle hit his wounded stomach. Pain coursed through his body. Duran continued, punching Mac in the face with his left fist. Mac staggered back, but Duran stayed with him, punching with the tomahawk's handle and his fist. Every move Mac made to counter the attack, Duran deflected and hit him again. Finally, Mac dropped the spear. He grabbed the sides of Duran's head even as the man pummeled his midsection. Mac screamed and headbutted the Kaya. The attack stopped as Duran took a step backward. Mac executed a leaping front kick, connecting his bare foot with Duran's chest. The impact drove Duran backward. Mac slipped in the mud and fell hard to the ground. Mac scrambled to stand, slipping on the soft, muddy ground. Duran smiled to the blood running from his nose and stepped forward, ready to deliver the killing blow. Mac made it to his hands and knees. Borda stepped in, swinging his own long-handled tomahawk. Duran blocked the attack, and the two men, father and son, locked their weapons together, standing nose to nose in the mostly empty village. Mac made it to his feet, panting heavily from the fight. Footfalls filled the air as the Tuscara warriors returned from the horse pens. Duran looked over his shoulder toward the noise, laughed, and untangled himself from his father's attack. I will see you again, father, he spat, on the battlefield. He ran to the west, disappearing into the darkness in an instant. Samish, Max said, and crossed the compound to where the boy lay. Kneeling, he examined the young man. There was no swelling around the wound, and Mac took that as a good sign. Samish's breaths were shallow but steady. 
his pulse strong. Mac felt a presence over his shoulder and looked up to see Borda, blood running down a shallow wound on his left shoulder. Mac stood and faced the chief. We need to get Samish inside. Keep him warm. Have someone stay with him. Borda nodded and issued orders. Four warriors lifted the young man and gently carried him inside the hut. Two women followed, buckets of water in hand. Are you all right? Mac asked, his eyes focused on Borda's wound. The chief waved him away. Fine, he raised his voice. Prepare the horses. We will chase them down and kill them. Chief, a warrior replied. The horses are gone, all of them. Three of our warriors are injured. The man looked around. We need the healer. Borda stiffened at the mention of his missing daughter. They took her as well. He turned to Mac. You are a healer? Mac shook his head. Basic first aid, he replied, knowing that Borda would not understand. I'll do what I can. Mac attended to each warrior in turn over the next few hours, while his right eye, Duran's favorite target during the fight, slowly swelled shut. Chief Borda arrived, the last of the wounded to be treated. The sun peeked over the distant horizon, fingers of light flowing through a cloudy sky. Mac used the last of his suture material, sewing the big chief's shoulder. Without anesthetic, Borda sucked in a breath through clenched teeth with each stitch. That's it, Mac said. He tossed aside the empty medical kit. How is Samish? Borda inquired, rotating the newly stitched shoulder. Don't, Mac cautioned. Rest the shoulder for a day or two. Let the sutures set. He looked to the young boy sleeping nearby, two women keeping vigil over him. There is no swelling. That's a good sign, Mac reported, but I'm still concerned about infection. I need antibiotics. Borda's face contorted in confusion. I need medicine. I may have some in my ship, if it survived, Mac mused. He moved to the bed he had shared with Serena only hours before and began filling a small pack with supplies. What are you doing? Borda asked. I'm going back to my ship, Mac replied. There's another medical kit there, if it survived the crash. He pointed to Samish. I may need more medicine for him. Without Serena, I don't know if he'll survive. Then we will get Serena, Borda snarled. Not yet, Mac said, his voice nearly breaking. They are expecting an attack, and several of your warriors are wounded. He shook his head as he tossed a piece of smoked meat into the pack. They will not hurt her. We have time. We will attack, Borda repeated. Without a healer, your men will die, Mac whirled to face the chief. Give me a couple of days to get supplies and return. Then, then, we will get her back. Borda stood quietly for a moment. Two days. Mac nodded and took a final look at Samish. The boy's face was pale, drained. The sight of the boy lit a fire in Mac, and he left the hut. The sun sat low on the eastern horizon. Mac secured the pack on his back and took one last look at the Tuscara village. Everyone stared. Gregory Mac McMillan took off at a run, heading toward the rising sun and his crashed ship. Chapter 10 Sub-Lieutenant Stith? The Belega executive officer rose from his bed, drowsily rubbing his eyes. Lights, he called, squinting against the sudden harsh glare. He turned his face back toward the bed he lay on. Dim, he groaned, and the illumination dropped by 75%. Sub-Lieutenant Stith? The comm chimed again. He snarled at the interruption of his slumber, slid off the bare metal plank attached to the wall of his quarters, and crossed the bare metal floor to the computer. Staggering a bit from the sudden awakening, he stumbled across the sparsely decorated room. He shivered and paused to adjust the room temperature from 80 to 90 degrees. He sidestepped the sink in the corner, made his way to his desk, and stabbed a rapidly flashing amber button. The view screen over his small desk sprang to life, adding more light in the dim room. What? The image of a thin, thinner than most, Belega appeared on the screen. The young woman appeared nervous, and Stith thought she should be, waking him in the middle of his sleep shift. The last yeoman who did that without a good reason found himself stationed to an ice planet. The last Stith heard, the Belega died from exposure. That thought brought a grim smile to his face. He looked past the yeoman and saw the main bridge of the Extrinsi, the skeleton shift of the night crew at their posts. A large view screen occupied the front of the rectangular room. 
Control stations, situated amphitheater style, lay four deep. Windows adorned the sides of the bridge, offering a spectacular view of space and the planet below. Sir, the Kaya are attacking the Tuscara. Stith stood silently for a moment while his brain caught up with her words. His eyes widened considerably. What? Our drones have detected a small group of Kaya entering the Tuscara village, she verified. There are storms in the area that obscured our view for the last several hours. Her solid, light blue eyes glanced toward the electronic pad in her hand. They appear to be breaking into two groups. Her voice trailed off. Sir, they are going after the horses. Stith turned and found his uniform jacket on the seat back of his chair. He donned the dark blue coat as he issued orders. Spread out the drones and cut in the live feed. Start with the first clear shots from the drones. He finished buttoning his jacket and stole a glance in a mirror by the door. His pale skin glowed in the light cast by the screen. Good enough for this time of night, he thought. Shall I wake Commander Devry? Stith turned his harsh gaze on the yeoman, and she shrank back, taking a step away from the screen. No, he replied. I will be there momentarily and assess the situation. Do not wake the commander until my arrival. Yes, sir. The young officer nodded, and the screen died. Stith stood for a moment, weighing the meaning of the attack, only days after the split. None of the previous tribes attacked early. What is so special about these Kaya? Why now? He smiled. It will make for a spectacular final harvest. He turned on his heel and left his room, making his way through the maze of corridors aboard the Extrinsi. He made good time due to the sparsely populated passages during the night shift. The few personnel he encountered braced themselves against the bulkheads out of his way and offered greetings as he passed. Stith simply nodded, maintaining his quick pace as he made his way to the bridge. He entered a lift and rode in silence, again wondering why, after all of these years, that the humans below attacked ahead of schedule. There were no answers. As the lift stopped, the doors opened, and he stepped out onto the bridge of the Belega ship. The scene remained the same as he had seen on the comm screen albeit from a different vantage point. The forward screen and port side bridge windows offered a view of space and the planet on the left. The single moon orbited to the right, visible through the starboard windows above the bulkhead control stations. Ah, Stith, good. Sub-Lieutenant Stith turned at the sound of his name to see Commander Devery standing with the yeoman, reviewing the female's reports. Stith stared daggers at the young officer, clenched and unclenched his fists, she kept her head down, refusing to make eye contact. Yeoman Mirlin relayed your orders when I arrived, Devry continued. He appeared bright, alert, and awake. His crisp uniform clung to his body as if the two were tailored together. Medals adorned the dark blue uniform. His smile offered nothing but contempt for his subordinate as he inspected Stith with a quick glance. Exactly what I would have done. Excellent. He took a pad from Mirlin and crossed to where Stith stood. The first reports from the surface show a midnight raid, apparently for horses. Our superiors are overjoyed. They are broadcasting this throughout a dozen systems. Devry leaned in close. You could have taken a few minutes to prepare yourself. The fleet admiral is watching. He nodded toward a camera in the corner of the bridge. And you look like you slept in your clothes. Devry moved to stand in front of a large hologram of the Tuscara village before Stith could reply. Join me, sub-lieutenant, he called over his shoulder. Stith, angry, exhaled slowly before crossing the bridge. A dozen small holograms lined the upper and left border, six on each side. The main view occupied the middle 80%. The picture from the surface showed Chief Duran and several other Kaya near the center of the village. A large force moved north, entered the animal pen, and began stealing the horses. Turn up the sound, Stith ordered. Braying and the stomping of hooves filled the air. The circular Tuscara village glowed an eerie light blue, enhanced by the night vision cameras of the drones. Devry stepped forward, taking the role of director for the skirmish. He touched a hollow of the horse pen, and it replaced the main view. He studied it for a moment before moving his attention to the pictures on the perimeter of the hologram. A tall man with a spear stood outside a hut, and Devry touched that hollow. He began talking to himself, narrating his actions as he performed them. Close up on that one, Devry ordered, touching the hologram human. The drone zoomed in. Identify, 
Stith ordered. The computer tagged the man as Phelan. A shadow of a man appeared in the door. The computer automatically identified him as Samish, Borda's adopted son. Stith watched as Phelan stabbed a young boy as he exited the hut. Samish screamed, the sound echoing throughout the bridge of the extrinsy. Several Belega winced at the sound. The speakers reverberated with his scream as Phelan yanked the spear from his side. The boy fell. Another man exited the hut, diving over the body and rolling on the ground. He jumped up, facing Phelan. Facial hair covered the man, a rarity among the Tuscara. His pale skin glowed in the enhanced images from the drone, making him hard to miss. The computer tagged this one as unknown. What's this? Devry mused. A new player? Where did he come from? Stith stared at the figure and knew instantly it was the man he saw days earlier moving back to the Tuscara village. The drone zeroed in on the man's face, and Stith saw intelligence and anger. This is a different type of warrior, he thought. The unknown human faced Phelan. Son of a... The man said in English. The words hissed in hatred. Not Tuscaran, Stith thought. Phelan dropped the spear, turned, and ran. Mac, Duran yelled. The unknown human turned and faced the Kaya chief. Let him go, Duran said. This is between you and me. The computer changed the unknown tag to Mac. The human screamed, Coward! into the night after the fleeing Phelan and moved to assist Samish. He called for Serena, and Stith saw Devry involuntarily stiffened at the sight of the woman. Devry split the main screen. The right side showed Duran, yelling challenges, and taunting Mac. The left side showed Mac working with Serena, telling her to hold the wound. Stith watched his actions carefully, especially when he disappeared into the hut, returning a moment later with a medical kit. He is not Tascara, Devry said quietly, as Mac applied first aid to the wounded boy. The entire village quieted as Mac sutured the wound. Face me, Duran demanded. Give me a minute, Mac replied, the sarcasm flowing through the speaker. He completed stitching the wound and turned to Serena. Watch him. If the area begins to swell, then he's bleeding inside. We have to do something more invasive. Invasive? She asked. Yeah. He stood. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Stay with him. I'll be right back. He bent over and retrieved Sam's discarded spear, turned, and faced Duran. Devry widened the shot as the two men began to fight. The entire bridge crew turned to watch the two men battle. Spear and tomahawk flashed. Wood struck wood. Sharpened flint pierced flesh. Devry adjusted the angle of the drones to ensure the best shots. Thundering hooves filled the air, and Devry touched a different hologram on the perimeter. The image of Kaya and Tuscara fighting leapt into focus. The computer tagged Chief Porta, Bulltree from the Kaya, and a dozen others on both sides of the battle. Stith touched a control, turning the Tuscara tags to a dark blue, the Kaya a glowing gold. The Kaya pushed the Tuscara back and rode away on the horses. A scream echoed through the night, and Devry returned the main view to Mac and Duran. Stith studied the battle for a moment before he saw the cause of the noise. Drone 6. The main image changed again, revealing Phelan carrying a thrashing Serena over his shoulder. The two disappeared into the darkness as Duran kept Mac at bay. The drone followed Phelan for several hundred yards before Devry changed the view back to the main conflict, Duran and Mac. Stith watched as Duran pressed his attack, backing Mac across the village center. Mac dropped the spear, grabbed the sides of Duran's head, and headbutted the Kaya. A leaping front kick sent Duran reeling even as Mac slipped in the mud and fell to the ground. Borda stepped in, and Devry zoomed in on the big chief. Blood ran down his left side, and the drone fixated on that for a moment before pulling back. I will see you again, father, Duran spat, on the battlefield. He turned and disappeared into the darkness. Mac returned to Samish. Devry ordered the drone to follow. A crowd gathered as Mac and Borda discussed the state of the village and the aftermath of the battle. Stith watched as the mere mention of Phelan taking Serena enraged Mac. Interesting. He cocked his head to the right in surprise as Mac began tending the wounded instead of pursuing the fleeing Kaya. Devry soon grew bored. The battle is over, it appears, he turned to Stith. 
I have other um, pressing matters to attend. Will you follow up on this new player? Of course, Stith nodded. Devry left the bridge without another word. I may have some in my ship, if it survived. Ship? Stith repeated, curiosity getting the better of him, and turned back to the hologram. He rewound the conversation, watched, and then fast-forwarded to present. Mac's left eye swelled shut, and he sported multiple lacerations across his body. Undaunted, he strapped a small pack on his back, took one last look around the Tuscara village, and left the village heading east toward the morning sun. Program a drone to follow this human wherever he goes, Stith ordered. I want to know where he is going, and more importantly, where he is from. Chapter 11 Max settled into a slow jog, the small pack bouncing on his back with each step. The early morning sun rose slowly before him, and it seemed to get hotter with each step. His weeks without a physical training regimen took its toll, and he huffed and puffed, gasping for air as he ran. The thought of Samish lying, dying, in the hut spurred him on. A line of clouds, remnants of the storm from the night, moved in, obscuring the sun. He felt better about his run without the sun beating down on him, and kept going. Stray beams of sunlight glinted off the lake to his left as he ran. He paused near the edge of the forest where he met Samish. Thoughts of meeting the boy filled his thoughts, fueling his drive to get to the crash site. He drank from one of the water bladders he carried, draining it before hanging it from a tree at the edge of the forest. He knew it would be there on his return trip, and it was less weight to carry now. His rest over, he entered the forest. The overgrown brush slowed his progress. He tried to follow a trail through the saplings and adult trees, but the cloud cover, as well as the thick canopy above him, made the forest dim and the trail difficult to follow. He slowed down more, nervous energy building, as he followed the winding trail. He stumbled over vines and tangled roots, but trudged on. A family of small furry rodents scurried out of his way. The animals scattered in every direction, squealing in terror. He ignored them. He withdrew a short-handled axe from his pack and hacked his way through a stand of brush and saplings. His arms burned with the effort, his breath short and shallow. Sweat poured from his body. He took another break. The sun receded behind him as he finally broke through the overgrowth. He leaned over, hands on his knees, and sucked in oxygen. He stood upright and took a drink from his second water bladder. His eyes roamed the countryside, and his spirits sank. Nothing looked familiar. Thoughts of Samish dying rejuvenated his anxiousness, but he really had no idea which direction to go. A flash of reflected sun to his left drew his attention, and he began walking in that direction. His legs ached from the run, his arms exhausted from the hours of hacking through the brush. The sun cast long shadows by the time he crested a small rise and let out a sigh of relief. In the distance, he estimated no more than three miles, lay the crash site. The loose gravel of the hill drew his attention. Faded scorch marks covered the disturbed ground and rocks. He looked at the distant crash and realized that the ship sheared off the top of the hill. He slipped and slid down the other side of the ridgeline into a grassy, flat prairie. He followed the pockmarked traces of the crash through the thigh-high grass, crossed a babbling stream that cut through the grassland, and arrived at his ship as the sun dipped beneath the horizon. He lit a fire from the flint he pulled from the pack and began inspecting his surroundings. The momentum of the crash propelled the ship deep within a heavy forest. Broken trees and burnt brush surrounded the crash. He looked skyward and saw a thick canopy of leaves. He nodded. The ship is deep enough in the forest so that it can't be seen from above. Good, he said aloud. He wrapped a stick with animal hide from his pack and stuck it in the fire. Flames ate hungrily at the tough skin. With his flaming torch leading the way, he crawled inside his downed craft. Wires, melted glass, and pieces of fuselage lay everywhere. Carbon scoring and scorch marks covered the instrument panel. The control stick was nowhere to be seen. The leather of the sole seat lay curled and discolored from the heat of reentry. The dislodged control panels provided little in the way of a handhold. Setting himself carefully on the edge of the fuselage, he lowered himself face first into the ship. His hand slipped off the panel he held, and Mac tumbled inside, landing right shoulder first in the pilot's chair, the torch bouncing on the floor. 
damn it. He retrieved the light, careful not to set anything else on fire, and searched the remains of the charger. He found his pilot's logbook, burnt and disfigured, but the sense of loss he tossed it aside. Max slipped his hand underneath the seat, straining with the search of his probing arm. Something skittered away, and he jumped, pulling his hand back. He waved the flame around the cockpit, frantically searching for the source of the tiny footfalls. He saw a small prairie rat disappear into a crack, gulped, and calmed his racing heart. He exhaled slowly and climbed out of the ship. He slid off the damaged fuselage, landing lightly on his feet. Knowing his search would be easier with real light, Mac prepped a campsite. He returned the torch to the blazing fire, the flickering flames creating eerie shadows on the destroyed craft. He made a quick meal of smoked meat and a hunk of bread. He leaned his back against the fuselage and stared into the darkness. Thoughts of Samish filled his mind, sad that he could not do more for the boy. Serena came next, his heart racing as her face filled his mind's eye. Her smile filled him with hope and joy. Her screams of terror as Phelan carried her away chilled him to the bone. He shivered and tried to think of something else. A thousand things slid through his mind, but the only constant images were of Samish and Serena. He refocused on the woman, on her smile, and took those thoughts into his dreams. Mac opened his eyes slowly. Bright beams of sunlight peered through breaks in the canopy above. Birds chirped somewhere above him. A thin wisp of smoke drifted from the nearly dead campfire a few feet away. He sat up, his joints popping with the movement, sore muscles protesting as he stretched. He stirred the fire, the newly revived flames warming him in the early morning. He drank from his final water bladder and ate another small meal. The food and drink energized him although he dreaded the mile's run back to the Tuscara. He packed everything and doused the campfire before crawling back into the charger. With the bright morning light and several strategically located sunbeams from above, his second search of the cockpit was more successful. He found a slightly scorched pack of emergency rations, a laser pointer, a flare gun with two flares, a survival kit that included a folding knife, fishing supplies, a pack of waterproof matches, and the medical kit. Mac opened the kit and inspected the contents. Gauze, bandages, tape, scissors, a pack of syringes, and a small vial of antibiotics. He thanked a deity he had long forgotten, closed the kit, and scrambled out of the cockpit. He stashed everything in his pack and slid the now heavier sack on his back. He hopped twice and felt the pack's hard impact on his back. He sighed. Gonna be a long run back. He took one last look around ensured the fire lay dormant, and heard Smokey Bear say in his mind, Only you can prevent forest fires. The thought of the cartoon bear put a smile on his face, and with that happy thought in his mind, he left the wreck of the charger. He alternated between a fast walk and a slow run, moving with the sun at his back. The cloudless sky promised a hot trek, but he felt better with the medical supplies in hand. He hoped it would be enough. He re-entered the forest, following the trail he had cut the previous day. Without having to hack his way through, he made it through the woods much faster and without the arm-tingling fatigue. He retrieved his abandoned water bladder and headed for the lake. He dropped his pack, refilled the makeshift canteen, and drank heavily. He squinted against the harsh glare of the sun off the lake, holding his arm up to ward off the light. The bright sun and the desolate conditions brought thoughts of seer training, and his deployment to Afghanistan a few years earlier. He recalled the second time he ejected from an aircraft, his F-18 Super Hornet blown out from under him on a mission south of Kandahar, Afghanistan. The hot desert air stifled his breath, the fine particulate dust filling his nostrils with a horrible stench. He landed hard, his parachute dragging him across the rocky terrain. He spent four days running from the Taliban, waiting for a Caesar combat search and rescue helicopter to arrive. It took a platoon of Marines and three Cobra gunships to repel the attacking Taliban, and Mac returned home with a medal for bravery, a Purple Heart for shrapnel in his leg, and a transfer to the newly formed Space Corps, his astronaut application approved by the SecDef. He remembered the Caesar drone that tracked him and led him away from the opposition forces. He found the young pilot later and bought her dinner.
That buzzing drone reassured him that there were people looking out for him somewhere over the horizon. He could almost hear the drone as he stared out at the lake, glistening in the morning sun. A shadow passed over him. He turned, staring up into the bright sky. A small drone hovered high overhead, watching the overseers. Mac retrieved his pack and ran, not toward the village, but back toward the forest. The drone followed, slowly orbiting his movement. He ran into the trees, ducked behind a large evergreen, and turned to peer back at the alien craft. It hovered beyond the trees, patiently waiting. He drank from his canteen and moved laterally along the edge of the tree line, the drone mimicking his movement. He retraced his steps, the small hovering device matching him. Motion sensors? He wondered aloud. Thermal imaging? He stared out at the drone, watching as it hovered, its small round eye staring directly at him. Mac dropped his pack, rummaging through the contents for something that he could use as a weapon. He remembered Samish and the spear, but did not think he was proficient enough for that kind of throw. Besides, he did not have a spear. His fingers found a small cylindrical pin, and he pulled it from the pack, the laser pointer. At the very least, maybe he could blind it and get away. Bracing himself against a tree, he aimed the device at the hovering drone a dozen yards away. His finger touched the button, and he wondered if the batteries were still good. A bright red beam struck the drone to the left of its camera eye. Mac adjusted his aim, the laser dot sliding across the drone's surface until it sat squarely in the center of the sensor. The drone waggled its wings and dropped in altitude. Mac stayed with it, reacquiring his target and flashing the laser beam into the camera sensor again. The drone dropped a second time before racing skyward. The overseer device crashed into tree limbs above, entangled in branches and leaves. Mac heard its engines whine as he stood from his crouch by the tree. Smoke poured from the device as it bounced through the trees. The engine whine died, and Mac watched the drone fall, ricochet off of branches, spin, and flip all the way to the ground. It landed with a satisfactory thud. Smoke and sparks flashed from the device as Mac approached. He grabbed a branch that fell with the drone, carefully prodding the spybot. The camera eye rotated slowly, zeroing in on him. Mac raised the stick and smashed the sensor. With a yell, he raised the stick over his head and hit it again. Exhaustion and frustration flowed through him. The tree branch became an extension of his stress. He beat the drone until it lay in a thousand pieces. Mac staggered back, exhausted, and leaned against a tree. He slid down the bark, sitting heavily on the ground, and sucked in deep breaths, trying to calm his racing heart. In the distance, he heard the whine of engines, and he knew that company would soon arrive. Chapter 12 The hologram of the sleeping human floated over Stith's metal bed. The human rolled over, the magnified image offering Stith a clear view of the man's face. Stith squinted, eyes furrowed as he studied the hologram's features. The human lay near a fire, gently snoring. Stith glanced to his right, toward his computer on the far side of his cramped room. Zero to thirty hours ship time. He groaned, knowing that he needed to sleep, but the human, the human mystified him. The extrinsy, sitting in geosynchronous orbit over the farmland, adapted to the time on the planet. It made life on the ship easier, since they were there to track the natives below. But when the natives, or in this case a non-native, spent restless nights, then so did Sub-Lieutenant Stith. A ripple coursed through his body from his toes to his neck, the belega version of a yawn. He rubbed his eyes, a habit he picked up from watching the humans for the last few seasons, and stretched. Programming the computer to wake him when the human woke, Stith closed his eyes and drifted to sleep. The Belega did not dream, not like humans. The alien subconscious did not fantasize of far-off worlds, or being a private eye, or a spy, or getting the girl, or the hero of their story. The mind of a Belega turned inward, dwelling on their own history, keeping even the vaguest and distant memory fresh in the alien's mind. It gave the Belega race a reputation for long memories and grudges. A beep drew Stith from a reverie of his first battle. His eyes snapped open, his fists clenched. 
For a moment, he felt the knife in his hand, the open lich mint of its yellow blood dripping from his fingers. He sat up, a ripple coursed through his body. He rubbed his eyes and focused on the hologram hovering above him. He watched the human, Mac, stoke the fire, then move toward the crashed ship. He bent over the fuselage of the downed craft, half in and half out. The man slid fully inside the scorched craft, disappearing from view. Stith felt another yawn wave ripple through his body and ordered the view to zoom out. The drone hovered over the sheared-off hilltop, the telephoto camera capturing the human's activities. In the light of day, the crisp details of the high-definition lens offered details not noticed in the darkness. The hologram pulled back, offering the Belega a view of the craft nestled into the burnt forest. The craft, once aerodynamic and sleek, now lay in a crumpled and scorched mass, dozens of meters inside a forest at the edge of the lake. Tree limbs snapped into pieces during the crash, and other debris littered the landscape. The human emerged from the ship, and Stith ordered the view to zoom once again. The human examined several items pulled from the ship before packing them all in a small bag. Donning the backpack, he hopped up and down several times. Stith nodded, recognizing that some things were universal, such as checking the weight and balance of a pack before a long trek. Pull back, out of human sound range, Stith said, his voice dry and raspy. The Belega poured himself a glass of water from the sink. Stith drank, watching the hologram as he drained the glass. The human began a slow trot across the grassland. The cool liquid soothed his throat, and he poured another. He watched the hologram for a moment, noted that the human now walked, and decided that he had enough time to prepare for his day. The sonic shower vibrated the dirt and body oils away. He tried to recall the last time he took an actual liquid shower and stopped when the days entered the triple digits. He donned a fresh uniform and checked on the hollow before filling his mouth with refresh gel. He stood impatiently, watching the human cross the long, flat prairie. Stith finally spat the gel into his small sink and returned to the metal bed attached to the wall. The human reached the edge of a forest, and Stith queried the computer. How long before he exits the other side? At his current rate of speed, approximately 22 minutes. Recall the drone for recharge and dispatch another to replace it, Stith ordered, checking the time on his desk. Transfer drone feed to the bridge, my station. He turned to leave and stopped. He nodded as another action occurred to him. Dispatch a squad to examine the ship. A dark, menacing tone filled his voice. I want to know everything about it and that human. Stith left his quarters before the computer could acknowledge, lost in thought. The sub-lieutenant navigated the extrinsies' maze of corridors without thinking, the act second nature after so many months aboard ship. That is how he found himself in the dining facility. The smell of breakfast broke him from his reverie, and using his rank, moved to the front of the line. A single glance silenced the grumbles and protests of the lower enlisted forced to wait. He grabbed a few items to eat on the go and left the dining area. He arrived on the bridge to find Commander Devry absent, only half the station's manned, and the drone's hologram filling the area above his station. His station beeped for attention, but he ignored it, opting to stare at the floating mass of trees and bushes for a moment. What am I looking at? he wondered aloud, confused. He put down his food and drink and leaned closer to the hologram. His eyes narrowed in concentration. Then he saw it. Hidden amongst the leaf-filled tree branches and green bushes, he saw the human's eyes staring directly at him. What happened? Stith directed the question at the computer. My orders were to maintain a discreet distance. That was the directive for the original drone. The new drone was not programmed with those specifications. Why not? You did not state the same mission parameters. Stith shook his head slowly, rage bubbling through his body. His breathing ragged, he clenched and unclenched his fists. Images of his bare hands destroying the computer core flitted through his mind. The console beeped for attention again, and Stith reached and slapped the console. What? Sub-Lieutenant. A small three-dimensional Belega appeared before him, standing on the edge of the control console. The Belega wore a heavy coat and a helmet with the visor raised. 
Stith saw the barrel of a rifle over the soldier's left shoulder. The search team has reached the human craft. Exterior markings identify it as the USSC Charger. We're running that through the computer now. The results should be at your station momentarily. The computer was destroyed in the crash, and all of the compartments inside the ship have been ransacked. There is nothing of value that we can identify. He held up a small blue cylinder about two inches long. Except for this. The Belega soldier rolled it over in his fingers. The sunlight streamed through the trees and reflected off the device. It was lying on the floor of the ship, underneath the seat. I, I don't know what it is, but it appears to be some type of electronic device. Stith's heart raced, his rage at the computer forgotten. He glanced over at the hologram of the human, watching as the man moved back and forth among the trees, the drone matching his movement. The man stopped and began rummaging through his pack. What are you doing? Stith mused. Sir? The hologram Belega asked. Stand by, Stith mumbled, his eyes on the human. The man produced a small cylinder, smaller than the device found aboard the ship, and pointed it at the drone. Stith winced as a red laser flashed, blinding the hollow projector. The image dissolved, flickered, and returned. The new image featured a different angle, lower, almost chest level with the man. The human adjusted his aim and hit the drone with his beam again. The image flickered but did not dissolve. The drone raced skyward. A steady thrum filled the bridge and Stith recognized the sound of propellers smacking wood. Another flash of light, and the image dissolved, but the sound remained. The whine of engines drowned out the rest of the noise, and several of the Belega at drone control removed their headsets and clapped their hands over their ears. With a loud pop, the engine noise subsided. Stith watched the drone feed as the image fell from the sky, spinning end over end as it hit tree limbs. He closed his eyes against the dizzying spectacle until he heard the final crash to the ground. He opened his eyes. Sparks exploded from the hologram's perspective, and smoke partially obscured the view. Stith's eyes widened as the human approached the drone, and he got his first good look up close of the man. He stood as tall as a Tuscara, but with paler skin. Dark hair covered his face. Blue eyes stared at the camera. The man carried a large stick in one hand. Stith recognized rage and frustration when the man raised the stick, yelled, and brought the weapon to bear on the drone. Stith stepped back involuntarily as the feed died. He stared at the empty air where the hologram had been. The last image of the man burned into his brain. What was that? Stith whirled to the hologram of the ground force leader still standing beside the crashed ship. Dispatch your troops to these coordinates. Stith read the location off his console. You will find a human there. Capture him. Sir. And I want him alive. Samish lay on a pile of animal hide blankets, his pale face covered in sweat. His breath came in slow, ragged rasps, his skin cold and clammy. Chief Borda sat cross-legged beside his bed, slowly dabbing a wet cloth across the boy's face. Bright light stabbed the dark adobe hut's interior through the open doorway, almost perfectly spotlighting Borda. The big chief dipped the cloth into a bucket of cool water, wrung it out, and continued to wipe the boy's forehead. The two sat alone inside the mud and thatch hut. The two endured a sleepless and fitful night as Samish tossed and turned, moaning in pain. Borda sat awake all night, a vigil over his last remaining family member. At first light, he pulled a blanket off Samish. His eyes locked onto the bright purple bruise on the boy's side. The swelling wound made Borda blanch. He averted his eyes and replaced the blanket. Hurry, Mac, he muttered. Hurry. The sound of morning activities in the camp dissolved his recent memory. The scent of cooking meat drifted into the adobe hut, and Borda's stomach growled. The chief ignored the rumble, vowing to stay by Samish's side until he recovered. He gripped the boy's hand as he wiped the sweat from his face. I have lost a son and a daughter, he thought. I will not lose another. Memories of the fight only hours before stayed fresh in his mind. Duran learned Borda's lessons of war well. 
splitting the Tuscara forces and taking all of the horses and the only healer in the village. Borta felt a sense of pride that his son planned the raid perfectly, and anger that Duran would do that against his family. Serena's abduction cut deeper than any blade. Thoughts of revenge surfaced again. Borda could see in his mind's eye the Tuscara racing through the Kaya village, slaughtering those that robbed them in the dark of night. He envisioned Phelan, his trusted bodyguard, skewered with a spear, the same spear used to wound Samish. He glanced to his left and saw the weapon leaning against the wall. Dried blood, Samish's blood, glistened in the morning light flowing through the open door. Yes, he would take great pleasure in killing the man who abducted his daughter, a man he once trusted with his life. Anger swelled, and Borda's body heated up with a raw emotion. He shook his head and gritted his teeth. You will not fool me again, Borda swore. Samish squeezed his hand slightly at the spoken words. Relief flooded through Borda, and he leaned in close. Hold on, my son. Mac will return soon with medicine. You will recover. The drone of distant engines filled the early morning. Borda looked out the door into the bright morning in time to see at least two shadows flash through the courtyard. The few people in his line of sight rotated their heads, watching the overseer ships zoom overhead. The engine noise faded immediately. A young warrior appeared in the doorway, hatchet in hand, his eyes wide in astonishment. His breaths came in rapid succession, and he blocked the light, silhouetted in the doorway. Chief, the overseers are heading east, Borda nodded. He knew where they were headed, and that help would not be coming for Samish, as he had promised. The big chief patted Samish's hand and stood with a tired grunt. Old bones and joints creaked with the effort. Gather three others, Borda ordered Nerlon, the Tuscara in the doorway. Warriors, fleet afoot. His eyes fell on the prone form of Samish, lying in a puddle of sweat. We have a long way to travel. Mac gritted his teeth and pounded the down drone a final time. He looked up and cocked his head, listening to two, no, three sets of engines, two from the direction of the Tuscara, one from his crash site. He slunk into the shadow of a large tree, scanning the horizon, the two from the west worried him the most. What have the aliens done to the village? He looked toward the horizon, raising his hand to block some of the light from the clear sky above. He saw no smoke on the horizon and breathed a sigh of relief. They did not bomb the Tuscara. He looked around the tree line, noting he had little in the way of options. He needed to get the meds to the Tuscara. He looked up and saw the outline of the ships heading toward him. He shook his head. I won't get them to you today, Samish, he mumbled. He hefted the stick in his hand. A large crack ran along its shaft from beating the drone. He snarled and threw it at the ground. The engine noise grew louder, and he recognized the sounds of braking thrusters, the noise reminiscent of reverse engines on an F-18 Super Hornet. He ignored the approaching craft, searching the forest floor for a weapon. He found a long slender stick and picked it up a couple of practice swings, a figure eight around his body, and he nodded. Now to leave the meds for Borda. He assumed that the chief and the rest would come looking for him. He rehung an empty water bladder on a small branch off a tree near the edge of the forest. Crouching, Mac hastily dug through his pack until he found the med kit. The engine noise died. A quick glance showed Mac the pale blue aliens exiting their ships, he gulped, his mouth dry, and he forced his mind on preparing the med kit. He removed a syringe from its package, inserted the needle into a small vial labeled antibiotics. He did not know the name of the medication and hoped that Samish was not allergic. He prepared one syringe, then a second. Another glance. The aliens arrayed themselves in a ragged skirmish line approximately 150 meters across. As he watched, the leader waved the soldiers forward. Mac exhaled a long, anxiety-filled breath. He produced a pen from the med kit and marked the syringes one and two. He wrote on the second plastic syringe, 12 hours. Another glance. The enemy approached halfway to the edge of the forest from their landing area. The aliens wore their heavy coats, short-barreled rifles in their hands. 
the former Marine noted they carried sidearms, extra energy cartridges, and sheathed knives around their waists. Flashes of running from the Taliban appeared in his mind, and he exhaled sharply, pushing them away. Max stayed low, and, since no one shouted an alarm, guessed that they had yet to spot him. He replaced the syringes into the med kit and hid the bag at the base of the tree under the empty bladder. Satisfied, he turned his attention to the thirty or so troops heading his way. Max slipped further into the forest, away from the ships and their troops. He crouched, listening to the aliens trample through the thick underbrush. He glanced behind him. No sign of the blue aliens. He heard shouts of anger, terse single words, and small phrases as the overseers tripped their way through the tanglefoot. If not for the seriousness of his situation, Mac would have laughed. Different military, the same curses for tripping to the forest. More troops moved toward him from the east, from the direction of his downed ship. They appeared to be farther away, and he put them out of mind, opting to concentrate on those between him and the Tuscara village. He grabbed a small sapling, pulling it down until it ran parallel with the ground. He carefully lodged the end under the root of a nearby tree. The trap set. He moved quietly toward another small tree a dozen meters away. Movement caught his eye, and he dropped to the ground. He crawled the last meter or so before standing up, his back to the large trunk of a tall tree. With a firm grip on the small tree and staying low, he set a second trap. The enemy closed in, trampling through the underbrush. Mac lay on the ground, back to the traps, and waited. He raised his head and peered over his shoulder. He fought to suppress a smile as a blue-skinned alien straddled the sapling. The overseer's leg hit the tree, releasing it from the tree root. The sapling caught the alien in the leg, flipping him into an awkward somersault that spun him into the air. He landed hard on his face and did not move. He was the lucky one. The branch, freed from its captivity, accelerated quickly on its way back to its normal upright position. The next two aliens in line caught the branch across the chest, the upward trajectory of the sapling hurling the two blue aliens into the air. They screamed in terror, arms flailing, their weapons flying out of their grasps. One smacked into a tree trunk four meters up. His body flattened momentarily before sliding unceremoniously to the ground. The second continued his flight unabated, landing some twenty meters back toward the edge of the forest. Mac received a first-rate lesson in the Doppler effect as the alien's fearful cry diminished the further he flew away. The overseer landed hard and rolled four or five times before coming to a stop under a thorny bush. The line broke, the overseers running toward the distraction. Mac counted to five before raising to his hands and knees. He scanned his immediate vicinity, and, seeing the coast clear, took off at a run toward the edge of the forest. He kept low, running back toward the med kit. If he could get the kit and leave the forest without being seen, a shout echoed behind him, followed by a sizzling laser bolt that exploded a nearby tree. Mac ducked as a shower of debris, flaming bark, and burning leaves rained down on him. He kept his legs pumping and patted a couple of smoldering embers. A faint scent of ozone touched his nostrils as he continued to run. He rounded the tree as a second bolt slammed into it. Itchy pinoco pa me, he heard from behind him, and the laser fire stopped. Mac leapt over a log and stole a glance over his shoulder. At least a dozen of the pale blue men pursued him, their small, wiry frames crossing the forest quickly. Without having to search through every bush, the overseers used their long legs and natural speed along the paths and trails. They gained on Mac. He sprinted on, wondering who would give out first, him or them. Mac pumped his arms and legs, following an old trail through the forest. Sticks and vines reached for him from the edges of the path, so he dared not look behind him. He heard footsteps closing in and put every ounce of power into his long gait. The footfalls grew closer, gaining. He felt them only meters behind. He saw a small tree leaning over the trail, and he knew that he had to make his move. He grabbed the tree, the rough bark biting into his skin as his momentum propelled him up and around the large sapling. He circled over the tree and brought his feet down into the chest of an overseer. The air expelled from the thin alien, the force of the blow knocking him into four others. He bowled them over, five down, more to go. Mac whirled to face the rest. 
The next alien reached for Mac, tripped over a root, and face-planted onto the trail. He shook it off and started to rise. Mac grabbed the next alien's arm, planted his feet, and used the overseer's momentum to propel him into the next soldier. The two sprawled across the trail, a tangle of arms and legs. The third alien connected a strike to Mac's solar plexus. While the punch did not hurt, the bony structure of the alien's hand pierced deep into the skin. Mac grimaced and pummeled the alien's small ears. He shrieked and stepped back, grasping his head. He collided with another overseer coming up behind him, and Mac stepped out of the way as they joined the first two soldiers on the dirt trail. Mac turned and ran toward the edge of the forest, the second wave only meters behind him. He turned down a side trail, this one more overgrown with thick brush and twisted vines. The trail narrowed. Overgrowth towered above him, creating a forest corridor. Branches snapped at him, vines stretched out to trip him. Realizing his mistake, he turned, ready to face the enemy, and caught a rifle butt to the left side of his head. Mac staggered, his legs wobbly from the sprint and the blow. He shook his head and tried to focus on the half-dozen blue aliens standing before him. The crowd parted, and an overseer stepped through the soldiers. A flowing cape accompanied his dark uniform, his only distinction from the rest. The alien sneered at Mac. Ichipinukopemi, the alien said. We need him alive, he translated for Mac. But the orders did not say unharmed. An alien with a rifle stepped forward. Mac saw the butt of the rifle heading for his face moments before the world went black. The sun sank toward the horizon, casting long shadows across the grassland. A strong breeze blew from the south, creating ripples on the nearby lake. The gentle waves created a shimmering effect, reflecting the late afternoon sun. The forest animals, normally talkative and active during this time of day, sat quiet, watching. Chief Borda squatted at the edge of the forest, his eyes searching an area of disturbed dirt and grass. He reached out, holding a tuft of dislodged ground in his hand. He tossed the divot into the air, catching it without thinking. His thoughts elsewhere. He knew that Mac was gone, captured by the Belega. Borda breathed a deep sigh, fearing that the loss of the stranger sealed the fate of his only remaining son. Dropping the divot of dirt, Borda crouch-walked along a trail of broken limbs and plants. His eyes searched the ground for signs, tracking the end of an obviously long fight. Chief! Borda stood, looked to his left, and found Nurlan standing by a tree holding a water bladder. The big chief moved quickly, taking the empty container from Nurlan with a quick grab. Borda examined the bag for a moment before looking at the ground around them. He locked eyes with the Tuscara warrior. Where? Nurlan pointed toward a small, stubby branch on the nearest tree. He stepped back quickly as Borda stepped past him and crouched by the indicated spot. It took only seconds for his eyes to find the hidden bag and remove it from a small hole near the base of the tree. Borda opened the bag, laying out the contents in a neat, orderly manner. A mask of confusion covered his face as he stared at the unknown contents. His eyes focused on the two syringes and picked one of them up. He stared at the small cylinder, rolling it over in his hands. Number two, twelve hours, he muttered, reading the handwritten scrawl. He quickly grabbed the other. Number one, this, Borda said, replacing the contents neatly into the bag and standing. This is what we came for. He looked toward the darkening sky, the sun barely touching the western horizon. The overseers took him. But he left this for us. For Samish. Nurlan, gather the others, Borda ordered. Anxiousness filled his body with a drive to return to the village, his nerves alive with fire. We are returning home. He shook his head, his eyes staring up at the sky. I hope all of this is worth it. Chapter 13 Swirls of light danced around him, reaching for the man in the chair. He raised his arm, his fingers chasing the maelstrom of light before him. A light mist spritzed his nearly naked body at regular intervals, the liquid cool on his hot skin. The room felt like a summer day, hot and muggy. The strong scent of honeysuckle hung in the air, and he breathed deeply, reminded of his childhood. 
A heavy beat, dull and deep, echoed throughout the chamber. A heartbeat? Yes, he mused. But whose? His eyes darted back and forth, partially following the light, partially scanning his surroundings. A haze covered everything, like a light fog on a cool morning. The circular room revealed no windows, no doors, no forms or structures of any kind. The hairs on his neck stood on end. Somewhere in the darkness, he knew, other eyes stared back. He craned his neck, letting his head flop back, following the blobs of light in an attempt to see the rest of the chamber. The movement created a dizzying effect, the room zooming in and out rapidly in his vision. Nausea formed in his belly, the taste of bile on his tongue. He stopped moving his head and turned his body forward, eyes fixated on a point in the distant darkness. The rapid zooming strobe effect ended, and all Max saw was the gentle, playful swirls of light in the oval chamber. He swallowed down the bile, breathing deeply. The heartbeat, faster now, began to slow, and he realized he listened to his own beating heart. Who are you? The disembodied voice echoed through the chamber, reaching deep into Max's soul. He flinched at the sound, trying to turn away, but the voice was everywhere, and nowhere. He could not see the straps that held him to the chair, preventing him from standing, from running. He struggled against the restraints, feeling the rough, nylon-like material bite into his exposed skin. Who are you? The voice repeated. I don't have time! Mac yelled, adrenaline coursing through his body. He stared at the dark walls, his eyes drawn to the constantly moving lights. I have to get back! Silence. Do you hear me? I have to get back to the village. Samish is dying. He thrashed against his restraints. I have to get back. Let me go. Let me go. His rage burned, fueled by his helplessness, and he struggled against the straps holding him. The swirls of light retreated into the darkness. Let me go. Let me go. The restraint material bit into his chest, abdomen, and thighs, rubbing his skin raw. His arms remained free. He bounced, struggling in his seat. He fought the restraints, screaming into the darkness. Sweat formed on his skin, and he wished for another spritz of cool mist. Even the scent of honeysuckle disappeared as he struggled for freedom. He slumped forward, exhausted and bleeding, still fastened to the chair, his ragged breathing drowning the rapid beat of his heart. The swirls of light reemerged from their refuge, the sudden smell of honeysuckle overwhelming in the confines of the room. He sat up and attempted to look around again. The wave of nausea returning instantly. He swallowed back the vile-tasting liquid and listened to the heartbeat, his heartbeat, echo in the black void. Who are you? Go to hell, his fatigued voice responded. The adrenaline rush vanished, his body drained by the struggle. He slumped forward again, his voice barely a whisper. Go to hell, he repeated. Increase the dosage, the disembodied voice ordered. Sir, we do not know what that will do to him. A second voice answered. This particular serum has never been used on humans successfully. That voice sounds reasonable, Mac thought. He raised his head, searching the far wall. That is someone I can talk to. He opened his mouth to speak. You have your orders. The first voice rose in pitch. A small blob of light landed on Mac's nose, pulling his attention away from the conversation. Mac blew out his breath, and the light lifted, and, like a butterfly, flittered away. Mac watched it until it blended with other pinpoints of light in the chamber. Protest again, the second voice said, drawing Mac's attention away from the lights. A dosage of that level may kill him. Then he dies, the first voice replied nonchalantly. That guy sounds like a jerk, Mac muttered, his words slurring. He vaguely recalled being drunk once, right after flight school, his body numb, like now. The memory, distorted by time and alcohol, brought a smile to his face. Semper Fi! Warmth flowed through his body, drowning the burgeoning memory. Mac's eyes opened wide, the lights in the chamber swirling in complex geometric shapes. The light spray of water flowed continuously, dousing his body and dripping from his long hair and beard. His heartbeat dropped into a slow rhythm. Who are you? The voice returned. Mac tilted his head backward, letting it rest on the back of the chair, and watched the world fall away. He stared at the ceiling high above, giggled, and watched the lights dance above him. 
he opened his mouth, sucking in the cool water and washing down the last of the bile. He relaxed, slumping into the chair. Who are you? the voice demanded. Captain Gregory McMillan, United States Space Corps, he slurred, returning his head to its normal position. My friends call me Mac. You can call me asshole, sir. He crinkled his face in thought. He shook his head, laughing at his mixed-up words. <laughs> you can call me sir, asshole. Progress, the first voice said with a hint of satisfaction. Welcome, Captain. Why are you here? Mac pondered the question for a moment, his inebriated mind desperately trying to focus. I... I was captured, he said, the smile returning to his face, by these little blue guys from outer space, you know? They had squeaky little voices just like yours. No, the voice interrupted. Why, yes, they do, Mac replied, adamant. I heard it in the forest, whiny, squeaky voice. He shook his head. Not manly at all. The forest, the voice said. What were you doing in the forest? Mac looked at the dark walls. The swirling lights retreated, creating a circle around his chair, rotating counterclockwise. The flow of water fell to a trickle, trying to find medicine. For my friend, Samish. He is hurt, you know. I, I need to get back to him. He may die without me. Soon the voice soothed. There is time. No, Mac shook his head, the euphoric effect of the drug subsiding. I need to get back there, now. Another cascade of warmth flooded his body. That is too much, the second voice screamed in fear. You'll kill him. Remove the doctor, the first voice stated. Mac watched the lights surrounding him. They moved slowly, dancing before him. The lights rotated counterclockwise, then reversed. They zoomed in and out, charging Mac and then retreating, the hypnotic effect mesmerizing to his drug-addled mind. Captain? Why? Who's there? My name is Stiff, the voice replied from the darkness. I want to help you. What can I do to help you? Samish, Mac muttered, his head rolling on the back of the chair again. Help. Help Samish. I will. I will, Stith promised. But first, I need to know more about you. Samish. Silence. Samish, Mac demanded, lifting his head. A small opening appeared to his right, spilling light into the dark, cavernous room. A silhouette with a long neck crossed the threshold, moving along the beam of light to take a spot before Mac. Mac stared at the blue alien and saw cold blue eyes staring back. He shivered involuntarily. Medals adorned his dark blue uniform. White piping ran from the shoulders, down his arms, and continued along the seam of his trousers. The alien's blue skin danced in the swirling light. Samish has been taken care of, the alien said. Despite his drunkenness, Mac recognized Stith's voice. Another alien entered and placed a chair behind Stith. The second alien retreated from the chamber. The door shut behind him. The beam of light disappeared as the door closed. Mac felt the alien's eyes on him, studying him, before Stith took the seat prepared for him. Samish will be fine, Stith said, his voice smooth and reassuring. Now, tell me about you, Captain McMillan. Chief Borda stumbled into the Tuscara village exhausted. A sliver of moon sat near its apex high above, casting little light onto the small collection of huts. Everyone in the village sat around a half-dozen campfires in the center of the village. No one slept. A perimeter sentry called out at the sight of Borda, and the Tuscara came running. Shouts and questions greeted the chief and his four warriors. Someone offered Borda a bladder of water, but he pushed it aside. He knew there would be time for drink after he tended some mish. With the entire village in tow, he marched around the huts and fires, Nerlon and the others peeled away, taking the bulk of the villagers with them. Borda smiled, grateful, and entered the hut where Samish lay. The boy looked much like he had the previous day, wrapped in blankets, sweaty and pale. Borda pulled back the animal hide covering and examined the wound. The swelling had subsided some, but the bruise, even in the dim light of two torches, was unmistakable. 
More light, Borda called over his shoulder. The interior of the hut lit up seconds later as three women, each holding a torch, entered the adobe hut. The chief directed them to stand around Samish. He paused, staring at the women and their placement. One woman stood on either side of the cot. The third stood over Samish's head. Memories of funeral pyres for fallen warriors filled his mind. The warriors, wrapped in cloth, their hands folded across their chest, lay on a pile of wood, a trio of women standing vigil. The comparison to Samish threatened to overwhelm him. Borda shook off the memories and fumbled for the medical kit. He opened the bag. In the light of the torches, he saw the syringes, a myriad of small cloths, a shiny instrument with two long, sharp prongs, and several tubes. A folded scrap of paper caught his attention, and he opened it. He read over the words, recognizing many, but the illustrations commanded his focus. There, he smiled. Instructions. He picked up the two syringes. Carefully setting aside the one marked number two, he glanced at the paper. He pulled the lid off the cylinder, revealing a long, slender needle. He read the paper again and nodded. Roll him on his side, Borda commanded. Gently. The three women exchanged glances before handing the torches to the one standing beside Borda. The other two lowered themselves to the floor and gently rolled Samish onto his side. The boy groaned softly, but otherwise remained still. Borda read the directions one last time before moving to stand behind the boy. He pursed his lips together, thinking, This had better work, pulled the boy's loincloth down to expose his buttocks, and jammed the needle into Samish. The chief picked up the paper, studied the illustration carefully, then pressed the plunger, forcing the medication into Samish. He finished, pulled up the boy's loincloth, and told the women to return him to his back. Samish groaned again, then lay quietly. Bordo wiped the sweat from his forehead and stared at the women. Terror filled their eyes as they stared at the boy and Borda. He looked at the image drawn on the paper and nodded. He would not have believed it either if he had not done it. The chief picked up a bladder of water and drained it. Tossing it aside, he offered a smile to the three women. Stand vigil over him, he instructed. In a few hours, we will have to do it again. Max slowly opened his eyes to a blurred, hazy view of a small room. He blinked repeatedly, willing the fog to dissipate. His vision cleared, and he stared up at a gunmetal gray ceiling. He turned his head and saw a small metal desk, a few drawers built into the far wall, a sink at the foot of his bed, and a closed door to his left. Heat permeated the room, sweat rolling off his body. He lay on a slab of metal, the cool surface a haven from the muggy heat. He heard nothing except his own pulse, slow and steady in his ears. The scent of honeysuckle lingered, and he stared at a small vent over the door, wondering if they were pumping in the smell. They. Who are they? Memories of the capture flooded his mind, followed by a hazy attempt to recall the interrogation. His head pounded at the thought of the swarming lights and questioning. He grabbed his head and closed his eyes tightly. He groaned at the sudden headache. Stith, Max said aloud. He forced his eyes open against the pain, thankful for the dim light in the room. The guy's name was Stith. He reached up and touched his left eye, found it healed and open wide. His ribs no longer throbbed. He sat up slowly, careful to not test the newly healed body. Nausea threatened to overtake the pounding in his head as he threw his legs over the side of the bunk. He leaned his back against the bulkhead wall and realized that he was naked, except for a loincloth-type covering. The metal wall felt good on his back and helped him fight back both the headache and the bile. Momentarily comfortable, he thought back to his interrogation. He winced at how quickly he had revealed everything. His flight, the crash, the Tuscara, Serena, Samish, Samish. A bolt of fear shot through him. Chief, I hope you found the drugs, he muttered. That thought led to memories of Serena and her capture. The image of Phelan carrying her into the darkness burned into his brain, filling him with rage and dispelling the remains of the headache. He stood and spent a few minutes examining his small room. Other than the items already identified, he found nothing of interest. The computer lay dormant, 
the sink useless, the drawers empty except for a full-length garment that resembled an Arabic thobe. He slipped the gown over his head, found that it fit perfectly, and wished for a pair of shoes. He continued his exam of the room. He moved to the door, running his hand along the seam. Smooth metal, vibrating slightly, greeted his touch. His right hand still on the door, he turned, his eyes searching for anything that could pry open the door. Damn it! He jumped at a gentle rap at the door. He stared at the door, heart pounding, ready to pounce. Captain, please step away from the door, a voice called. Max searched the walls for the speaker, but saw nothing. He focused his attention back on the door. Captain, please step back, the voice said. If I wished you harm, I would have killed you during the interrogation. Mac, skeptical, took a hesitant step back. If I recall, and that's a big if, you almost did. I remember someone warning you about a dosage. The memory surfaced, hazy and disconcerting. The door opened, and Sub-Lieutenant Stith stood there, hands behind his back, eyes glowing with humor. He stepped into the room. The door remained open. Mac tilted his head to look past the alien, scanning the hallway beyond the portal. He saw no one. Your recall is commendable, Captain, the overseer nodded. My own people do not remember their interrogation, much less anything they say. Your physiology is unique. You interrogate your own people? Mac's brain latched onto the tidbit. For training purposes, Stith acknowledged. Your seer training is similar, is it not? Mac silently cursed himself. What all did I tell him? Your previous conversation did not yield as much as you might fear, Stith smiled, as if reading his mind. The drugs we administered did break down your barriers, but it also made you incoherent. Now that you've rested and the drugs have been flushed from your system, I hope that we can continue the conversation. Another interrogation? Mac inquired. He glanced past Stith again and saw no one. Somewhere in the back of his mind, a little voice said, Take him. A friendly conversation, Captain, the alien countered. Military officer to military officer. A very human, sly smile touched his lips. And if you are contemplating escape, I should tell you, you are in orbit, two hundred miles above the planet below. Even if you did get past me and the thousand Belega aboard, do you really think you could make it to the surface? Mac stood silently, weighing his options. I can fly anything, his pilot's ego boasted. His body tensed involuntarily, ready to fight, before the intellectual part of his brain intervened. Belega? My race, Captain, Stith replied. The Tuscara call you <laughs> overseers. Stith laughed lightly. Yes, we have watched over them for almost two centuries. I guess the primitives picked a name they could fathom. The Auks and the Kaya called us Sky People. But you must be famished. Stith waved toward the door. If you follow me, I will take you to a place where you can eat and refresh yourself. Mac's stomach growled at the mention of food, his mouth suddenly dry. Despite the need for food and drink, he remained steadfast. Stith motioned toward the door again. Come, Captain, you can eat and drink and we can exchange stories. You tell me how you came to be here. He smiled. And I will tell you how the Belega conquered the planet Earth. Chapter 14 Chief Borda sat beside Samish, cross-legged on the floor in the adobe hut. Three female Tuscara stood vigil, helpless but there nonetheless. Waning light streamed through the open door. The sounds of the daily routine filled the air. Shouts of a returning hunting party sent a cheer through the village. Fresh meat for dinner. Other warriors arrived from a day in the fields. Borda smelled the smoke from cooking fires as the village prepared for the evening meal. Borda sat vigil all night and throughout the day, watching the boy and nodding off intermittently. At dawn, three new women relieved the original three, quietly, without disturbing the chief. Samish, restless during the night, groaned occasionally, but remained quiet. At noon, Borda administered the second shot. By the last rays of daylight, Borda pulled back the animal hide blanket to inspect the wound. The swelling had reduced, but the large purple and green bruise remained at the site of the wound. 
Simish fluttered his eyelids but remained unconscious. The chief returned the blanket to its position and stood. Continue to give him water, he directed the women. Offer him food if he wakes. The three women nodded silently. Border retreated from the hut, ducking through the door. Outside, he stood straight and stretched, old bones and joints popping in the early evening. He turned to his right, watching the sun sink lazily toward the horizon. Clouds filled the sky, pushed by a strong wind from the south. He closed his eyes and let the wind flow over him, washing away the stress and worry. He opened his eyes to see most of the village watching. They demand action, he thought. I cannot simply sit and worry. I, we, must do something. He stared at the sky, watching lines of clouds fill the sky. Each wave appeared darker than the one before, promising a night of storms. A distant flash of lightning confirmed his thought. The ache in his left knee did as well. Nerlan, he called suddenly. Many of the villagers jumped at his outburst, quickly returning to the cooking pots and chores. Nerlan appeared before him with a small group of warriors in tow, the same men who accompanied him to the forest the day before. Nerlan carried a spear in his left hand, a bow and quiver of arrows set across his back. His hand hovered by the large knife on his right side. The other warriors carried similar weapons. Yes, chief. Borda offered a tired nod. You are prepared for battle. Good. A battle you shall have. Set sentries along the perimeter. Tell them to expect to be there all night, even through the storms. Ensure everyone has eaten, and tell them to return to their huts. Yes, chief. After nightfall, Borda continued, looking at the darkening sky once more, we will move west to the Kaya. He fixed his gaze on the Tuscara warrior. It's time to get my daughter back. Duran leaned back against the wooden wall of his hut, watching the argument between Phelan and his sister enter its third day. He folded his arms, listening to them scream, taunt, and threaten each other. As fun as it had been in the beginning, the constant bickering wore on his nerves. He looked away from the fight for a moment, taking in the grandeur of his home for the hundredth time. Despite his anger at the overseers, their craftsmanship left him in awe. The building sat twice as long as wide, with a door on each end. Bright light streamed in from both doors in the late afternoon. A bed of animal hide blankets sat in the corner by what he called the front door. A wooden table with three chairs occupied the opposite corner. A row of weapons lined both walls, spears, tomahawks, short swords, bows, and quivers of arrows. Four support beams split the center of the building. A large table with seating for eight sat in the center of the structure between two of the beams. Two fire pits lay dormant on either end of the large table. When lit, they provided light and heat to the entire structure. Their smoke trapped and released through metal chimneys and holes in the roof. The far end of the building, Duran considered it the back, sat unoccupied, except for Phelan and Serena. The two squared off, circling as if in combat, their voices loud in the confined space. Scratches covered Phelan's face, courtesy of Serena's nails. Bruises ran up and down her arms, a testament to Phelan's attempt to grab her. The old half-blind warrior moved in again, grabbing the woman's left arm. She screamed as he pulled her close, but released her immediately as she bit down on his arm. He howled in pain and backhanded Serena across the face. Her head jerked with a glancing blow, and she slammed into the wall. She stood for a moment, her body heaving, and Duran thought her crying. Phelan rubbed the bite on his arm, staring at the woman's back. He shook his head, his body trembling in anger. If you... Serena turned. Duran saw anger and hate in her eyes. She shook from rage, not tears. Her fists clenched, and she took a step toward her assailant. Enough, Duran ordered. But the woman continued her advance. Serena! Her head turned sharply, her eyes boring through Duran's soul. He cringed involuntarily, a chill flitting down his spine. Her eyes held the same look of contempt, anger, and hatred he had seen only once, in his father's eyes, the day his mother died. An errant arrow, 
fired by a Dega warrior as Borda's blade slashed his chest. The Dega had been fierce, pushing the Tuscara to the edge of the battlefield near the village. Most of the villagers, to include the children, sat on a small rise watching the battle. Duran remembered watching the arrow soar high into the air, heading toward him, Serena, and their Kani and Kea, mother. Without hesitation, she shielded her children with her body. The arrow pierced her back between her shoulder blades. She collapsed but did not die instantly. She held her children in her arms as the life drained from her. Duran could still feel her arms around him. The chief left the battlefield, running through the battle toward his family, hacking and slashing anyone that blocked his path. He arrived, covered in blood, seconds after the woman died. The chief went drunk with bloodlust, slaughtering most of the remaining Dega in his rage. The look in his eyes frightened Duran, tormented him in his nightmares. The same look in Serena's eyes as she stared at Phelan. Serena, Duran cautioned, barely able to keep his voice from cracking. She whirled on him, and he took another step back. If he touches me again, I will kill him, her eyes narrowed. And you? You promised her to me, Duran, Phelan interjected. For information about the Tuscara village, you promised her to me. Not now, Duran snapped. And if Samish is dead, she turned her gaze to Phelan. You will die a slow, painful death at my hands. She faced Duran again. Let me go, now. I need to attend. The boy may already be dead, Phelan stated, his eyes fixed on the woman. Releasing you would accomplish nothing. It would save your life, she snarled, at least for the moment. Enough, Duran shouted. Phelan, leave us. But leave us. A commotion outside the building interrupted the conversation. All three turned as a large silhouette filled the door. The figure entered, the shadow falling away to reveal Bulltree. The old Kaya moved slowly across the open room to stand before Duran. The Kaya chief saw fatigue and a hint of fear in the old man's eyes. What is it? Duran inquired. Sky people, Bulltree said with a nod. Two of their ships approach from the north. Duran cocked his head, listening, and heard the faint drone of the engines. He nodded toward Bulltree. Stay with Serena. Phelan, he addressed his old mentor. You will come with me. Duran, I... You will do as I say, Phelan. Duran cut him off. Fire lit his eyes as the ships arrived, circling overhead. I have to deal with the overseers. I do not have time to argue with you. Phelan nodded and remained silent. Duran stared at him for another moment before nodding curtly. He turned and left the longhouse, reassured by Phelan's heavy footsteps on the dirt floor behind him. He shielded his eyes against the bright afternoon sun as he stepped through the door. He blinked against the harsh glare and listened as the two ships landed at the edge of the farmland to the east. The Kaya villagers, all men, gathered in the village square. The fire pits lay dormant, save one where wood crackled under a large pot of water. Duran saw the gathering noting the absence of women. Did they do that on purpose, or was it an oversight? He shook the thoughts from his head and headed toward the eastern side of the village, toward the alien ships. The Kaya warriors followed. Thoughts of the prophecy touched his mind from nowhere. The stories of a man arriving in a ball of fire to vanquish the enemies of the Tuscara, or the Kaya's version, where the man united ancient relatives. He looked at the men around him, Tascara and Kaya, walking with him to greet the overseers. Definitely related. Perhaps there is some truth. Duran looked at the blue aliens leaving the ships and recognized Devry immediately. The overseer leader pulled the collar up on his coat, and Duran watched him shiver despite the warm afternoon. Devry looked over his formation of soldiers, nodded, and waved them forward. Duran stopped the Kaya and waited. Chief Duran! the overseer greeted, stopping a few meters away from the assembled Kaya. It is good to see you again. I hope you are pleased with your accommodations. The blue aliens formed a ragged crescent around their leader. Duran saw it as clear fields of fire. He nodded. The village is, he searched for the right word, is more than I expected. Excellent, Devry replied, his blue eyes scanning the crowd. And the fields? Fertile? Duran nodded. Where is he going with this? 
and preparations for the harvest? We have begun training for the harvest. It is only a few months away. Yes, Debry nodded. It will be here before you know it. And that brings me to the purpose of my visit today. Devry motioned everyone closer. Your attack on the Tuscara two days ago, that was unexpected. Duran tensed, pulse quickened, the sound of his heart so loud in his ears it threatened to deafen him. He heard the shuffling of feet behind him and hoped that everyone remained calm. Devry held up a hand. A broad smile split his face. No, no, my young Kaya, there are no concerns. In fact, I'm quite pleased by your initiative. His eyes searched the village, locking onto the makeshift horse pen to the south. The horses? Smart. But I wonder. His voice trailed off as he scanned the village again. What else did you take from your father? He motioned his men forward. The ends of the crescent peeled off, the blue alien circling around the edge of the gathered Kaya, and entered the village. Duran stared at Devry, trying to keep the hate from his eyes. The overseer stared back, smiling harmlessly. Duran looked away from the alien's gaze and listened as the alien searched the village to his back. He flinched with every crash of a pot or the splinter of wood as the aliens kicked in a door. His blood ran cold when he heard Serena's screams. He turned his hate-filled eyes back to the overseer. Ah! Devry nodded, offering a knowing smile. He waved a finger in the air for emphasis. The other thing you took from your father. Silence consumed the Kaya as the blue soldiers returned, reforming the ends of the crescent. Four overseers moved toward the center of the formation, near Devry. Two held a subdued bull-tree, his head down, shoulders slumped. The other two held Serena, kicking and struggling against their grip. Her eyes widened when she saw Duran and Phelan, and her thrashing increased. Devry crossed his arms, watching the woman struggle. By the alien's bemused smirk, Duran thought he took great pleasure in the woman's pain. The overseer let her rage take its course, and only when she slumped from exhaustion did he speak again. As I was saying, Devry stepped near Serena, I can understand taking the animals. That gives you a tactical advantage. Smart. But the woman? He touched her chin lightly, and Serena recoiled. Duran took a step forward, but stopped as the soldiers on the edge of the formation raised their weapons. Devry turned to look at Duran. What is she to you? A lover, perhaps? The Kaya chief's gaze turned icy his rage threatening to reduce his vision to a single tunnel focused squarely on the alien. He fought his urge to charge, knowing he would not make it halfway to the overseer. Instead, he opted for a half-truth. She is a healer, Deron said. Ah, Devry nodded, releasing her chin and stepping back to stand with the bulk of his forces. So, no emotional attachment? No, she is to be mine. Duran watched the alien's gaze land squarely on Phelan, who had taken a step forward. He put out his arm, stopping the old warrior from taking another step. Fear replaced his anger as the situation spiraled out of control. Yours? Devry inquired with a mocking laugh. <laughs> and who are you? Phelan, of the Tuskaya. Phelan? the overseer repeated. Phelan, the same Phelan wounded three harvests ago defending Chief Borta? Phelan puffed out his chest with pride. Yes. Borta made you his bodyguard, did he not? Phelan took a step back, his bravado gone. He nodded. How does he know so much about us? Duran pondered. He lowered his arm and unconsciously took a step away from Phelan. And he offered you his daughter, Devry pointed to Serena. To reward you for your bravery, yes? Phelan stood silently. Devry turned his attention back to Duran. So that would make this woman your sister? It was not a question. No one moved. You stole your own sister from your father? I wonder how he feels about that, he mused. We need a healer, Duran protested. Serena is a healer. Serena, that's it, Devry nodded. He turned his head to the woman. I am sorry, my dear, but your name escaped me until just now. I've studied your lineage for so long I feel like I know all of you. The overseer smiled. 
but I could not recall your name. Please. He stepped forward and took her hand. Forgive me. Serena jerked her hand away. Devry laughed. <laughs> Put her aboard my ship, he ordered the aliens, holding Serena. He turned to face Duran. You can keep the horses, but your sister, he shook his head, she is coming with me. Thalen charged, his battle cry splitting the afternoon air. The Kaya around him, including Duran, shrank back in terror, watching the old warrior take almost eight steps before the aliens opened fire. The concussion of the alien weapons echoed across the crowd. The impact of the crimson barrage stopped Phelan in mid-stride. The warrior levitated off the ground, suspended in time and space for a handful of heartbeats before hurling backwards. His bellow morphed into a shriek of terror as he rolled across the ground. He lay still, silent. Smoke slowly drifted from Phelan's body. That was unfortunate, Devry said after a moment, and unnecessary. He waved his troops toward the ships. The edges of the crescent formation pulled away, the overseers boarding the aircraft with military precision. Duran watched Serena, quiet now, as they pulled her away. Her eyes stayed locked under the corpse of Phelan. Numbness consumed the Kaya chief. He took a step toward Devry, oblivious to the rifles pointed at his chest. Chief Duran, Devry said, his voice smooth and polished. You need not worry about your sister. I will take good care of her. Now, neither village has a healer. That is more fair, don't you think? Duran stopped, his gaze boring through the alien. He clenched and unclenched his fists, his heartbeat almost drowning out the alien's words. Almost. One thing I want you to consider, chief, Devry laughed. <laughs> your actions led to this moment. If you had left her in the Tuscara village, she would still be there, safe and sound. He spun on his heel and returned to his ship. Engines flared, and the ships rose, spun, and disappeared into the afternoon sky. Duran stood there, staring into the sky, the alien's laughter ringing in his ears. Chapter 15 Mac finished the last bite of his sandwich wiped his mouth with a cloth napkin, and drained his third glass of water. He glanced at the small, plastic-like plate and briefly wondered what type of meat was that. Tasted like turkey. His gaze moved from the remains of the meal to Sub-Lieutenant Stith sitting across the table, his small chin cradled in his palms. The extrinsic galley sat empty, save for the two of them. Dull gray walls gave the room a sterile, bland feel. At least a dozen tables occupied the large room, four chairs per table. White, faux wood cabinets, holding plates and utensils, lined the outer walls. A series of shelves, with a variety of prepared foods under heat lamps, comprised the far wall. Are you ready to continue your tour of our flagship? Stith asked as Mac tossed his napkin onto the empty plate. Mac sat quietly for a moment, exhaled, and rubbed his full stomach. He nodded, and the two stood. He wiped the sweat from his head with a napkin. Why is it so hot in here? The Belega offered a smile. Our home planet is much hotter than you are used to. That is why you wear coats on the surface, Mac offered. I am surprised your skin is not red, or at least darker, if your sun is that much hotter. You are thinking of your own yellow star and its UV properties. Our home star is a blue giant, he smiled. It is a different type of light. And much warmer? Correct. Come, I will take you to a place that should be more suitable for you. Stith motioned toward the door, and they left the galley, entering one of the large corridors of the Bolega cruiser. A few of the slender aliens passed, their eyes wide as they stared at the human in their midst. The two walked in silence for several minutes, and Mac took advantage of the quiet to study the ship. The gray circular passage stretched about five meters in diameter with artificial lighting stationed along the sides and apex of the circle every five meters, illuminating the walkway. Stith explained that sound dampeners absorbed noise and kept their footfalls to a dull flap. The corridor stayed quiet despite any amount of traffic. He motioned Mac to take a right-hand turn. The corridor ended a few meters later at a large metal portal Stith touched a panel to the left of the doorway, and the hatch slid out of the way with barely a sound. Mac entered the room. 
The lights flicked on as the doors silently shut behind him. Mac gasped at the sight. He stood at the edge of a large, transparent bubble that stretched for dozens of meters. Stith walked a few steps and turned, his arms in the air as if to encompass the universe. And he did. Mac, frozen in place, stared out at the cosmos. A distant yellow sun shone brightly, its light reflecting off of two planets in his field of vision. A moon, cratered in gray, sat to his right, so close Mac thought he could reach out and touch it. A glow beneath his feet indicated the planet, but he could not see his homeworld from his vantage point. Wow, Mac said, taking a tentative step onto the glass bubble. This is observation point six, Stith explained. In our early days, they were used as training for astronavigation. Today, sadly, that is no longer taught to our youth. These rooms are now used to look out at the stars and little else. But you've seen the stars before, haven't you, Captain? Mac nodded, mesmerized by the sheer grandness before him. He turned and squatted, looking for the planet beneath them. It remained out of sight, blocked by the hull of the ship. He stood and faced Stith. What do you want from me? Your interrogation was thorough. You should have everything you need. Stith offered a humorless smile. Yes, you did tell us a great deal, but that was information, Captain. Now I want to hear your story. I'm an astronaut. Mac shrugged, looking away from Stith to gaze at the starfield around him. The interrogation complete, there was literally nothing to hide. But Mac hoped to gain a little intel of his own during the discussion. I was testing a new engine, hoping it worked so we could put a man on Mars. With the mention of the red planet, he scanned the heavens surrounding him. I made orbit, rounded the moon, he pointed to the planetoid beyond the glass, and ran into an alien armada. He turned to stare at Stith. Yours. And you remember nothing more? Mac shook his head. Not until I woke up, entering the atmosphere and crashing. And your time with the Tuscara? Mac shrugged, wishing he could see his homeworld. I barely got a glimpse when I took off. Not much to tell, he replied. They found me, healed my wounds, and kept me safe. Safe? Stith mused. Safe from whom? You. We are not here to harm anyone, Captain, Stith offered with a chuckle. I have a job to do. To be honest, I don't even like it, but it is a means to an end. What end? Promotion, status, wealth, power. What else is there? Max said nothing. He simply stared off into space. I am curious, Captain, Stith changed the subject. When you encountered our fleet, do you remember anything else? Like what? Mac asked, flustered. So far, this had been a one-sided conversation. He needed answers. The number of ships? Stith inquired. Their formation? A green beam of light, Mac finished hurriedly. Yes, a green beam swept over my ship. It got cold, really cold. I blacked out right after that. Do you recognize this? Mac turned to see Stith, wearing a knowing smile and holding his iPod. Mac's heart thumped in his chest. He stood and moved, reaching toward the small device. Stith pulled it back, halting Mac's advance. Do you know what we found when we examined this device? Stith mused. My playlist? Mac rolled his eyes, frustrated. Yes, Stith smiled. Our technical team has enjoyed the selection. He looked at the device. The classic rock genre is quite fascinating. I'm glad they liked it, Mac sneered. Can I have it back, please? It will not do you any good, Stith said. You have no listening device or way to recharge it. The alien stood silently for a moment. No matter. He tossed the small device to Mac. Mac caught it one-handed. A smile cracked his face as he looked at the iPod. It felt good to have something from home in his hands. He rolled the small cylinder between his fingers. There is one other thing we found, Stith continued. Pictures. Would you like to see them? Mac looked up. His pulse quickened and nodded. Stith pulled a small data pad from a pocket in his uniform and aimed it at the door. The transparent bubble turned opaque. Images appeared all around Mac, like he stood in an IMAX theater. Pictures of the Charger, Mission Control, and the entire NASA team flashed by. Mac's smile widened as images of the ISS appeared. He remembered taking those pictures as if it were only a few weeks ago. That thought culled his mood, his smile drooping. 
It was only a few weeks ago, he remembered. The International Space Station faded, replaced with a pockmarked lunar surface. Several snapshots of craters and small mountains on the dark side of the moon resolved and dissolved in sequence. The next image sent his heart racing. The photograph, slightly distorted by the cockpit canopy, showed the lunar landscape filling the right side of the composite. The alien fleet filled the rest. Broad, elongated ships, dozens of them, filled the heavens. The still shots ended, and video of the fleet began. The silent reel revealed the fleet growing larger as Mac approached. A beam lashed out, filling the opaque bubble with green light. The green hue slowly faded, replaced by a still of the fleet. Mac stood still, silent, staring at the alien fleet above his head. The image zoomed in, highlighting one of the largest ships in the Belega fleet. That ship, Stith said, that ship was called Legacy. It was a science vessel, state-of-the-art 300 years ago. 300? Yes, Captain, Stith nodded. My staff has confirmed that these images are 318 years old. How did I... All in good time, Captain, Stith assured him, a hint of pleasure in his voice. You see, these images prompted me to review the logs of the legacy. He moved close to Mac. Do you know what I discovered? Mac stared at the ship, numb. Three hundred years, gone. He shook his head when Stith repeated the question. You were captured, your ship neutralized, you were interrogated. The methods were not as sophisticated as what you endured yesterday, but they were effective. You told them everything you knew about your United States, the conflicts of that era, and the mission of the Space Corps. That information prompted the fleet commander to move up her timeline. Stith aimed his e-pad at the door, and the ship dissolved, replaced with images of the Belega fleet deployed around the planet, firing blue energy beams. Those images dissolved, reforming into cities burning under the alien onslaught. Thousands of bodies lay twisted and burned, scattered across the landscape. The human race was deemed a highly advanced, warlike, and savage civilization, a threat to the Belega. Any threats to the Belega are destroyed. The images faded, leaving the opaque background instead of returning to the starfield. You killed seven billion people? Sorrow and anger filled Mac's voice. No, of course not, Stith replied. We are not savages. Some were spared for their entertainment value. What? I'm getting ahead of myself, Captain. Stith held up his hands to fend off Mac's next question. What prompted my research into the event was something my grandfather told me before he died. The alien aimed his controller at the wall again. An image of Mac's ship appeared, surrounded by the Belega fleet from the fleet's perspective. Green beams leaped from three different ships, encasing the charger in a green glow. He was always telling stories of his fleet service. One of his tales involved the interrogation of a young alien, a human. Mac's eyes bulged. Nausea filled his stomach. Flashes of memory raced through his mind. He knew how the story ended. You see, Captain, my grandfather, he was on the legacy. You met him. His name was Terran, Mac finished. Dr. Terran, you are needed in Observation 3. Terran rose from his metal bed, rubbing his eyes. He stretched, listening to his joints creak in the soft, ambient light of his small room. He slid off the bunk and groggily stumbled over to the computer desk across the room. He tapped a button, and a hologram of a young Belega appeared before him. What is it? Doctor, the hologram explained. A ship has entered the fleet's control space. We have currently immobilized the ship. Command has requested that you interrogate the pilot. Show me. The hologram dissolved, replaced with a live shot of the Belega fleet on the right side of the picture. Green beams lashed out from three of the cruisers, converging on a small aerodynamic ship. The beams played over the hull of the alien craft. Its engines died, cockpit and running lights fading as the energy drained away. The green beams stopped, replaced by light, nearly transparent blue beams, tractor beams. The ship slowly moved toward the Legacy, the fleet science vessel. The hologram Belega replaced the images, the junior officer's face wearing a mask of concern. Command wants you to interrogate the alien, he repeated. 
I overheard the vice admiral. She is concerned that the humans are more advanced than we thought. Terran dismissed the thought with a wave. She is paranoid. Doctor, the hologram warned. She may hear. Let her. It's nothing I haven't already told her to her face, Terran replied, donning his uniform top. The vice admiral, the commander of the fleet, and Terran, the lead scientist of the fleet, frequently butted heads. Their quarrels, the stuff of legend. The humans have some technology, but they are no threat to this fleet, Terran finished. He glanced into a mirror over the hologram, examining his uniform and light blue skin. Satisfied, he turned his attention back to the hologram. You may tell Her Majesty that I am on my way to greet our guest. With a wave, he dismissed the hologram before the junior officer could retort. Terran left his quarters, turned left down the corridor, and made his way toward the upper decks of the ship. He entered Observation Room 3 and greeted four Belega already present, his staff. Terran stopped inside the doorway, his eyes expertly scanning the room to ensure everything was ready. The stainless durasteel walls glowed in the faint blue light. A single chair sat in the middle of the room, three small trays placed strategically around it. A cabinet lay near the wall to his right. The rest of the room sat vacant, barren, almost sterile. Do we need to worry about alien contamination? A white-smocked Belega asked, her voice muffled by a small mask covering her face. Terran waggled a finger, the Belega signal for no. The humans breathe oxygen as we do. We have been inoculated against all known human pathogens thanks to our expeditionary forces and their early missions. We should be safe, he smiled reassuringly. The Belega accepted his guidance with a slight bow turned, and returned to her duties. Terran noticed she left her face mask in place. His smile grew slightly. Sounds from down the corridor interrupted his thoughts. Places, he called. Our guest has arrived. He turned as four Belega, each wearing a mask like his young counterpart, rolled a gurney into the room. A human lay flat on the wheeled stretcher, wearing a bulky spacesuit with the helmet removed. Colorful patches adorned the material of his suit with words like NASA and USSC. One patch in the center of his chest below the neckline read Captain Gregory Mac McMillan. The four masked Belega hoisted the alien from the gurney, depositing him into the solitary chair in the room. They clamped metal and leather straps around the alien's legs, arms, and torso, securing him to the chair. Their task complete, the four rolled the gurney out of the room. The door slid silently shut behind them, leaving Dr. Terran and his four associates alone with the alien. Terran stepped forward, bent down, and examined the unconscious alien up close. His eyes studied the human, noting the anatomical similarities between the two species. The Belega sniffed a few times, smelling the musky scent of human. The scientist reached out, separating the human's lips, and examined his teeth. A gasp behind him interrupted his observations, and he released the human. Standing erect, he stared at the captive strapped to the chair. Begin with the standard workup, he directed, his eyes locked onto the human. He read the nameplate again. Make sure we find out everything we can about Captain McMillan. My grandfather learned quite a bit about humans that day, Stith confessed. Stith stood beside Mac in Observation Room 3, watching the video of aliens drawing blood and probing Mac's unconscious form. Stith raised his remote and, with a click, paused the holographic recreation. The scene froze, the four underlings bent over the chair or carrying vials of blood toward the workstation near the wall. Dr. Terran stood less than a meter away from the chair, staring down at Mac. The blue alien stepped forward, staring at his grandfather for a moment. He had not seen his grandfather in decades since his death. Stith gazed into the hologram's eyes, missing the long talks and the Belega's memorable stories. His voice took on a nostalgic tone. He was a good Belega, an excellent scientist, what you would call a patriot. Max stepped over to his own frozen form, slumped forward, strapped to the chair. He reached out to touch his own face, his hand passing through the image. He withdrew his arm. A patriot that led to genocide, Mac countered. Actually, no. Stith touched his remote again, and the hologram vanished. 
The opaque walls returned briefly before dissolving into the clear glass of the observation bubble. The two once again stood among the stars in silence. Have you given any thought to how you survived our attack on Earth? Stith inquired, breaking the uneasy quiet. Max stared at the alien for a moment before shaking his head. No, I didn't even know what happened until now. His eyes widened, and he stared at Stith. How did I survive? Stith clasped his hands behind his back and looked past Mac, staring at the nearby moon. My grandfather, Terran, was very good at his job. You told him everything. Military capabilities, wars, humanity's goals, everything. But you prefaced everything with, We explore in peace. Terran reported his findings to the Vice Admiral and, he nodded, he was right. She was very paranoid. She ordered the fleet to action. Despite Terran's insistence that the humans could be peaceful, based on your interrogation, she would not listen. Then the bombardment began. Our fleet leveled dozens of cities within hours, and she thought it an easy victory. Stith continued to stare at the lunar surface, although only a sliver of it remained visible as the Extrinsi orbited the planet. Then the humans fought back. What happened? Mac asked, his voice both sad and curious. Stith watched the moon slip from view, leaving only the vastness of space remaining in the transparent observation room. A few missiles made it through our bombardment, Stith recalled. I believe you called them satellite killers. Three of our smaller ships were damaged, hundreds of Belega wounded. The Vice Admiral ordered the complete annihilation of humanity. That's when Terran decided to act. How? Stith turned to face Mac. The human stared blankly at him, lost in thought and sadness. He returned to your interrogation room. You were still unconscious. He ordered his team to return you to your ship. My grandfather described what happened next in great detail. No matter how many times he told the story, no matter the embellishments he added, this part never wavered. He stared at Mac, sure that he had the human's full attention. What happened? blurted Mac. Terran directed his team to take you back to your ship, Stith explained. He wanted to get you away, he told me, to get you safely away from the battle. But as they carried your limp form through the ship, the humans launched their real counterattack. Nuclear missiles destroyed four of our frigates and damaged a handful more. The legacy rocked in the shockwaves of explosions. They returned you to your ship, strapped you in, and jettisoned you in the midst of the battle, Stith explained, the memories of his grandfather's stories clear in his mind. Terran told us younglings about watching your ship float away, even as the Belega fleet fired down on Earth. Grandfather described the smoke trails of missiles as they raced toward space. But what happened next, Terran called that a miracle. Stith paused, watching the human. Mac tapped a foot in anticipation, eyes wide and focused. The Vice Admiral ordered your ship recaptured, Stith recalled. He turned to look out at the stars, imagining the Belega fleet before him, lasers streaking down. Debris of the counterattack floating around the fleet, blocking the field of fire in some instances. As he talked, he visualized the words, watching his story unfold in space before him. The ion and tractor beams latched onto your ship, Stith continued. Grandfather said he screamed at the Vice Admiral, telling her to let you go. He watched helplessly as the fleet flagship drew you in. He turned to face Mac, wanting to see the human's reaction. That's when a pair of missiles flew through the bombardment and debris, impacting the Vice Admiral's ship. The dual explosions vaporized the vessel. The shock waves hurled your ship away from the fleet, Stith said, noting Mac's wide eyes and flaring nostrils. Grandfather told me that he saw your ship flung into deep space away from the earth. And? And what? Stith asked. And what happened next? Mac asked excitedly. Ah, Stith smiled. The executive officer, an admiral who, according to my grandfather, was much more reasonable, took command. He pulled the fleet to the backside of the moon as missiles filled the atmosphere with nuclear fallout. The Earth died slowly, a combination of our bombardment and nuclear winter. Mac frowned, his breathing fast and shallow. Terran authorized surveys to study the planet, Stith continued, but those were merely ruses to search for you. He never found your ship and thought you dead. Mac's face flushed. So... 
You did kill seven billion people, he accused, his voice strained. No, Captain, the Belega replied. We did not. Only a few billion died from the battle, another billion or so from the fallout and change in climate. Either way, Max stated, you destroyed humanity. Based on your interrogation, Stith said calmly. He watched the human's reaction go from frustration to outright rage. My inter... Stith held up his hand. Do not confuse me with my grandfather, Terran. He was sympathetic to the humans, to the bombardment and the death. I am not. What happened that day has happened to a dozen other worlds in the last half millennia. The Belega survey, and, if we find cause, kill those who threaten us. We pose no... You achieved spaceflight. You split the atom. Stith shook his head. That posed a direct threat to the Belega. Our fleet flagship that day is testament to that. You fired first, Max spat. We defended ourselves. As did other planets, Stith maintained. The end result was the same. The Belega always win. The room began to grow lighter as the Extrensi continued its orbit, bringing the planet back into view. Stith pointed, watching the human turn to look at the planet. The glowing orb wove into view. The sight of a blue-green planet put a smile on Max's face. Stith stared, watching the smile begin to fade as more of the planet became visible. Something wrong, Captain? That... that's not Earth. Chapter 16 You are correct, Captain. Stith nodded toward the planet outside the transparent window. That is not Earth. Your Earth was destroyed three hundred years ago. Max stared at the planet. Clouds covered a landmass in the northern hemisphere of the blue-green orb. The continent resembled North America without the Florida Peninsula, a majority of the eastern seaboard, and the entire west coast. The planet rotated, and he saw island chains throughout what would have been the Atlantic. The European continent, he considered everything in relation to Earth geography, bore large tracts of water in place of France, Germany, and Spain. There was no island nation of Great Britain. Where, where are we? Max stammered. Memories of looking at the stars and thinking something was wrong flooded his mind. He shook his head to clear the random thoughts. So much information, he thought. He stared at the floor. I need time. Of course, Captain, Stith said. He raised the electronic pad he held in his hand and pointed it toward the door. Hull enclosures to encase the observation point began to close, the planet and stars beyond slowly disappearing from view. We can continue the tour if you like, or you can retire to your quarters. Mac, lost in thought, looked up. What? Oh, um, the tour. Another thought made him pause. How did I get here if my ship was lost? The two left the observation room and re-entered the circular corridor. More Belega filled the passageway, and Stith mentioned something about shift change as the two made their way through the ship. Once the crowd thinned, Stith addressed the question. My science officer has a theory about your return, and it is a theory she is working to prove. Stith smiled. Scientists are like that. Mac let impatience cover his face, and Stith continued. The trajectory hurled you into deep space, the alien confided. Apparently, the energy beams from my grandfather's ship froze not only your controls, but you as well. You floated in space for three hundred years, slowly making your way across the cosmos. To where? Mac asked. Where is here? Alpha Centauri, the closest inhabitable planet to your Earth, and, more importantly, the perfect location to set up a transmission station for the entire galaxy. Transmissions? Why? Mac found himself near the galley again and entered without Stith. The conversation died the instant he crossed the threshold, but he ignored it. He joined a line of Belega, making his way slowly toward the shelves of food. He felt their stares, heard the whispers in their native language. He grabbed two containers of water from a tray and left the galley without a backward glance. He passed one of the containers to Stith. What were you saying about transmissions? He cracked open the container and took a long drink. Are you sure you want to hear the rest? Stith inquired. Mac wiped his face with his sleeve. He offered a curt nod. 
As I said, we are not savages, Stith explained as the duo continued down the corridor. There were millions of survivors on Earth. We called in every ship in the quadrant and took them from your dying world. Where? Here? Some, Stith nodded. The rest are scattered throughout the galaxy. Earth may have died, but humanity has thrived. You call killing each other every six months thriving? Captain. Mac felt the alien's hand on his shoulder, stopped, and faced the Belega. It is better than leaving them on a dead world. Some were spared for their entertainment value. You said that before, Mac said, his eyes narrowing. Butterflies filled his stomach as he asked, What did you mean? The Belega are not conquerors, Stith stated, motioning for them to continue walking. They took a right down another long circular corridor. Two of the lights flickered as they passed. To put it in your terms, we are talent agents. Max started to ask a question, but the alien held up a hand to stop him. He closed his mouth and kept walking. The galaxy is large and filled with thousands of different races. As you can imagine, there have been many devastating wars over the millennia. A few thousand years ago, the races settled into an uneasy truce. Stith took a drink from his container. Part of that truce included terms for those races either caught in the crossfire or outright conquered. The Belega fit both of those criteria. What terms? We run the games. What games? Mac asked, his voice wary. Alpha Centauri is one of our gaming planets, Stith explained. A studio. We bring different races here and other locations to participate in various games, which we transmit through the galaxy. Wait, you said the Belega were conquered, Mac said. But when you came to Earth, you were looking for races strong enough to stand up to you. Something doesn't add up. The money we have made over the last 2,000 years has turned the Belega into one of the most powerful races in the cosmos, Stith explained. We are no longer the weak. We have become the strongest race in the galaxy, and we will not let that slip away. They arrived at a set of double doors, and Stith removed a small access card from a pouch on his belt. The door opened as he pressed the card to a reader attached to the wall. The alien led Mac onto a catwalk that circled a large room that Mac thought at least two football fields long and half as wide. Hundreds of video screens displayed scenes from the various shows in progress. Stith pointed and named the games. Big Game Safari, we bring in animals from all of the galaxy for the hunt. Solo, we strand a dozen beings on a small island. The last one standing wins. There are no rules. He pointed to a series of small screens on the left. Mac recognized the Tuscara village in one view, the Kaya in another. Harvest Day. Villages fight over crops every six months. The winner keeps their crops. The loser... His voice trailed off as a pair of ships lifted from the Kaya camp. Paying the Kaya a visit? Mac inquired at the sudden silence. What is Devry up to? Stith murmured. It doesn't matter. Harvest Day has been losing viewership the last few seasons, although the fighting is quite intense. The build-up has been rather flat. It appears this will be the final season. What will happen then? The field will be cleared for gladiatorial games, Stith replied. Studying your ancient Romans has inspired command. Cleared? You're going to kill them? Max snapped. He clenched his fists, his breathing shallow. He prepared to fight. Not yet, Stith said, ignoring the human's temper. Your arrival has sparked a resurgence in the program. Ratings are up. Ratings? Mac asked, incredulous. These are human beings you're talking about. You're concerned about ratings? And so should you. The alien turned to face Mac. With higher ratings for the show's exit, there is a chance, although a small one, that Command may let the survivors live, at least until they are recruited to a new game. And for now, ratings are up. The mysterious Pale Stranger and Iran's sneak attack two days ago have intrigued our viewers. They don't know if it's scripted or real life, and they don't care. It's something new, and that has increased viewership. He turned back to the monitor, watching a replay of Devry's ship taking off. Add whatever Commander Devry is doing, and you have a winning combination. I don't care about a winning combination. I don't care about your ratings, Max spat. 
I care about human beings killing each other for your amusement. To you they are human beings, Captain, Stith mused. To the Belega and the Galactic Entertainment Consortium, they are simply lesser life forms performing for our amusement. Come, Stith waved toward the door. Let us greet Commander Devry and uncover his mission to the Kaya. Max stood, hands clasped behind his back, staring through a sheet of plastic glass, watching Commander Devry's shuttle land in the sprawling hangar of the Extrinsy. His thoughts whirled with the information freely given by Stith, who stood beside him, rocking slightly on the heels of his feet. Mac rubbed his face, feeling the coarse hair of his beard, as he replayed the images of the destruction of Earth. He fought the urge to throttle the Belega. The planet, Alpha Centauri, filled the space beyond the hangar doors. So much like Earth, Mac mused, staring at the blue-green world. Who knew? Clouds covered most of the planet. He narrowed his eyes in concentration, studying what land he could see. Mac saw large land masses, a glimpse of large lakes, and vast oceans. So familiar, but... The Extrinsy's hangar doors closed, slowly cutting off Mac's view of the planet. His gaze turned to the shuttle as steam vented from the engines. He heard the hiss of depressurization, and the vapor dissipated. Stith pointed to a control panel near the window. A series of lights winked on, indicating the base pressure. An orange light flicked on and Stith motioned Mac toward a nearby door. The hatch opened with a faint hiss of equalization, and the two entered the hangar bay. Mac's eyes roamed the cavernous bay, identifying a dozen overseer fighters, half as many shuttles, and two large transports. Blue-skinned crews swarmed the pressurized bay, some heading for Devry's shuttle others moving toward ships in obvious disrepair. The shuttle hatch opened, a ramp extended to the Durasteel hangar deck. Stith stopped a few meters away, holding up his hand for Mac to stop. Neither said a word, had not said anything since leaving the control room a half hour earlier. Mac was fine with that. He still fought the urge to strangle the alien. Devry's contingent of guards exited the shuttle, their footfalls heavy on the ramp. The commander followed, his coat off, uniform almost glowing in the overhead lighting. He wore a satisfied smile, and he seemed happy with himself. Mac's adrenaline spiked. He did not like that look. A grunt of exertion emanated from the ship, followed by sounds of a struggle. Two guards appeared at the top of the ramp, a young human woman between them. She struggled against their grip, her face red in anger and stress. Serena! The woman stopped her grappling, eyes frantically searching for the source of the voice. Mac! The astronaut left Stith's side in a flash, sprinting the last few meters toward the ramp and the woman. Serena kicked the belega on her left in the calf. He released her, howling in pain as she turned and punched the other in the nose. The alien grabbed his nose in pain as light blue blood ran down his face. Serena bounded down the ramp, knocked Devry aside, and met Mac on the hangar floor. Mac scooped her up in a bone-crushing embrace, whirling her around, her feet off the floor. They laughed, the stress of his capture slipping away. He set her down and kissed her, the rest of the galaxy forgotten for a brief moment. He tasted her lips, his hands holding her close. Even in the heat of the Belega ship, he felt the warmth of her body against his. Guards! Mac broke their embrace, moving Serena behind him and placing his body between her and Devry. The commander stood at the base of the ramp, his smile gone, his fist clenched in rage. A hint of purple filled his face, reminding Mac of the Bugs Bunny cartoons he watched as a kid when the rabbit frustrated his victim. Who is this human? Devry demanded, his eyes locking onto Stith. This is Captain McMillan, Commander, Stith replied, his voice barely hiding the humor in his voice. He is a human? I can see that, Devry spat, his breathing ragged. What is he doing here? I captured him, Stith reported. You did order me to study him, remember? Devry tensed, as if remembering his past commands. He nodded after a moment, his fist unclenched, and his shoulders relaxed slightly. Yes, yes, good work, sub-lieutenant. Keep going like this, and you'll make lieutenant, one day. He moved closer to Mac and Serena. He took another breath visibly calmed himself, and addressed Mac. Step aside, human, he ordered. 
I need to debrief the female. His nearby troops snickered under their breaths. Go to hell, Mac replied, his eyes glaring at the alien. The Devry appeared confused for a moment. Stith, the commander turned his attention from Mac. Remove your pet from my presence. His gaze fell on Serena. I do not wish to be disturbed as I study the female. Commander, Mac attacked. Two steps, and Mac struck Devry with a gut punch, followed by a left jab to the alien's face. The commander staggered backwards, and Mac executed a jumping front kick, catching the alien in the chest. Devry's feet left the floor, his body levitating for a moment, before the alien landed flat on his back, sliding across the smooth Durasteel deck. Electricity flooded Mac's body. His muscles tensed, non-responsive. His knees buckled, and he heard a feminine voice scream his name. He crashed to the deck, spasms racking his body. Soft, caressing hands touched his body as he twitched uncontrollably. Serena's face filled his vision, her face a mask of concern. He maintained consciousness, but the world narrowed to a swirling tunnel. Mac, Serena called, her voice distant in the tunnel. Mac, are you okay? Hands entered his vision, grabbed Serena, and hauled her away. He opened his mouth to protest, but succeeded in only uttering a long string of unintelligible sounds. Rough hands, smaller than Serena's but more powerful, pulled him to his feet. His vision returned partially, and he saw two Belega held him upright. He uttered a long string of curses at them. More unintelligible gibberish filled the air. Devery made it to his feet with the assistance of his soldiers. Hatred filled his eyes as he held his left arm across his abdomen where Mac landed his first blow. That sight offered the human a bit of solace. Got him. The Belega approached Mac, shrugging off the assistance of his soldiers. He stood for a moment before cocking his arm back for a strike. Mac tried to brace for the punch, but his body remained unresponsive. The soldiers on either side let him go as Devry hit him. The blow to the solar plexus sent Mac to the floor breathless. The soldiers picked him up again, and the process repeated several times, each punch landing in Mac's stomach. Devry grabbed Mac's hair, pulling his face up. The Belega uttered something in his native tongue before punching him a final time, this one to the face. Mac fell to the floor and remained there, his body numb from the beating and the stun beams. Sub-Lieutenant, Devry panted, staring at his subordinate. Complete your interrogation of this animal and then space him. No, Serena's scream echoed in the landing bay. Yes, my dear. Devry replied, turning to face the woman. You have feelings for this human? Mac lay on his side, trying to rise, but his body refused his commands. He watched the conversation as he lay helpless, sprawled out on the hangar floor. Tears flowed from Serena's eyes as she stared at him. She nodded her head. Yes. You should worry about your own fate, Devry spat. Not his. He turned to look at Mac, the eye contact between them full of hatred. If you do not please me, Devry turned back to Serena, you will join him. Take her to my quarters, Devry ordered his men before turning to Stith. Forget the interrogation. Kill the animal. Now. Sir, Stith replied, his face an emotionless mask. Devry stormed away, still holding his abdomen, his entourage following. They moved out of Mac's vision, even as he struggled to move. His body refused to budge. The pain of the beating crept into his abs, and Mac took that as a good sign. Maybe the stun is wearing off. Stith watched the procession leave before nodding to the two Belega remaining. Their hands found Mac's arms and pulled him unsteadily to his feet. Stith moved in close to Mac, a smile splitting his face. Thank you, Captain, Mac uttered more gibberish. Thank you for the most entertainment I've had during this assignment, Stith added. I only wish you could have beat him more before his soldiers shot you. Glad, glad I could help, Mac managed, his words almost clear. You've done more than that, Stith replied. You've provided me with an opportunity. Mac offered a quizzical look that came off as a snarl. He ordered me to space you. He shook his head in human fashion. I refuse to space my ratings boost. No, Captain, I have something else in mind for you. Mac stared at the alien, 
but his thoughts went to Serena. "'What hell is she enduring?' he muttered. "'The female will be fine,' Stith assured him. "'And if you do as I ask, we will all win.' Stith turned and left the hangar bay, his two personal aides dragging Mac behind him. Chapter 17 Sub-Lieutenant Stith sat back in the command chair of the broadcast center, relaxing into the plush leather. Around him, technicians sat in two concentric circles of chairs, monitoring their stations and controlling all of the games on the planet below. Monitors ringed the oval room, each displaying images from drones scattered around the game zone. The main monitor, sitting directly in front of the command chair, shifted at regular intervals, offering the director of operations a view of a different broadcast. Stith's chair maintained a separate holovid, allowing him to choose the game he wanted to see. At the moment, he watched the flickering fires of the Tuscara village and the images of a handful of humans as they stood guard. Nothing else stirred, nor did Stith expect it to in the middle of the night. He flipped a switch, and the hologram changed to a private suite on board the Extrinsy, where Mac lay on a metal bed, a thin sheet covering his body. Stith's two personal aides, trusted Belega that reported only to him, stood watch. Satisfied with that part of the plan, the sub-lieutenant switched view to a safari on the day side of the planet. A caravan of large mammoths with long, sharp tusks lumbered through a desert Serengeti. Dozens of other animals prowled on the perimeter of the caravan, stalking the weakest of the herd. These resembled lions, with the mane stretching along their back, providing additional camouflage in the desert environment. Stith knew that another group, hunters intent on winning the Safari Hunt prize, also stalked the caravan. With a million credits on the line, there was no shortage of volunteers for the hunt. Did a hunter occasionally get caught by something in the wild? Of course but that only increased the ratings. As he watched, the pack of mammoths arrived at an oasis, their massive bodies slurping water and wading into the wadi. One baby mammoth, its tusks barely visible, splashed happily as one of its parents stood at the edge of the pool watching. The stalking animals lay in the sparse brown grass, patiently waiting. A bright purple light flashed on the chair's console. Sir, command is on hypercom channel three one of the technicians reported. Stith paused for a moment, tensed with excitement, waiting to see who would strike first, the animals stalking the caravan or the hunters with their high-powered weapons. The purple light continued to flash. The baby mammoth moved toward the far end of the oasis, away from the pack. The stalking animals crept closer. A crosshair reticle appeared on the screen, zeroing in on one of the main stalkers. Everything paused and the show moved to a commercial selling real estate on the outer rim. Stith relaxed, disappointed. He touched the flashing button, wondering which beast, animal or alien, would collect the kill. A picture of a slowly rotating planet disappeared, a uniformed belega taking its place. The blue alien wore the standard dark blue uniform, rows of medals arranged on both sides of the chest. Three six-sided stars adorned the female's collar. Admiral, Stith began, thank you for returning my call. Where is Commander Devry? Dun Admiral Plar countered, her voice even. Stith looked into the hologram's eyes, studied her body language for a moment. Confusion from mixed signals clouded his mind. Commander Devry is interviewing a prisoner, Admiral, Stith said. He regrets not being here for this report. I'm sure, she replied. Stith recognized her tone this time a knowing tone that indicated she knew of Devry's alien proclivities. What is your report? Stith offered a concise report on the activities since the Kaya attack four days earlier. He carefully skirted the issue of his interrogation of Mac and ended with the jump in ratings, essentially saving the best news for last. Excellent, Sub-Lieutenant, the Admiral admitted. Keep up those numbers and you may be promoted one day. Stith ignored the subtle jab. We want more, the Admiral continued. The decision to end that particular game is irreversible. That does not mean it can't go out with a bang. Stith agreed. With that in mind, I have a couple of ideas to increase ratings. Have you discussed your ideas with Commander Devry? Stith kept his voice neutral. Not yet. He has been 
preoccupied with his debriefing of his prisoner. The admiral waved off the rest of his rehearsed proposal. If it will increase viewership, do it. You are authorized to use any means at your disposal to include destruction of the game zone. Thank you, Admiral, Stith acknowledged. The hologram disappeared without another word. The safari hunt program returned. The baby mammoth lay in a pool of blood at the edge of the oasis. The rest of the herd had disappeared. Two of the lion creatures lay feasting on the carcass, their manes drenched in blood and dust. A third of the creatures sprawled nearby, two other lions feasting on it. Stith stared at the scene, ignoring the program. Authorized to use any means. A smile split his face as he remembered his words to the human. Promotion, status, wealth, power. What else is there? What else indeed? Max slowly stood from his bed, cradling his abdomen with his left arm. His feet touched the metal floor, the warmth of the ship making the deck plating pleasant to the touch. After the encounter in the landing bay, the Belega brought him to the small room, placed him on the bed, and did nothing. No medical assistance, no words on a plan. Stith's aide simply dumped him on the bed and took a post on either side of the solitary door. They stood there, their faces emotionless, their weapons holstered. If I can get my hands on one of those... He grimaced at the thought, his arm pressing harder against his bruised midsection. His beating at the hands of Devry hurt like hell, but he suspected no permanent damage. Mac rotated his neck, listening to the joints pop with the motion. Gingerly, he stretched his arms, chest, and back, feeling tight muscles pull. Not as healed as I thought. Sucking in a deep breath, he leaned backwards, his abs protesting in fiery agony. He straightened up, gasping for breath as sweat beaded on his forehead. He exhaled slowly and wiped away the perspiration. The weeks with the Tuscara had been great for his overall health. He lost weight thanks to the mixture of fresh protein from the hunts and the natural fruits and vegetables. He learned he did not miss the preservative-laden foods of the 21st century, although occasionally late at night he craved a Big Mac. Add to that the constant movement every day and his calisthenics program, and Mac had the body of a 22-year-old Marine. He would trade all of that for a weapon and a clear shot at Devry. The door slid open and Stith entered, a bounce in his step. His happy demeanor put Mac on alert. The blue alien wore a very human smile. His eyes sparkled. He nodded to his two aides, and the Belega exited the room, leaving Stith and Mac alone. How are you feeling? Sore, Mac responded, stretching his abs again. He straightened, looking stiff in the eyes. Why are you in a good mood? The Belega moved to the foot of the bed and, using his arms, pushed himself up onto the metal slab. I have discussed the current situation with my higher command. I have been given, what you humans call it, carte blanche to do as I wish as long as the ratings continue to rise. Congratulations, Mac replied with a little more sarcasm than he intended. Does that include spacing me? No, the alien replied. I have other plans for you. The unsettling tone chilled Mac despite the heat. I'm afraid to ask. He stretched again, the knotted muscles slowly loosening. The pain subsided. You misunderstand, Captain. I intend to let you go. Mac straightened quickly, the muscles tightening. He grimaced, fighting the pain. You what? I am letting you go, Stith repeated, but there are conditions. There it is. What's the catch? One, it must look like an actual escape. I cannot simply let you go, Stith said, holding up his fingers and counting the conditions. Two, you must take the human female, Serena, away from Commander Devry. Is that all? Mac asked. I thought this was going to be hard. By doing this, Stith continued, ignoring the interruption, you will help me by making the ratings increase. Your daring escape and rescue of the fem Serena will be the boost I need. For what? For a promotion to leave this Rachu forsaken planet behind. Mac bent forward, stretching his quads. The distracting conversation helped take his mind off the beating and the pain. He felt better as he straightened again. And how do I do this and make it look authentic? I will order the door left open. Stith laid out his plan. 
Once I leave, simply attack one of my aides and take his ID. That should open any door for you. Devry's quarters are two levels down. Find your companion and then find the nearest escape pod. We will, of course, pursue you, but you will evade my forces. That will make for spectacular viewing. Ratings will soar. We won't be able to return to the Tuscara with your forces on my ass, Max stated. He looked at the alien, still sitting on the end of the bed. He's not telling me something. An unfortunate consequence, Stith acknowledged. But your escape could secure the longevity of the tribes below. Tribes? The Tuscara and the Kaya. You'll leave them alone? No, Stith sighed. The games must continue, but with the ratings higher than ever, I may be able to convince Command to let the victor live. Max stood in silent contemplation, reviewing the plan Stith laid out. He did not trust the alien. A slow smile crept across his face. You will do what you can to ensure the survival of the victor? Stith nodded. Then I'm in, Max said, moving closer. With one small change to the plan, Stith's grin grew. And what is that, Captain? Mac punched Stith in the face, knocking the alien backwards off the bed. He landed awkwardly on his back. Mac rounded the end of the bed, pressing his attack, and beat the alien in the face. Days of frustration, including his thoughts of Samish, and now Serena, energized his attack. Finally, he sat back, winded, blue-hued blood covering his hands. Mac gulped air, steadying his shaking hands. He looked over his shoulder not quite prepared for a counterattack from Stith's aides. The door remained closed. Mac nodded and turned his attention to the unconscious alien at his feet. A quick search revealed his key card and a small communicator. Mac relieved the belega of his sidearm, rolling the weapon over in his hand, getting a feel for it. The pistol resembled something from a 1950s-era science fiction film with two side-by-side -side barrels, three energy level indicators, an ambidextrous safety, and a small spotting scope. Mac adjusted the energy level to the lowest setting and moved toward the door. Holding the weapon in his right hand, he pounded on the door with his left. Come quick, he shouted. Stith is hurt. The door opened and the first aide entered, pistol out and ready. His eyes widened as he saw Stith lying at the foot of the bed. He moved past Mac toward the unconscious Belega. The second aide followed, weapon leading the way. Mac grabbed the second aide's pistol and lashed out with a roundhouse kick to the alien's chest. The Belega tried to scream as the air rushed from his lungs. Mac, still holding onto the barrel of the alien's weapon, turned his stolen pistol toward the first aide. His dull green energy bolt caught the aide in the side as he turned. Electricity engulfed the alien, tendrils of energy circling his body. The aide stiffened and fell to the floor. He lay twitching as the energy ribbons continued to plague his body. The second aide regained his composure, wrestling for the weapon that both he and Mac held. Mac shoved the barrel away from his body as the alien fired. A bright purple bolt of energy sizzled into the far wall, exploding a chunk from the bulkhead. Mac felt the barrel heat up in his hands, not quite burning, but hot. He held on as he brought Stith's pistol on target with the second aide. The alien fired again. Another purple bolt slammed into the metal table, melting a corner to slag. Mac gritted his teeth against the pain of his burning hand. A quick pull of the trigger and a light green bolt struck the second aid in the chest. The Belega yelped as the electric current shut down his system. He spasmed, firing his weapon a third time. The heat of the barrel too hot to handle, Mac released the weapon and shot the alien a second time. The alien slammed into the bulkhead wall next to the door, his body twitching as electricity engulfed him. The alien slid to the floor and slowly fell over on his left side. The door to the corridor slid silently shut. Mac shook his left hand, trying to numb the pain. He examined his hand, red and throbbing, but no real damage. Frustrated, he shot the unconscious alien again before picking up the aide's discarded pistol. A quick look showed the energy indicator set at the highest level. Good to know. He tucked that pistol into the waistband of his pants at the small of his back and moved to the first alien he shot. Mac picked up the first aide's discarded pistol, noted it too was set on the highest setting, and smashed it against the bulkhead. He nodded with satisfaction as the weapon shattered into dozens of pieces. He turned his attention to Stith, still unconscious on the floor. 
Without looking, Mac shot the first date again before moving toward the sub-lieutenant. It was a good plan, Mac nodded. Better think I'll take it from here. Mac pulled the trigger, watching as electrical currents engulfed Stith. Even unconscious, the alien twitched as the current ravaged his body. Mac took one last look around the room. He gripped the pistol tighter, reassured by its weight in his hand. After a moment of hesitation, he flicked the energy level to the middle setting. Hang on, Serena, he muttered as he headed toward the door. I'm coming. Come, my dear, Devry whispered seductively. I can make your life both comfortable and rewarding. The commander stood before three full-length mirrors in an alcove of his quarters, his uniform unbuttoned halfway down his blue, hairless chest. The mirrors surrounded him, offering him a near-complete view of his body except for his back. He studied his appearance, adjusting his facial expressions to match his tone as he spoke. He tried a different line his eyes widening as he attempted to mimic a human raising eyebrows. As he had none, the gesture failed. He picked up a jar from a small table beside the mirror, dabbed his finger into the contents, and smeared gel on his exposed skin. The sickly sweet aroma filled his nostrils, his heart beat faster, and his skin glistened in the light. He smiled. Perfect. He left the small alcove, passed through his bedchamber, and entered the main part of his quarters. Rank hath its privileges, and Devry took advantage of that. His quarters sprawled almost four times larger than standard. A bedroom, living area, relaxation area, and a small meeting table with three chairs filled the massive space. Portside windows offered a grand view of the planet and the stars beyond. Come, my dear, he repeated as he entered the living area. I can make your life both comfortable and rewarding. He inhaled deeply through his nose, letting the gel vapor intoxicate him. The Cordera gel was a favorite aphrodisiac for the Belega, and Devry wondered how it would affect his human guest. He smiled at the thought of finding out. The woman mesmerized him like no other human. Not only her beauty, but her defiance intrigued him. Her headstrong determination, her passion for the human he ordered spaced, intoxicating. His past experience with human females left him wanting more. Devry paused, adjusting the open collar of his uniform. He hoped her fiery spirit would fulfill his needs. Confident in his appearance, he crossed the threshold from the main living area to the recreation area of his quarters. A large hollow projector sat to his left near the bulkhead. Two angled two-seat couches sat before it. Behind the couches, a large holographic console displayed the planet, the moon, and the three Belega ships in orbit. The dual-purpose console served as a tactical briefing location or a gaming console, depending on the circumstance. To his right, the large bay windows offered a view of the planet. "'Welcome to my humble home, my dear,' Devery addressed his guest. "'I can make your life both comfortable and rewarding.' Serena sat on one of the couches, staring at the far wall, her hands bound behind her, her legs also tied together. Two decorative lamps on either end of the two-seat couch lay shattered on the floor, the destruction the cause of her bindings. At the sound of his voice, she turned toward Devry. He saw red, angry eyes that promised great pain if ever released. Tear-streaked dirt ran down her face, remnants of her reaction to Max beating. She stared at him, her nose crinkled in disgust. What is that smell? she asked. She sniffed the air. Is that you? Devry stopped mid-stride, his expression morphing to confusion. He sniffed the air experimentally. The strong, sweet Cordera gel filled his nostrils. He frowned, his opening gambit destroyed by the human olfactory sense. You, you don't like it? It's horrible, Serena cried, almost gagging. What is that? It is Cordera, a favored romantic enhancement for... Alarms rang through the ship, cutting off his explanation. Devry retraced his steps, leaving the bound woman coughing from her exposure to the Cordera gel, and re-entered his living area. He moved to a corner console near the door and activated a hologram display and put in a call to the bridge. The image of a junior officer appeared before him within seconds. 
What is going on? Devery demanded. I left orders not to be disturbed. Where is Stith? The junior stood perplexed, as if trying to figure out what to respond to first. Apparently, he decided on chronological. The human prisoner has escaped. He was last reported heading toward level eight. Stith and two soldiers have been wounded. Escaped? I ordered him spaced. Devery felt his anger rise. Incompetence! Where is Sub-Lieutenant Stith? In the medical section, Commander. The hologram responded hurriedly. He was apparently beaten by the human. Serves him right, Devery growled. Find the human. Kill him. His mind whirled. How did this happen? Level eight. He is coming for the female. Devery heard a crash from the next room, and he turned his head toward the sound. Send a security team to my quarters at once. Sir. The hologram answered before winking out of existence. Devery took two steps back and peered around the partition separating the two rooms. He saw the female standing at the end of one of the couches, another lamp shattered on the floor. She held a remnant of the lamp in one hand, her sliced bonds in the other. A satisfied smile split her face. She saw Devery, sniffed the air, and gagged again. You smell horrible, she managed, before cupping her hand over her nose and mouth. She cocked her head, listening. What is that? Her voice muffled by her left hand. She held a sharp piece of the lamp in her right. Your human friend has escaped, Devery explained, moving swiftly toward the woman. She lunged with the lamp shard, and he easily sidestepped the thrust. He grasped her hand with his left and backhanded her across the face with his right. She yelped in pain, dropping the shard, and released the hand that covered her nose. She gagged immediately at the strong smell. Come with me, he tugged her arm. She pulled away, but Devery tightened his grip, her soft skin pinching in his grasp. She grimaced with pain, but stopped struggling. He did not want to hit her again. He had other, more pleasurable plans for the human. At that moment, however, his thoughts focused on leaving his quarters before the male human found him. He pulled the female behind him as he moved toward the door to his quarters. He paused near the hatch, long enough to grab a pistol from a hidden compartment near his communication console. Comforted by the weight, Devery ensured the weapon's energy level was set to the highest setting and opened the door. The hatch slid silently to the side, and, reaffirming his grip on the woman, Devery cautiously checked the hallway. His dual hearts pounded as he cleared the corridor to his right and then turned left. The human in question stood halfway down the passageway, his body leaning into a hatch as he searched the room. A spike of fear warmed Devery as the male retreated out of the room. He turned down the corridor. The human's eyes widened with recognition, and he raised a stolen pistol. Devery fired first, the pistol recoiling slightly in his hand. The blast missed the human, striking the man's pistol. The weapon shattered, the human staggering back from the impact. The man turned his eyes to his hand and shook it, grimacing in pain. The human turned his eyes back to Devry, and even at several meters, the Belega recognized hatred. An uneasy silence filled the passageway as the two stared at each other. Serena, still in Devry's grasp, stood perfectly still. Devry felt the weight of the pistol in his hand, the dual beat of his hearts. His pulse pounded in his head, almost drowning out the woman's shallow inhale, her skin soft in his hands. The smell of melted circuitry from the smashed pistol drifted down the hallway. Your escape is at an end. Devry finally broke the silence, aiming his pistol at the human's chest. His finger blued on the trigger. Serena pulled against his grip, shifting his aim as he fired, the energy bolt missing the human by inches. Devry snarled at the woman, released her, and backhanded her in a single motion. The smack of flesh on flesh echoed down the corridor. The woman screamed in pain and collapsed to the floor, holding her face. Devry, rage building, turned back toward the human male. Time slowed. He watched the human pull a second pistol from behind his back. Devry's vision narrowed, focusing solely on the human standing in the passage. He raised his weapon. Somewhere in the recesses of his mind, Devry knew the truth. He was not fast enough. He saw the flash of the human's pistol, heard the whine of the energy beam, and felt searing pain in his chest. Devry felt his pistol jump in his hand, the bolt slamming into the wall halfway between him and the human. The weapon slipped from weak fingers, clattering on the floor. Devry fell to his knees. 
Another bolt sliced through his right side, the sound of the weapon's fire reverberating down the passageway a second later. The impact flipped him onto his back, the cool metal of the floor chilling his body. His heartbeats slowed, the light narrowed. He swallowed, his mouth dry. Weight grew on his chest, and he found it hard to breathe. Footsteps vibrated through the deck to his back. The image of the human male filled his vision. The man reached out and helped the woman off the deck. Devery realized he would not get to experience her pleasures, and that, somehow, felt worse than the life draining from him. The humans embraced, standing over Devery. Animals, he thought. Are you all right? the male asked, pulling back. Yes, she replied, tears streaming down her face. Come on, he nodded back down the corridor. Time to leave. What? How? The human looked at Devery. Sub-Lieutenant Stith left an escape pod for me. Stith? That son of a Krondok, he betrayed me. I'll kill him. But we are heading toward the landing bay, the male continued. I want a real ship. Fear filled the woman's voice. Can you fly one of their ships? The man smiled, nodding. I can fly anything. Hand in hand, the two turned and moved quickly away, leaving Devry lying on the cold metal floor. He heard their retreating footsteps and the silence that followed as they disappeared. Devery shivered as the heat drained from his body, his anger at Stith dissipating with each passing moment. The world faded to a pinprick of light. His breathing slowed, shallow breaths. His heart's beats thumped in his head, the time between beats increasing with each pump. Darkness grew, consuming the light, and Commander Devery fell into the pit of death. Chapter 18 Mac felt a queasy, uneasy feeling as he and Serena moved through the empty corridors of the Extrenzi. The near hit of Devry's bolt started it. He could still feel the heat of the energy beam on his skin. He rubbed a spot on his right shoulder, the closest point of near impact. He shivered at the thought of dying at the hands of the blue alien. The empty passageways added to the feeling. He mumbled, Where is everyone? So low that Serena could not hear. He did not want to upset her. He stole a glance. She's been through enough. The tour through the ship taught him enough of their corridor marking system that he felt confident they headed in the right direction. But the uneasy feeling persisted. He knew they were being watched. Mac glanced up and down the corridor, but saw no one or no thing. No cameras tracked their progress. No computer terminal monitored their presence. The ship appeared abandoned. But Mac knew better. He recognized the Belega word for ship and picked up the pace. Serena matched him stride for stride. The two arrived at the same Duraglass viewing area where Devry's ship landed only hours before. The bay doors sat closed. The sprawling complex appeared empty. Mac slowly scanned the area, his head moving left to right as he surveyed every nook and cranny. There, a small flash of light near one of the ships under repair. He stared intently and saw another small flare. A welder. Someone's working. The sight of someone calmed his fears, killing the thoughts that the entire ship lay in wait to ambush him. Mac tugged Stith's keycard from his trouser pocket and waved it in front of the door scanner. The mechanism beeped and the door silently slid open. He peered through the hatch, confirmed that the coast was clear, and motioned to Serena. Let's go. Crouching, he quickly moved to the shadow of a nearby shuttle, his pistol leading the way. He winced at the echo of his footsteps in the cavernous hangar. His eyes continuously scanned the area, sure that someone heard his footfalls. No one raised an alarm. The two stayed in the shadows of the bulkhead as long as they could, traversing the left side of the hangar. Mac brought the two to a halt directly across from Devry's shuttle the extended ramp and open hatch inviting. His position put the ship directly between the two humans and the Belega work crew on the opposite side of the hangar. Mac inhaled, held it, and exhaled, calming his nerves. He could not shake the feeling that eyes watched him. He gripped Serena's hand, her warmth reassuring. Nodding to himself, he released her hand, said, Let's go, and moved toward the shuttle. The two crossed the dozen meters without incident both running up the ramp without hesitation. Mac stopped at the top of the ramp, the pistol moving with his eyes as he scanned the ship's interior. 
The small eight-person shuttle lay empty, its systems blinking infrequently in standby mode. He touched her hand again and gently pulled her toward the cockpit. Sit there. He indicated the co-pilot's chair as he sat the pistol on the control console and slid into the pilot's seat. His heart pounded and sweat streamed down his face. He felt a sense of relief as he sat down, pulled the seat forward, and touched the controls. His relief turned to confusion as his eyes studied the controls. He reached out, his fingers hovering over a button to his right. He pulled his hand back, reached for another series of buttons, and stopped. He shook his head. You can't fly it, can you? Serena asked. It's in Belega, Mac replied, his voice admitting defeat. What were you expecting? Stay here he said, sliding the seat back and standing. He grabbed the pistol off the console. I'll be right back. Wait, where? Serena began, but Mac disappeared. She felt his footfalls vibrate through the ship and down the ramp. She turned, staring out the glass canopy at the open hangar. The ships she recognized, shuttles like the one she sat in, occupied the majority of the space. A few larger vessels sat in two rows near the center of the cavernous room. A handful of ships under repair sat off to the far side of the hangar. She watched as Mac moved quietly from ship to ship, hugging the body of each vessel, staying in shadows as much as he could. The dim overhead lights provided extra cover as he moved. Mac headed for the mechanics, working on the damaged craft. He disappeared from view, and Serena sat back, fear creeping up her spine. She moved from the seat and sat on the floor, out of sight. Her body shook with anticipation. She jumped at every sound that echoed in the landing bay. She felt the shuttle shudder. The vibrations doubled, and she knew two people had boarded the ship. She sat up, peeking out of the canopy. Nothing moved. She turned her head back to the main part of the shuttle as the ramp's mechanical whir filled the air. Serena returned to the floor, curled into a ball, and wedged herself as far as she could underneath the console. She pulled the seat forward, hiding. She swallowed a lump in her throat, fear pumping her heart rapidly. Serena! Mac hissed. Mac! she exclaimed, pushing the seat back and bounding from her hiding place. She leapt into his arms. Where did you go? Why did you leave me? It's okay, he replied, pushing her back into the co-pilot's chair. I had to find someone to fly the ship, he motioned behind him. This young officer kindly volunteered to get us out of here. I will not, the Belega replied. The alien rubbed his neck. Unless you want me to teach you the real meaning of pain and fear, Serena watched Mac grab the alien by the back of the neck and push him toward the unoccupied seat. Then you will do what I ask. You will kill me anyway, the alien responded, sitting. It's all your kind knows. Just get us out of here, Mac ordered. He took a position behind Serena's seat, his pistol pointing at the alien. You get me down on the ground in one piece, and I promise that nothing will happen to you. Human promises, they mean nothing. Mine do, Mac countered, moving the pistol barrel to touch the alien's forehead. For instance, if you don't fly me out of here, I promise to make your death long and painful. Mac saw the alien gulp. The Belega turned and flipped two switches. The shuttle hummed to life. An easy ride, Mac warned. The overseer's hands flew over the controls. The hangar bay doors opened, and the alien shuttle left the extrinsy. Sub-Lieutenant Stith sat in the command chair on the bridge. Large purple bruises circled his eyes. Lacerations crisscrossed his face. Swelling closed his left eye to a slit. He licked his thin blue lips, tasting blood from a split on his upper lip. Two medics, one on either side, carefully wiped the blood from his face with a cloth and applied bandages to the larger of the cuts on his face. Stith ignored them and the pain as he replayed a hologram of the shootout in the corridor. The second unit director, a female lieutenant with large pouty lips and an attention-grabbing waistline, issued orders editing the scene. As he watched, the holographic energy bolts slowed, and the camera angle changed to show the near hit on Mac. The changes made, she reran the scene. Take out where he mentions my name, Stith muttered through his cracked lips. He winced at the pain and then pushed it out of his mind. This is what I've been waiting for. 
The lieutenant acknowledged and continued editing. Stith turned to another bridge officer. Where are they now? The movement shifted his ribs, sending a wave of nausea through his system. He choked it down with considerable effort. They have just entered the bay, the officer replied. He cocked his head. Sir, they used your pass key. Stolen, Stith nodded and turned his attention back to the female lieutenant. Finish your edits on the shootout, he ordered, but go live to the bay. Let the viewers see it as it happens. Sir, she acknowledged, and the main screen shifted from a view of the planet to the bay, centered on Devry's ship. The murmuring and normal conversation on the bridge subsided as all eyes stared at the live feed from the landing bay. Muted conversation resumed as Mac emerged from the shuttle. Stith watched the human move from ship to ship, staying hidden as he stalked toward an unaware maintenance worker. He grabbed the belega from behind in a chokehold. The worker dropped his torch, reaching for the arm around his throat. His struggles subsided as the hold rendered him unconscious. The bearded human bent to pick up the overseer when a voice called out. Bortle, the voice said. Have you finished with that stabilizer yet? Mac dropped the worker on the floor and drew a pistol from his waistband as another belega entered through a side door near the maintenance area. This one wore the traditional dark blue uniform, not the black coveralls of the maintenance team. The crewman stopped, his eyes bulging at the sight of the human. He turned to run, but the human was faster. Mac grabbed the alien by the neck, slamming the belega against the bulkhead. He touched the barrel of his pistol to the alien's temple. Are you a pilot? The crewman nodded. Mac nodded his head toward Devry's shuttle. Then you're going to fly me out of here. The alien shook his head despite Mac's hand on his throat. I'll make you famous, Mac stated. He released the alien and pointed toward the shuttle. Move. The two moved quickly back to the shuttle. Shadows moved within the cockpit, dark silhouettes behind the glass. The bay doors opened and the ship lifted. It left the hangar, disappearing from view toward the planet. Exterior cameras picked up the vessel, tracking it until it became a streak of fire across the atmosphere. Stith smiled, the motion cracking his lips. Is the shootout ready? Yes, sir, the female lieutenant replied. She crossed the bridge to stand before him. He caught a whiff of her perfume and realized that Devry had one thing right, the women. That would be the only thing he would imitate from his dead commander. The narrator just finished the lead-in, she reported. Her face contorted in concern as her eyes studied his injuries. We are ready when you are. Sub-Lieutenant, another voice called from his right. The ratings just went up two points, and command is on the line. They want to speak with Commander Devry. Stith smiled. Tell them to watch their monitors. He nodded to the female lieutenant. Play the footage. The main screen changed again, this time showing a still shot of Stith lying on the floor. Blood pooled around his head, his face a mask of bruises and cuts. How did the human escape? asked the bass voice. Sub-Lieutenant Stith, second in command, was the animal's first victim. The human beat him and left him for dead. The image shifted to a still frame of Devry exiting his quarters, the human female in tow. The feral human then set his sights on fleet commander Devry. We can only surmise the primitive was responding to some instinct to save his mate. Let's watch what happened. Stith watched, as did everyone else present, even though he had already seen it a dozen times. The action began. Gunfire erupted. The scene slowed at the appropriate times, adding to the suspense as an energy bolt knocked the pistol from the human's hand, the second shot barely missing his head. Stith smiled as the human's return fire found its mark, sending Devry to the cold deck. I wish I could have been the one to pull the trigger. The scene ended with the two humans hugging as Devry lay bleeding on the floor. They moved off, out of the scene, and the camera moved in for a close-up on Commander Devry. Audio of dual heartbeats filled the air, each beat slowing. The audio ended as Devry exhaled his last breath. Perfect. Lieutenant, Stith addressed the female, I'm promoting you to first director. Thank you, sir. Command is on the line, the comms officer called again. They say, congratulations, Commander Stith. The ratings just jumped ten points. 
The Belega pilot dropped the shuttle through the atmosphere a little quicker than Mac liked. The bumpy ride reminded him of the crash weeks earlier, and he gripped the back of Serena's chair with white knuckles. Serena held onto her seat harness with both hands as turbulence bounced the small ship. Mac watched the pilot, learning the controls as the alien flew the craft. He discerned engine power, pitch and yaw, steering, and as they leveled out, atmospheric and directional controls. By the time the shuttle roared over the countryside, Mac had a pretty good idea of how to fly the alien ship. He relaxed his grip on the seat. Mac could not shake the feeling that they were being watched. He scanned the console, looking for any indication of a camera, but found nothing. He glimpsed the airspeed and altitude, noting that they flew north, having dropped into orbit along the equator. A flash of light in the distance drew his eyes beyond the glass canopy. Pristine forest stretched to the horizon on his left. The ship flew over a series of small lakes and snaking rivers, the blue water sparkling in the afternoon sun. Distant mountains to his right stretched toward the sky, white snow reflecting the light. The clear afternoon sky beckoned to the pilot, and he longed for his ship again. The sunlight glinted off something in the distance again. Bank right, Mac ordered the pilot, his eyes zeroing in on the source of the reflection. Your village is straight ahead, the Belega protested. Mac touched his pistol to the alien's ear. And I said bank right. I've watched you fly this thing. I think I can do it if you'd like to get out. The shuttle banked right, heading toward the edge of the forest atop a steep rise. A lake extended into the distance, with several winding tributaries stretching across a wide plain. Another glint of light, and Mac saw a form take shape in the distance. It sat in the center of a wide open field, stretching upward for several stories. Small buildings lay scattered about the field surrounding the tower. Slow down, Mac ordered, leaning forward to get a better look. The ship slowed, giving Mac a long look at the facility. A three-story building sat in the center of a fenced compound. A small, single-story building occupied each corner of the perimeter. Large parabolic antennas sat on top of the main building. The hilltop forest flanked the facility to the west. Small clearings lay sporadically through the forest that surrounded the facility on the other three sides. The transmitter for the games? he inquired, not really expecting an answer. Yes, human, the pilot said, banking away from the facility. Take us in, Mac ordered. He watched the tower disappear behind the ship. Turn around! Go back! I cannot, the Belega replied, a hint of worry in his voice. All transmitters are protected by anti-aircraft batteries. Any closer and we will be shot down. Automated? The Belega nodded, banking the ship to the left and returning them on course for the Tuscara village. But it can be shut down manually. Mac stared out of the canopy, watching the terrain below. How far to the village? Eight minutes. Distance? Nine durelets. English, Mac scoffed. About twenty miles. Mac reached forward and flipped a switch on the console. A three-dimensional representation of the landscape appeared between the pilot and Serena, who sat quietly, watching the world below. Mac adjusted the view, zooming out, until he found the setting he wanted. He touched the hologram, pointing to a field near the village. Put us down there, Mac ordered. Once we're off, you are free to leave. Mac's eyes scanned the console again, but still could not see a camera. Go tell your story. Enjoy your fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes? Of fame. Mac shook his head. Never mind. He looked around the cockpit. Where is your first aid kit? The Belega offered a confused look. Medical kit, Mac clarified. The alien pointed to a small compartment behind Serena. Mac bent down, opened a small door, and rummaged in the storage bin. He found a med kit, two emergency ration meals, a pistol, and two additional power packs. He took everything, handing the meals and medical kit to Serena. He tucked the second pistol and power packs in his waistband. The ship dropped lower, skimming the forest. Serena gripped her harness, her eyes constantly scanning the landscape. Mac watched the treetops, again wishing for a ship of his own. He looked at the controls of the ship and nodded to himself. Next time. The forest ended, giving way to open fields. The massive lake north of the Tuscara village took shape, and Mac felt a sense of relief. 
the Belega pilot slowed, circled the field indicated by Mac, and sat the shuttle down with barely a bump. The engines revved down, and the pilot turned to look at Mac. Serena, Mac said. Go open the hatch. He handed her Stith's code key. Use this. I'll be right behind you. The woman unbuckled and left the cockpit without a word. Mac watched her leave, waited until she was out of sight, and pointed his pistol at the alien's head. I knew it, the Belega spat. Lying humans. Where are the weapons controls? Mac asked, ignoring the quip. The alien sat up straight at the question, stunned. He eyed Mac for a moment before silently pointing to a series of buttons near the center of the console. Mac raised the pistol and fired. The energy bolt sliced through the weapon system with a flash of purple light. The pilot recoiled, wincing from a shower of sparks. Mac fired twice more, melting the metal to slag. Now you can't take off and shoot at us. Mac smiled. Go home. I'm sure Stith will want to talk to you. Do me a favor? The Belega stared at the human. Give him my regards. With a laugh, Mac turned and left the cockpit, hustled through the main cabin, and bounded down the ramp. He grabbed Serena's hand and led her away from the ship. The alien shuttle lifted in a cloud of dust and a maelstrom of flying grass. The pilot pushed the throttle forward, the engines roared, and the spaceship rocketed straight up. It disappeared in a matter of seconds, the sound of the engines echoing in the clear afternoon. Come on, Max said, tugging on Serena's hand. We need to get back to the village. Why? We are free. The overseers will come back, Mac replied, and when they do, we need to be ready. Ready for what? Mac looked at the sky. The feeling of being watched still haunted him. He shook the feeling away, walking briskly toward the distant village. He could see the smoke from the cookeries in the distance. Ready for what? she repeated. For war, Mac responded, sadness in his voice. He lowered his head as he walked, staring at the knee-high grassland. For war. Chapter 19 Welcoming shouts greeted Mac and Serena at the edge of the Tuscara village. Men and women left the adobe huts on the run, crowding and shouting at the two as they strolled past the barely toiled fields, the neglected farmland, and the empty horse pens. Water jugs were offered and accepted. Mac and Serena drank heartily after their mile or so walk. Cook fire smoke drifted lazily into the air, adding to an increasingly cloudy early afternoon sky. Mac saw rain in the distance. A cool breeze blew from the west, and several Tuscara wore extra clothing, covering their arms and legs. The crowd assaulted Serena and Mac with questions, the din of noise rising with each speaker. Mac passed back an empty water bladder and stood on his toes, looking over the majority of the crowd, his eyes searching the mass of humans. He held up his hands, calling for silence. The noise subsided. Mac saw eyes hungry for information and full of fear. Where is Chief Borda? he asked. He is in conference, a large warrior answered. He stood taller than Mac, with broad shoulders and pale scars that stood out on his tan skin. Mac stroked his beard, staring at the man. His eyes narrowed. I don't think we've met. I'm Mac. Gillen, the warrior replied. Of the Kaya. Kaya? Serena shrieked, taking a step back. Chief Daran is meeting with Chief Borda about our common enemy, Gillen offered, showing his empty hands. Where are they? Mac asked, his hand resting on the butt of the energy pistol tucked into his waistband. This way, the warrior said, motioning for the two to follow him. Gillen led the way through the village. Serena and Mac followed a few steps behind. The murmuring rose in volume as the crowd followed them to the center of the village. Mac ignored those behind him, concentrating on the two men standing in the center of the ring of cook fires. Chief Borda and his son, Chief Duran, stood side by side, staring at Mac and Serena. Joy filled Borda's face as he saw his daughter. He ran to the woman and lifted her off the ground in a bone-crushing hug. He released her, turned to Mac, and wrapped him in a bear hug. Mac gasped for air as Borda squeezed. The crowd went silent, watching the chief. Thank you, Mac, the older chief offered, letting go. When I heard that the overseers took her, I feared I would not see her again. You have done me a great service. I am in your debt. We are even, Mac nodded, waving off the words. 
She saved me when I first arrived. He shifted his gaze to Duran, standing a few meters away, hands folded in front of him. He stared at the ground, avoiding eye contact. Tell me, Chief, what is going on here? He asked with a nod toward Duran. Duran approached me two days ago, after her capture, Borda explained. He wants to fight the overseers. Good. Mac raised his voice so that everyone could hear. Their commander, Devry, is dead. I... Dead? Duran spoke up for the first time. He approached Mac and Serena, nodding to his sister. I did not... Serena slapped him, the sound echoing in the air. You offered me to Phelan, she yelled. Mac grabbed her, holding her arms and pulling her away from her brother. You did nothing while the overseers took me. I... Duran began, then stopped. He exhaled slowly, then stared at Mac. You killed Devry? Mac nodded, still holding the struggling Serena. The overseers will kill us all, Duran spat. They will seek revenge from the death of their chief. I doubt it, Mac said. At least not yet. He turned to Borda and lowered his voice. We need to talk quietly. Yes, Borda said. He looked skyward. Clouds now covered the sky. A gentle mist filled the air. Lightning flashed in the distance, the sound of thunder following several seconds later. We will meet in my hut, he announced, in one hour. The chief turned his attention to the villagers. Gather everything and get inside. We will talk after the storm. This way, he said, motioning toward his hut. Mac shook his head, holding up the alien medical kit. Not yet. I need to see some mish. I gave him the medicine, Borda said, as you instructed. Mac knelt beside Samish, the young warrior lying pale and sweaty on his bed. Serena knelt beside him, her face a mask of concern, as she gingerly pulled back the animal hide blanket covering the boy. Her face blanched as she saw the purple, swollen wound on the boy's left side. Both shots? Borda nodded his head. Yes, I... I do not think it worked. Gillen guarded the doorway, his back to the inside of the hut. A light rain beat steadily upon the thatch roof. Duran stood beside Borda, the Kaya chief's face a careful look of concern. One other person, the female villager who assisted Borda with the shots two days earlier, stood on the far side of the bed. Streaks of tears ran down her dirty cheeks. Mac reached out and carefully touched the wound. Samish grumbled and winced, but did not awaken. Serena pulled Mac's hand away, but he resisted and probed the boy's side again. He offered a smile. It worked more than you know. Those shots were antibiotics. He glanced at Borda and saw confusion. They fight infection. He addressed Serena. What do you normally do when someone's bleeding on the inside? I will gather what we need, she said, and then to the young woman, you have been with Samish the whole time? The young woman nodded. Come, you will assist me. I will show you the way of healing. Gillen moved aside as the two women left, then returned to his position guarding the door. Mac stood, stretched, and turned to look at the two chiefs. In the dim light, the two resembled each other, one a younger version of the other. Without preamble, Mac told them of his capture, interrogation, and escape. The two stood quietly, listening, and occasionally exchanging glances. And this stith simply let you go? Duran asked, doubt in his voice. For the ratings, Mac replied, knowing that neither man could wrap his head around the fact that their lives were nothing but an entertainment show for millions of aliens scattered across the galaxy. Serena returned, soaking wet, the young woman in tow. Both carried an armful of herbs, plants, and roots, the two women shook off the rain, moved to the corner near the foot of Sam's bed, and continued their preparations. Mac took a breath. There is more. You and I are from the same place, just, just a different time. Mac squatted, using his finger to doodle in the dirt while he spoke. While I had Stith's key card, I accessed the computer on their ship. He glanced up, realized he had lost them, and started over. After I beat Stith, I took his access card. Using that, I researched the Harvest Day game. I wanted to confirm a few things. 
And? Borda asked, crouching to look at Mac. You are descendants of a great Indian tribe on my planet, the Iroquois. There were originally many tribes, the Cayuga, Cherokee, Huron, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, and the Tuscarora. Each name brought a hint of recognition to Borda's eyes. The Kaya, the Key, the Auk, the Dega, the Neka, and the Tuscara, all of the tribes we have fought over the years. He looked into Mac's eyes, and Mac saw pain and anger. We have been killing our own kind for the overseers and their... their show, Mac finished. Yes. Samish groaned, and Mac turned to see Serena applying a green paste to the area around the boy's wound. The smell of freshly cut grass touched his nostrils as Sam moaned again. Mac turned away. The Iroquois Indian tribes were situated around the Great Lakes of North America, Mac continued. I grew up a few miles from them in Pennsylvania. The Belega brought you here instead of killing you when they destroyed Earth, he continued as he shook his head. I don't know if they did you a kindness or just prolonged the inevitable. Earth? Serena repeated. You are from Earth? We all are, Mac affirmed, looking over his shoulder at the woman. The Belega, the overseers, brought you here almost 300 years ago when they destroyed Earth. Serena's face warped into confusion, and she looked toward her father. The prophecy, she muttered. Mac followed her gaze to Borda, who nodded his head slowly. The prophecy. What? Mac asked. The prophecy speaks of a man that will lead the Tuscara to victory against their enemies. Chief Borda looked Mac in the eyes. The man will be a stranger with strange ways, but will hold a common ancestry with the Tuscara. Yes, you think I'm that man, Mac nodded. You've already told me that. Borda pointed toward the dirt. These great lakes, can you draw them? Mac thought for a moment, remembering his geography. He nodded. Then do. Mac drew a rough outline of the great lakes and the dirt with his finger. The drawing, crude by any standard, resembled a tortured octopus to Mac, but he was a pilot, not an artist. He sat back on his heels and pointed. That's close. Borda, Duran, and Serena exchanged glances. This, Borda pointed. These are your lakes? Mac nodded. This one, here, Borda pointed. This one is called Lake Erie, Mac replied. It's the closest one to where I grew up. We call it Re, Duran interjected, speaking for the first time, his voice flat and even. It is the lake you see to the north of us. Mac stared at Duran, then at Borda. Chills covered his body. But the continents, they're different here. There are stories, Borda nodded, his eyes unfocused as he searched his memory. Stories of great cities, of a united humanity. When the aliens attacked, many cities were destroyed. Mac nodded his voice far away. They laid waste to the earth. The land masses changed under the bombardment. He visualized the planet from the observation point. Florida flooded. California, the San Andreas Fault. Washington, the political power. They destroyed it all. Realization hit him. I'm... I'm home? The prophecy says that the common ancestry will unite the ancient tribes, Borda nodded. The ancient tribes of the Key will rise up and take back their ancient home. Earth, Serena finished. The rain continued into the night, soaking the ground and the roofs of the adobe huts in the Tuscara village. The steady drip of water courtesy of a small hole in the thatch roof, created an almost hypnotic effect on Mac. He lay on his back, Serena curled next to him, her head on his chest. Her rhythmic breathing told him she slept peacefully. He smiled and rubbed her back softly. Jumbled thoughts kept him awake, flashbacks of his interrogation, the history lesson from Stith, the escape from the ship, all mixed into a blur in his mind. The activity prevented sleep, despite his exhaustion from those very events. Mac's thoughts turned to the upcoming battle. 
He knew the Iroquois as fierce warriors, but how would they fare against a technological enemy that wanted them extinct? Simply, they could not win, and they knew it. Borda, Duran, and the rest looked to Mac, the prophecy, for their salvation. He shook his head. I can't even save myself. The moment of self-pity brought his thoughts back to his capture 300 years earlier. According to Stith, when the Earth counterattacked, his ship was tossed into space. If things went as Stith said, which Mac doubted, then his ship must have orbited the solar system, returning to Earth 300 years later. Was that possible, he thought? The trajectory would have to be perfect. Without a computer, there's no way to calculate it. But the Belega did not destroy the Earth. Despite everything, Mac was home. That thought made him smile, and he concentrated on that thought, letting the peace of it calm his jumbled thoughts. With Serena nestled beside him, and happy thoughts in his mind, he drifted to sleep. Chapter 20 Mac rose early the next morning, checked on Samish, and found the boy sleeping peacefully. Careful not to wake Serena, he left the adobe hut. The yellow sun rose on a clear sky, the adobe huts casting long shadows in the early morning sunlight. Mac raised his left hand, blinking away the harsh light. Tuscara villagers flitted about the compound, stoking cook fires and shoring up any damage from the range during the night. The sun's warmth flowed through the air, forming a thin haze and a humid, sticky morning. Mac closed his eyes and let the sun warm his skin. His sun, Earth's sun. He spread his arms, the animal hide, sleeveless shirt, and trousers no longer itchy. He smiled, opened his eyes, and wandered around the village. The smell of the fires filled the air, the promise of the morning meal making his stomach growl. Small puddles of water lay everywhere, and Mac carefully stepped over them. The Tuscara appeared to be in good spirits. Greetings replaced muffled conversations as Mac walked. He found Chief Borda standing on a rise on the eastern perimeter, watching the sunrise. The big Indian looked tired, with slumped shoulders and a frown on his face. The yellow headband he wore contrasted his dark skin, almost reflecting the early morning sun. The two exchanged greetings and then stood quietly, watching the sun continue its journey into the morning sky. Thank you. Borda broke the silence, his voice low. Thank you for bringing Serena back to me. You're welcome, Max said, his mind spinning, pondering if he should say more. His mouth proceeded before his brain. I am very fond of your daughter. I would risk anything to save her. Borda snorted. This I know. What's wrong, Chief? I owe you much, Borda replied, turning slightly to face Mac. Bags hung below the Indian's eyes, his wrinkled crow's feet more pronounced than a few weeks earlier. And that makes what I have to do this morning even harder. And that is? Mac inquired, genuinely curious. A fleeting thought of Borda handing him over to the Belega passed through his mind, quickly dismissed. I am making Duran war master of the new Iroquois nation, Borda continued. You have done much for my people, but you are not Tuscara. I cannot give you that honor. I was not expecting you to, Mac countered. The run is headstrong, Borda acknowledged, shuffling his feet on the wet ground. Once I make him war master, he may not listen to anything you have to say. He turned to fully face Mac. You have fought the overseers up close. You must add your input to any plan. Mac nodded and turned to face the village. Most everyone appeared awake now, the village center a bustle of activity. He spied Serena heading back to the village from the north, more plants and roots in her arms. I can't go home, he said, watching her disappear into one of the mud huts. I would like to make a home with the Tuscara. Borda turned toward the west, toward the Tuscara village. He nodded. Yes. I would like that as well. Silence returned as the two men stared at the village, the sun rising to their backs. It is time for the announcement. Come, Borda said, stepping off the small rise. 
Let us eat hearty and give the Iroquois a reason to live. They returned to the village in silence. Duran and Serena greeted them, and the four moved together to the closest cook fire. Mac ate a breakfast of meat and fruit with Serena seated beside him. She wore a light summer dress, the thin fabric ruffling in the gentle breeze. Duran, normally quiet and brooding, talked constantly. Mac found it a pleasant change and hoped the upcoming announcement would solidify the young man's mood. Breakfast ended, and the villagers gathered around the chief, Borda's announcement, naming Duran as the war master. A raucous cheer spread through the Tuscara. Duran accepted the position, kneeling before his father. He removed his shirt, donning an ornately decorated jacket. A mane of wolf fur trailed down the back. Red, blue, and green stripes ran diagonally from the tuft of hair. Duran stood and ordered the creation of a war council to plan their attack on the overseers. He named four warriors, two Kaya and two Tuscara, to the council. A murmur ripped through the gathered crowd, and they turned to look at Mac, noting his name was not on the list. He is not Iroquois, Duran said. Mac smiled at how close Borda had been to calling the reaction. He is a great warrior, but I will not allow him to plan the fate of my people. The murmurs persisted, and Borda stepped forward, reclaiming the position of chief. Mac has made a deep impression on us in a short time. He has asked to stay with the Tuscara, to make his home with us. I have granted that wish. Borda offered a tired smile. Because of his knowledge of the overseers, he will advise me just as Duran will. Duran whirled on his father. You will take his advice over mine? I will take both and make the decision that is best for the Tuscara, Borda scoffed, anger touching his voice. And the Kaya, he added. We must fight together, or we will all die. Borda turned to address the villagers. Return to your normal routine, he said. Work the fields until the time comes to train for battle. The crowd nodded and began to disperse. He turned to Duran. Convene your council. Form your plan. Duran turned and stalked away, four warriors in tow. Mac led Serena by the hand to stand beside the chief, watching the war master disappear into an adobe hut. How is Samish? Borda asked his daughter. Better, she nodded. The medicine provided by Mac kept him from getting worse. The plants and herbs have begun the healing process. He will be fine in a few weeks. Stay with him, the chief ordered, and gather what you need. We can expect more wounded once the battle begins. The woman nodded. Mac felt her squeeze his hand before she turned and walked away. Duran is not pleased that I am your advisor, Mac stated. Borda grimaced sadly. He will want to confront them head-on, sacrificing many to s Iroquois. We, I, cannot allow that. He looked at Mac with tired eyes. We need another way. Mac smiled. I have a few ideas that will catch the Belega off guard. I think it's time they learned how the Iroquois fought centuries ago. Duran snarled hurling a clay pot across the adobe hut. It shattered against the wall, leaving an indent in the mud surface. His war committee stood around a large table that almost filled the hut. A hasty representation of the Tuscara and Kaya villages covered the surface, a large open space representing the battlefield between them. Duran pointed at the center of the table. We stand our ground, Duran uttered through clenched teeth. The overseers will come, yes, and we will meet them in the center of the field. He looked around the cramped adobe hut and longed for his own wooden building in the Kaya village. Their weapons, Gillen protested. They're flying machines. They will slaughter us. Duran shook his head, feeling the fatigue from hours of arguing battle strategies. No, you heard the outsider. He could not bear to say his name or think of the man's relationship with his sister. They want the battle to linger. No, no, they will come to us, and we will slaughter them. Gillen opened his mouth to say something, then closed it and remained silent. He nodded his agreement. Duran met the gaze of the rest, each warrior 
averted their eyes, acquiescing to the war master. The hour is late, he finally said. Get rest. We will finalize the plan tomorrow. Without another word, Duran left the hut. The cool night air chilled him, revitalizing his energy, if only for a few minutes. The village cook fires, fully ablaze when he entered the hut hours before, lay dying. He stared, his tired eyes hypnotized by their glowing embers. A gust of wind broke the trance, and he looked skyward. A sliver of the crescent moon peeked out from a cloud, adding a dash of light to the night. Alone for the first time in days, Duran headed west out of the village. The chirp of crickets reached out to him. The gentle ripple of the calf-high grass in the wind soothed his tired soul. A prairie mouse, or some other small rodent, scurried away from him, but nothing else stirred in the night. Thoughts of the battle plan filled his mind, interrupting the tranquil night. He tried to push them away, but anticipating how the overseers would react continually plagued him. A distant buzz made him pause, and he looked into the starry sky, the battle plan momentarily forgotten. He saw nothing, but knew that they were watching. He scanned his surroundings and realized he had walked for several miles. He looked west, then east, then west again. He frowned, noting he stood closer to the Kaya camp than the Tuscara village. The buzzing disappeared, and Duran looked skyward again. The stars stared back, unblinking. Then he saw it. One of the lights in the sky moved, disappearing over the horizon. He exhaled a long, slow breath, and began walking toward the Kaya encampment, his legs moving seemingly on their own. His eyes continued to stare into the night sky, looking for more alien lights. He stumbled, nearly falling. He stopped and regained his balance. He inhaled sharply, held it, and listened. The distinct rumble of overseer engines grew in the distance. Duran ran. His arms and legs pumped as adrenaline flowed. He stole a glance behind him and saw a flashing strobe on the horizon growing larger. He stumbled, fell, rolled, and rose to his feet in one motion. He faced forward and ran harder. An overseer ship roared overhead, barely a dozen yards above him. The heat from the engine exhaust washed over him. The thrust picked him up and threw him backwards. He rolled twice, then rose to a knee, panting and gulping for air. He felt wet liquid running down his face, reached up, and touched his left temple. Even in the darkness, he could see the blood on his fingers. The ship banked around, braked, and came to rest a short distance in front of him. The engines did not power down as Duran expected. The hatch opened, spilling light onto the prairie, and three blue aliens dropped to the ground, weapons raised. The three aliens fanned out in a rough semicircle surrounding him. Duran stood, still gasping for air. He looked at the three aliens, weighing his options. No matter what he did... He knew that death waited. His lips curled into a sly smirk as the alien on his left stepped toward him. He would die fighting. The Iroquois war master lashed out, punching the alien in the throat with his fist. The overseer's scream cut off before it could begin as Duran crushed his windpipe. The Iroquois warrior moved behind the alien, using him as a shield against the other two. Duran found the grip of the rifle hanging from the alien's harness and raised the weapon toward the nearest overseer. Dull green beams lashed out, lighting the field in a series of strobes. Duran screamed as electricity engulfed his body. His finger twitched, firing a green energy beam harmlessly into the dirt at his feet. His scream stopped abruptly as his body shut down. His knees buckled and he fell, the dying belega falling on top of him. Duran gasped for breath under the weight of the alien. Contact Commander Stith, he heard one of the overseers say. The world grew black, and the voice faded. Tell him we have the war master. Darkness greeted him as Duran slowly opened his eyes. He saw nothing in the pitch black. His parched throat screamed for water. His muscles ached from the stun bolts. Warm air weighed heavily on his lungs. Sweat dripped down his face, stinging his eyes. He blinked and reached up to wipe his forehead. He could not move. Tight leather restraints bound him. He struggled against the straps that held him to a chair, pinning his arms and legs to the cool metal. 
Dozens of pinpoints of light sprang to life in the distance, and he froze. The lights danced around him in mesmerizing patterns, but their low light revealed little of the room. He gulped down his fear as the lights swarmed him. He jumped as a light mist touched his skin, adding humidity to the already hot room. Where am I? he screamed, his raspy voice echoing in the darkness. He yelled again, but only heard the sound of his own voice echoing around the room. The effort only made his dry throat sore. You are aboard my ship, someone answered. The booming voice came from everywhere and nowhere. The disembodied sound filled Duran with fear. I'm going to ask you a few questions you are going to answer. Duran cursed in his native language, a long, complex string of expletives that brought into question the speaker's ancestry, intelligence, and flexibility. That was impressive, the voice replied, full of humor. I will rerun this scene for days, translating that for the audience. Silence filled the room as the speaker paused. Ratings just went up another two points. Excellent. Who are you? Duran demanded, struggling against the straps. Where am I? I am Commander Stiff, Regional Director of the Earth and Executive Producer of Harvest Day, now the most popular game show in the Galactic Consortium. The voice replied proudly. And you are aboard my ship. What do you want? Information, Stith replied. I need to know what you are planning and where I can find Captain McMillan. You can have him. Duran spat, the hatred palpable. Thank you, that's quite generous, Stith replied. But I am afraid I will need more than that. Such as, what would you do if I sent troops into the Tuscara village? Duran sat quietly. He closed his eyes, listening to his pulse throb in his ears. Warmth invaded his body. The heat extended through his chest all the way down to his toes. His anger disappeared instantly replaced with intoxicated euphoria. He plopped his head backwards on the chair, his mouth open, his unseeing eyes staring at the lights dancing above his head. Warmaster? Stith asked. Can you hear me? Duran's slurred response sounded like a gurgle. Excellent, Stith replied. Now, please, tell me about any plans you have to defend your village against the Belega. The Tuscara villagers scattered at the sound of overseer engines. Men, women, and children ran, hiding in their adobe huts. They abandoned cook fires, leaving pots of stew and slabs of meat to burn. The elders and the boys too young to be warriors, who had been repairing rain-damaged roofs, dropped their tools. Sentries on the perimeter dropped to the ground. Only Chief Borda stood in the open, waiting for the overseers. The ship circled twice and then hovered over the village. It did not land. Curiosity overcame the fear, and tanned faces appeared in the doorways. Most every eye in the village stared at the alien ship as it sat suspended 100 meters above the Tuscara. The starboard side hatch opened just as two drones appeared, circling the ship before taking stationary positions. One hovered directly opposite the open hatch, the other above the ship, looking down at the village. Borda held his breath as he saw his son, Duran, step to the edge of the door. The war master staggered slightly, as if drunk, and waved. No, Borda muttered. No. People of the Iroquois Nation, this is Commander Stith of the Belega. A voice boomed from the ship. Pay close attention. This is what happens when you defy me. A bright purple energy beam sliced through Duran from behind, a flaming hole appearing in the warrior's chest. He screamed, the sound drowned out by the rumble of the ship's engines. He fell, his limp body landing like a sack of potatoes on the wet, muddy ground. Borda screamed, No! His anguished cry ended as his son hit the ground. I am offering you a choice, Stith's voice taunted. Hand Captain McMillan over to me and live. If you do not, I will reschedule your next harvest for two days from now. Turn him over or you have two days before the Kaya and the Tuscara battle to be the last tribe standing. 
The choice is yours. The drones dispersed, moving in a slow, clockwise circle, watching the village. The overseer ship rose, disappearing into the afternoon sky. Borda knelt in the mud, sobbing as he cradled the body of his oldest son. Chapter 21 The ratings are the highest of any show in ten seasons, the hologram figure said. Congratulations, Commander. Stith stood in the visual direction center aboard the Extrenzi, a dozen hologram screens flickering around him. Shadows flitted across his face from the constantly changing images, giving him a macabre look. Technicians stood or sat at terminals around the room, controlling camera drones scattered around the planet below. He nodded to the hologram. Thank you, Commissioner. We are very proud of the Harvest Day broadcast. You misunderstand, Commander. Harvest Day is now the highest rated show of all time, the hologram stated. Beings are talking about it throughout the galaxy. There is even talk of revamping the human population to carry it beyond this season. Stith remained silent. He already heard the rumors and voiced his opinion the day before to his commanding officer. The admiral simply shrugged and mentioned something about orders. Stith filed a report that morning, charging the humans to be a violent, deceitful race. He further stated that, with the arrival of Captain McMillan, they posed a threat to the Belega and their standing within the Galactic Consortium. His report went unread. Now, Stith talked with the Consortium Commissioner, the being in charge of all broadcasts in the galaxy. You don't agree with continuing the games? It is not my place, Stith stated carefully, knowing that he did voice his opinion in the unopened report. But if you are asking... I am? Then my recommendation would be to destroy every last human in the galaxy. We can replace them with the Moclear or the Scritch. But the humans, Commissioner, the humans are trouble we do not need. They did not hand over the new arrival? No, sir, Stith replied. He touched a button on the control panel beside him, and a holographic display of the Tuscara and Kaya villages replaced the commissioner. They are, in fact, massing, waiting for my forces to arrive. Have you dispatched your troops? Stith shook his head. No, I am letting the tension build. I was actually thinking of bombing them from orbit, then sending in a few squads to clean up the survivors. I do not like these humans, Stith declared with finality. Bombing them from orbit is the one thing you cannot do, Commander, the Commissioner stated, his image returning to stand before Stith. Commit your forces. Chase them. Make it exciting. Make it last. Our advertisers are paying four times the normal rate right now. Make it last, Commander. Stith looked at the hollow of the battlefield below. Two lines of Iroquois, all on horseback, stretched across the battlefield. A drone zoomed in, the close-up verifying that Borda sat out front, his long-handled tomahawk in his hands. Something about the formation did not sit well with Stith. Something is wrong. But he could not identify what gave him the feeling. Stith sighed. As you wish, Commissioner. Stith glanced at the chronograph on the side of the hologram. My forces will engage the humans in exactly twenty-two galactic standard minutes. Chief Borda sat atop his horse, the hot sun beating down upon him from a cloudless sky. He closed his eyes, relishing in the warmth of the light, wondering if it would be his last time to enjoy the sun's rays. He felt the horse shimmy beneath him, shaking its mane. He opened his eyes, staring at the empty land before him. The Iroquois chief had no time to grieve in the two days since Duran's death. Gillen, Bultry, and two others pulled him away from his son's body. Bultree escorted him to his hut, while Gillen and the others prepared Duran's body for a warrior's funeral. Mac and Serena, tears streaking down her face, met Borda inside his hut. Take care of him, Mac instructed Serena, nodding to the chief. Borda felt Mac's hands on his shoulder. With your permission, I will brief the plan we discussed. Borda vaguely remembered nodding before Serena wrapped a blanket around him, and the two wept. The funeral pyre lit the night that evening. Everyone in the village gathered around, watching as the flames reached for the clear skies. 
The pyre collapsed, sending a shower of sparks and embers into the air. The warriors remained, several adding wood to the fire, increasing the blaze, while most of the villagers left the ceremony. And, per Mac's plan, the old men, women, and children kept going, entering the darkness beyond the fire. Borda recalled watching Serena, escorted by two men carrying Samish, disappear into the night. By the time the fire died, only warriors remained in the village. They trained the next day in full view of the drones flying overhead. Over and over they performed the same maneuvers, their horses churning up the battlefield. As night fell, more warriors disappeared, per the plan. Now only Borda and twenty warriors, in two lines of ten, remained. The rest of the Iroquois nation lay in wait, far away from the battle. The hum of engines drew his eyes to the northeast. His eyes scanned the horizon as the sound grew louder. Movement caught his attention, and he saw them, three overseer craft. He hesitated. Part of him wanted to avenge Duran's death, here, now. His heart ached with the loss of his son. He wanted to feel the throat of an overseer in his hand, to crush the life out of an alien. But Mac's instructions were specific. His vengeance would have to wait. Scatter, Borda yelled, pulling the reins on his horse to his right. You know your tasks. Go. Go now. With that, he spurred the animal's flanks with his bare feet and let the horse carry him off the field of battle. Stith leaned forward in his seat, staring at a hologram of the battlefield. The Iroquois turned to run. His mouth opened, eyes wide with puzzlement. The battlefield emptied in a matter of moments, long before the first of the Belega ships could land. A nose camera from the lead ship showed the approach, the gentle bump as the ship touched down. The visual direction center quieted as everyone turned to watch the hologram. The deserted battleground mocked them. A beep drew Stith's attention, and he turned his head, even as his eyes stayed locked on the hologram. He quickly cut his eyes and felt a chill trickle down his spine. The ratings dropped. Not significantly, less than a point, but enough that he noticed. And if he noticed, then the consortium noticed. Stith's thoughts jumbled. What should I do? The most prevalent. Pursue them, he ordered, touching a button on the console next to where he sat. He sat back, fear tickling his spine. Chase them down and destroy them. He watched his ground troops split into four groups of eight and set out in pursuit of the Iroquois. The hologram showed clouds of dust in the distance, an easy trail to follow. He sat back and crossed his arms. Hatred toward the human astronaut consumed his soul. Sir, the female lieutenant reported, the ships want to know their orders. A slow smile crept across Stith's face. He issued his orders with great pleasure and watched as the ships rose to carry out the directive. He switched the view to a drone a quarter mile from the Tuscara village and waited. Two Belega ships banked sharply from the north, leveled off, and opened fire on the collection of adobe and thatch huts. Bright blue energy beams split the sunny afternoon, flashing from the heavens. The outermost huts exploded, the hardened mud erupting in fire. Debris rained down. The thatch roofs burst into flame, soaring dozens of yards into the air. The dry wood and leaves burned quickly, leaving little to land back on the earth. The ships disappeared to the south, turned, and made another run. The southernmost huts erupted under the onslaught, raining debris across the landscape. The ships turned and continued the attack. The third ship disappeared to the west, chasing Chief Borda. Dispatch two more ships to the Kaya village. I want it destroyed, Stith ordered, watching the ratings. As he hoped, they rose a point. Prepare an invasion force, Stith said calmly. They may run, but we will find them and kill them. I can still go out on top. Track the humans, find them, and kill them. The Belega ship banked sharply to the left and commenced its sixth attack run on the Tuscara village. The pilot gripped the controls lightly, enjoying the stomach-churning sensation as the aircraft dropped toward the burning huts. She pulled the trigger, 
and felt the gentle vibration as the energy cannons discharged. She smirked as the blue energy bolts swept the ground, destroying everything in their path. A gentle nudge of the controls, and the ship lifted, pulling away. Nothing stood in the village. Every hut lay in shambles, the ground churned up by the intense bursts of energy. Fires raged as thatch roofs and grass burned, belching dark smoke into the otherwise clear sky. The overseer banked to her right, concentrating her fire on the fertile farmland to the north of the village. She touched the firing stud on her controls and watched the energy beams tear up the ground, destroying the planted crops. She leveled off, flying over the great lake that stretched to the horizon. Unit 4, do you copy? Unit 4, she replied, pushing the control system to the left. The ship turned on its side as it executed a wide loop that brought it back toward the village. Request a pickup just east of the village, the ground forces commander said. The primitives have ran into the forest a few miles from here. Be nice if we didn't have to walk. The pilot laughed lightly as she opened fire on the farmland again, the ground erupting in a storm of dirt and debris. She continued to fire, marking a trail all the way to the perimeter of the burning village. Her ship sank lower and lower, now only meters above the ground. She released the trigger and pulled the nose of her ship skyward while pushing the throttle forward. She felt the G-forces push her into the plush seat, the engines roaring as she shot skyward. She felt three times her weight on her chest, the world dimmed, and her vision narrowed. She pulled back on the throttle and leveled off, the weight and tunnel vision disappearing in seconds. She breathed heavily, gasping for air. A smile creased her lips. I could just burn the forest, Lieutenant, she said, finally replying to the request. That would be simpler, came the humor-filled reply. But Command wants this to last, ratings and all that. So how about that pickup? The pilot lowered the nose of her ship, descending rapidly toward the planet. I'm on my way. Chapter 22 Happy hunting, Lieutenant, the pilot called as the landing gear touched the soft earth. Lieutenant Mikor palmed the hatch actuator and watched the hatch slide to his right. A blast of cool, humid air engulfed him. The whine of the engines drowned out all other noises as Mikor waved his troops out of the hatch. He counted heads, satisfied when the tenth Belega stepped through the hatch. He turned, made eye contact with the pilot, and offered her a pinky up, the equivalent of a thumbs-up for the humans. The pilot returned the gesture, and Mikor stepped through the open hatch. He dropped three feet into the knee-high grass. He let the momentum carry him into a prone position, his rifle out in front, his eyes scanning the forest a hundred meters away. A wave of heat washed over him as the ship lifted. He relished the warmth as the grass beat his face in the exhaust. Mikor lowered his head to avoid the debris. The noise and gale-force winds diminished as the ship raced skyward. The Belega lieutenant looked up, shivered as the engine prop wash dissipated, and watched the shuttle circle the forest. I can't see any movement, the pilot called to the communicator that covered his left ear. Confirmed, Mikor acknowledged. Team six, up. The blue-skinned Belega rose from the brown grass, weapons pointing toward the forest. Each alien wore a green and brown tunic serving as camouflage, and a coat over their standard blue uniform. Pistols sat on their left hips, short-barrel rifles filled their hands. Over-the-ear communicators and form-fitting helmets completed the basic gear. Knives, canteens, extra energy packs, and extra pistols complemented the equipment, each Belega carrying their preference. Alpha, take point, Mikor directed. Gamma, bring up the rear. Five overseers moved forward in a loose V, followed by the remainder of Team 4 in an inverted V. Ten meters separated the two legs of the formation as they proceeded toward the trees. McCor took his position in the center of the formation, able to command either element at a moment's notice. Heading for its apex, the sun sat high overhead, beating down on the Belega. The team approached slowly, each step methodically placed as alien eyes scanned the tree line. The armed shuttle continued to circle above in a wide arc, the engine noise the only thing breaking the silence in the late afternoon. Unit 4, 
Mikor called into the small mic near his left cheek. Anything? No movement, the female pilot responded. We are going in, the alien stated. Alpha, move a single arrow arched from the forest. Mikor froze, watching the two-foot-long wooden projectile slice through the still air. The world slowed, the sight of the projectile mesmerizing. It completed its arc and began its descent before the overseer recognized its destination. He opened his mouth to yell as the sharpened flint tip cut deep into his chest. The force of the impact knocked him back, and he fell, the arrow pointing toward the sky. Mikor lay on his back, staring at the wooden shaft in disbelief. Pain radiated from the wound, stretching out to fill his chest. He craned his neck, eyes bulging as he reached for the arrow. I... I... he gurgled, but the words would not form. His strength faded. A face filled his vision. The Gamma Squad leader... Don't move, she said. Stay still. The lieutenant let his head fall back to the ground, and he listened as she called in for the ship to pick them up. Unit 4, we are taking casualties. Need immediate... A dozen more arrows arched from the forest high into the air. Mikor saw them and weakly raised his arm, pointing. The gamma leader turned her head in time to take an arrow in the face. She groaned and fell, her head landing on his chest. Screams echoed across the plain as the barrage connected with the remaining members of Team Six. Another volley arched through the air, the arrows landing in among the dead and dying Belega. Mikor felt a burning sensation in his leg. Coming in, Mikor heard through his headset. Prepare your wounded for immediate lift. Footsteps approached, running through the knee-high grass. Mikor tried to raise his head, the pain in his chest and leg zapping his strength. Human faces entered his vision, blocking the clear sky. Strip them, a gruff voice ordered. Pain streaked across Mikor's body as a human shifted him to one side, relieving him of his rifle and pistol. He heard the roar of the shuttle's engines as it returned. The pitch changed, and Mikor imagined the nose flaring in preparation to land. He jumped at the whine of energy weapons and the dull thump as they hit the ship's fuselage. Despite the pain, Mikor turned his head and watched the savages fire at the ship with the confiscated Belega rifles. His eyes followed the crisp purple bolts and watched as the shuttle listed and rolled before crashing into the ground. The resulting explosion scattered debris across the landscape. The Iroquois let out a victory yell, the sound more tormenting to Mikor than the pain in his chest. He dropped his head back to the ground and closed his eyes as the savages danced in celebration around him. Kill me, he muttered. No, overseer, one of them answered. Mikor opened his left eye and saw an older human standing over him, shaking his head. The savage wore only a loincloth, his tan body covered in green and black paint. He wore a heavy animal hide jacket. A dull brown headband circled his forehead. You will watch as your kind dies, just as we have watched our brothers and sisters die from many harvests. Chief Porter has decreed it. The savage smiled, hefted a stolen rifle in his hands, turned, and left Mikor lying in the waning sun. Sunbeams streamed through the overhead canopy as Mac moved slowly, silently through the thick forest. A flock of birds took flight somewhere above, invisible through the branches and leaves. He moved a sapling aside, careful not to let it swing back into its normal place. Soft leaves crunched under his feet, a stolen Belega pistol in his hand leading the way. Sweat dripped down his recently shaved green and black striped face. The camouflage paint ran from his face and down his body, blending with the light and the woodland-covered animal skin he wore. His combat boots, the only original item of clothing on his body. Behind him, a dozen Iroquois warriors moved through the trees, spread out in a wedge formation. The strike team left the Tuscara village right after the funeral and spent most of the last two days moving toward the tower Max spotted during his escape. During the trip, he taught them basic infantry movements, as well as a few traditional Iroquois battle techniques. The men learned quickly. Serena moved along with the strike team. Leaving Samish in the care of the apprentice healer, she refused to leave Mac's side. 
She wore camouflage like Mac and carried a bow and arrow. She trained alongside the men, and Mac wondered if he had inadvertently introduced women's lib to the Iroquois of the 24th century. Mac held up a hand to halt the formation. He waved, palm down, and everyone squatted. He knelt to a knee, listening. He heard and felt the wind as a gentle breeze penetrated the forest canopy, the cool air soothing his hot skin. His eyes scanned the area, and he nodded to himself. With another wave, the formation rose and continued. A few hundred meters later, he called another halt. The forest ended at the edge of a cliff. A sheer ten-meter drop led to a small stream below. Beyond the water lay an open field with knee-high grass swaying in the light breeze. The sprawling Belega complex he saw days earlier dominated the center of the field. From his vantage point, Mac could see past the cluster of buildings to the large lake in the distance. The center tower reached three stories tall, with three large parabolic antennas on the roof. A small building sat at each corner of the fenced perimeter. Mac took a knee beside a tree on the edge of the cliff and took out a water bladder. He drank heartily while watching the complex. The rest of his strike team did the same. Serena nestled up beside him, peering over his shoulder. He felt the heat of her body, her deep gasps as she tried to catch her breath. The smell of her sweat filled his nostrils. What now? she whispered. He motioned for Gillen, the Kaya tribesman, as quiet as a rabbit in the woods. Spread everyone out. I want every warrior to get a good look at the layout. He looked at the sun, halfway up the horizon in front of him. The overseer should be attacking the village soon. He turned to face Gillen. When that happens, Borda's forces will scatter. It will take them some time to find the others, and for the real fighting to begin. That gives us some time. And then we draw their forces here, Gillen nodded. Away from our people. Mac smiled at our... Borda's endorsement of Mac made him an honorary Iroquois. He was determined not to let them down. Yes, Mac affirmed, we draw them here. He looked at the tower, and we use their own weapons against them. Go, set security like I showed you, then move your strike team into position. Mac pointed to the small stream below. I'll let you know when to begin. Gillen smiled, a menacing snarl that showed his gleaming white teeth. We will be ready. He turned and disappeared quietly into the forest. Now we wait, Mac answered Serena. We will watch the facility, noting their guard positions, rotation schedule, and anything else we can see. And then, when we're ready, we strike. The sun moved past its apex, heading westward, and dark shadows stretched from the hilltop forest toward the Belega complex. Gillen crouch-walked, using the shadow to approach the western perimeter. His bow felt good in his hands, a reassuring weight, a notched arrow ready to fly. The shadow ended thirty feet from the fence, and Gillen lay prone, waiting patiently. One warrior, a young Iroquois named Lilan, mimicked his movements. The young warrior proved himself during the last harvest, dispatching three Dega warriors barehanded, Camouflage paint covered Lilan's broad chest and arms, long hair braided down his back. Gillen heard the boy fidget as he lay and knew the warrior would have to learn patience. Three other Iroquois from his strike team approached the complex from the east, using the tower's shadow for their approach. Gillen sent them ahead hours ago after his final talk with Mac. No alarms, no additional security meant that they went undetected. Movement drew his attention to the fence. He squinted, concentrating on a pair of overseers as they patrolled the perimeter. They wore heavy jackets and carried short-barreled rifles. Bored expressions plastered their faces as they proceeded back and forth. They met for a moment, almost at the end of the shadow, exchanged a handful of words in their own language, and then continued on with their route. Gillen let out the breath he did not know he held and tried to calm his racing heart. When the shadow touches the fence, they die, he thought, recalling the prearranged signal. He scanned the fence, made sure that neither guard looked his way, rose, and let loose an arrow. The projectile flew high into the air, arched, and hit one of the parabolic antennas on top of the building. 
The flint tip clanged into the metal dish with a spark. The nearest perimeter guard paused for a moment, staring up at the roof. He gave the Belega equivalent of a shrug and carried on his route. Another arrow impacted a few seconds later, the answer from the other team. The guard did not even look the second time. Gillen turned his head and made eye contact with Lilan. Stay here, he mouthed. Watch my back. The young warrior nodded and positioned his bow and arrow for quick use. Gillen moved forward, following the forest shadow to within ten feet of the perimeter fence. He lay prone, his brown animal skin clothing and painted camouflage blending seamlessly with the knee-high grass of the flatland. He waited patiently as the overseer patrol walked past again. The two exchanged another greeting. One laughed at something the other said, and the two separated, moving back the way they came. Gillen counted to ten, then rose like a wraith from the grass. He crossed the last few feet, bent down, and placed two sharpened metal spikes, fashioned wire cutters, courtesy of Max Ingenuity, against the bottom of the chain. His muscles flexed as he applied pressure and felt the first link snap. He quickly looked left and right and let out a breath when the guards kept moving away. He snipped a second and a third link in the chain, laid on his back, and shimmied through the small hole. The sharp edges scraped his skin and snagged on his clothes. Gillen grimaced, wishing he had cut another link. He ignored the pain and completed his breach of the perimeter. He paused long enough to ensure the fence showed no evidence of tampering, and then ran toward the nearest building, fifty feet away. His back against the wall, he crouched down, gasping for breath, heart pounding. He listened, but heard no alarms, no running feet of pursuers. He gulped, trying to wet his dry throat, and settled in to wait. The guards returned a few minutes later, the same pattern, the same greeting. This time, the other alien laughed. They turned and headed back in the direction they came, only this time Gillen followed the one on his left. Gillen earned his reputation by stealth, cunning, and ruthlessness in battle. The infiltration put all of his skills to the test. Adrenaline surged as he stalked his prey, staying in the shadows as he followed the alien, slowly closing in. His skills, honed in countless battles against humans, provided the advantage against the alien. Gillen silently drew a dagger from a sheath on his left, his footsteps silent in the grass. The Iroquois warrior did not lunge, did not break stride. He simply closed the gap, grabbed the alien around the throat from behind, and plunged his dagger into the belega where a human's kidneys would be. The overseer stiffened, paralyzed. Gillen removed his blade, released the alien's throat, and sliced the exposed neck with a single slice. The blue being crumpled, falling to the ground as blue liquid stained the knee-high grassland. The Iroquois turned and retraced his steps, moving past the breach in the fence and taking up a position near the other guard's patrol route. Gillen fought to slow his racing heart and control his breathing as footsteps drew near. He tensed his legs, ready to spring. The alien drew alongside his hiding place, and Gillen pounced. His knife sliced through the overseer's back, penetrating his heart in a single stroke. The blue alien fell without uttering a sound. The overseer accompanying him gasped. Gillen whirled around to see a second belega, eyes wide in panic and fear. The alien appeared young, a new recruit without combat experience. He froze at the sight of the camouflaged Indian, and Gillen took advantage of the alien's fear. The Iroquois lunged as the alien opened his mouth to scream. Gillen's left hand clasped over the belega's mouth. His knife sunk deep into the alien's chest. The force of the attack sent the alien stumbling backward, and Gillen stayed with him. The recruit fell, the Iroquois landing on top of him, the knife plunging deeper into its blue chest. Gillen watched the life drain from the alien's eyes, helpless to yell out around the hand clamped over its mouth. The Iroquois warrior sucked in oxygen, breathing heavily from the rush of adrenaline. Centraco! Gillen looked up to see another overseer a dozen yards away standing at the corner of a building. The alien pointed with his right hand, his left fumbling for the pistol holstered on his left. 
A thousand thoughts raced through the warrior's mind, but Gillen knew, in the end, he had only one chance. He leapt to his feet and charged the alien. Time slowed as he crossed the distance. Each step drew him closer to the overseer. He felt the slight breeze cool on his sweat-soaked skin. He heard his pulse in his ears, the crunch of the grass under his feet as he ran. The musky odor of the overseer filled his nostrils, the weight of the dagger in his hand reassuring. He watched the alien pull the weapon from his holster, and Gillen knew he would lose the race. The alien raised the pistol. The barrel looked like a dark, bottomless crater. An arrow zipped past Gillen's head, hitting the overseer center mass. A second arrow followed on the heels of the first, then a third. All three buried deep in the alien's chest, their wooden shafts protruding from his body. The Iroquois slowed, then stopped three steps from the alien. The overseer looked down at the arrows in his chest. His pistol forgotten, the weapon fell from lifeless fingers. The alien fell to his knees and looked up at Gillen with sad eyes, before toppling over on his side. The warrior turned to see Lilan standing at the fence, bow in his hands. He reached for the quiver on his back, retrieved an arrow, and notched it on the string, all while maintaining eye contact with Gillen. The young Iroquois nodded, and Gillen returned the unspoken salute. Lilan crouched, disappearing into the brush without a sound. Gillen set to work, dragging the arrow-filled body out of sight, then retrieving the other two aliens. The sun had disappeared behind the elevated forest by the time he completed his tasks, and the camp sat in the shadow of the mountain. The light waned fast as the sun continued its descent. Gillen, a voice hissed from behind him. The warrior whirled, dagger up and ready. He relaxed when he recognized Mac, Serena, and the rest of the strike force squatting inside the breach of the fence. Gillen exhaled and waved them forward. The team melted into the shadow of the main building. Are you all right? Serena whispered. Yes, Gillen managed between breaths. A metallic clang from high above drew everyone's attention skyward. Gillen stared at the antennas for a moment before turning his gaze to Mac. A smile creased his face. The way is clear to the main building. Mac nodded and then waved the entire team forward. Gillen waited until everyone passed, then brought up the rear of the formation. His primary role in the assault concluded. I hope the rest of the plan goes as smoothly, he thought, as the small force entered the network control center. Chapter 23 The perimeter lights of the network control center flared to life, bathing the area beyond the fence in a harsh glare. The automatic lights, switched on at sunset, set a flurry of animals scattering through the knee-high grass. The strike team, led by Mac, jumped at the sudden illumination and the rustling as the creatures scurried away. The Iroquois hugged the wall of the building, eyes scanning the area for movement. Mac squatted, Belega pistol in his hands, near the main door to the NCC. Serena crouched beside him, as did Gillen and the rest of the strike force. He watched as two Iroquois warriors pulled open the steel door, grunting with the effort. The door creaked open on rusty hinges. The Space Force commando looked around nervously at the sound, but saw no movement. He stole a glance inside. The corridor beyond lay dark, foreboding. The Iroquois made quick, quiet work of all the perimeter guards, and Mac wondered how long their luck would hold. He admitted his surprise that no alarm sounded. He shrugged away the thought as the two warriors stepped away from the doors. You stay here, Gillen addressed the two door openers. Guard the rear. Both men nodded, remaining silent as they panted for air from the exertion. Follow me, Mac ordered the rest, hefting the stolen pistol. Stay as quiet as possible. The gathering nodded. He took a deep breath and pushed his way through the small opening between the doors. The dark of the exterior immediately transformed into a bright, barren corridor, and he froze. He saw no one in the old earth block-constructed passage. There was no furniture. Nothing hung from the walls. Max saw nothing but scuff marks on the ancient tile floor and a motion sensor to activate the lights. 
He breathed a sigh and motioned for the rest to move inside before he quickly traveled halfway up the corridor where another motion sensor activated another set of lights. With everyone inside the facility, Mac led the team deeper into the NCC. Serena touched his arm. What is this place? Her whisper in his ear sounded like a shout in the silent passage. This is the Aliens Network Control Center, he replied in a whisper. He stopped at a junction and stole a glance around the corner. The corridors remained empty. He slipped around the corner, hugging the wall, Serena right behind him. No, she said quietly. What was this place in your time? Max stopped at the question, and Serena bumped into him. The rest of the team froze, eyes scanning the passage for threats. Mac waved off their concerns and searched the walls for a clue as to the original purpose of the building. Doors sat at regular intervals down the long corridor. A small rectangular window sat off-centered in each door, right above the doorknob. The drop ceiling tile appeared old, water-stained in places. The tile floor sat scuffed and pockmarked, a testament to years of use and abuse. Mac moved forward and looked through the window in the nearest door. A large room lay beyond, empty. Windows lined the far wall, boarded up with a layer of block and brick on the outside. The walls lay empty, except for long green boards lining the wall between the door and the boarded up windows. He pulled back, placing his back against the wall, and sighed. A school, he said, addressing Serena. He saw her puzzled look and continued. As kids, we would come here to learn. He kept his voice low, eyes scanning the corridor. Sadness, anger, and determination flooded the astronaut at the thought of the aliens converting the school into their network center. Let's keep moving, he hissed. Gillen took the lead, moving quickly and quietly up the corridor. He motioned for Mac and pointed at a stairwell. Eight stairs led to a flat landing, then another eight stairs disappeared overhead. Light spilled down the stairs, the motion sensors on the second floor active. Mac nodded up the stairs and mouthed, quietly. Gillen flashed a toothy grin and skulked up the stairs, two other warriors on his heels. Less than a minute later, Gillen appeared on the landing, bloody knife in hand, and motioned for the rest. Mac led the remainder of the team up the stairs two at a time, their feet silent on the concrete steps. He left the stairwell and stopped. Two Belega lay in the corridor, pools of blue blood slowly expanding around their bodies. Wires hung from the ceiling, toolboxes sat on the floor. A maintenance team. Small double-stacked lockers lined the corridor. Some hung open on rusty hinges. He stopped realizing that he stood in a primary school. He stared at the walls, the floor. Was this mine? Max shook the thought from his mind and motioned toward a second stairwell halfway down the passage. Gillen nodded and led his vanguard down the hall. Voices from above halted their advance. Gillen and his companions retreated back to Mac and the rest of the strike team as heavy boots descended the stairwell from above. One belega rose his voice. His gruff alien words echoed in the corridor. His gruff alien words echoed in the corridor. His tone changed, became shrill as he passed the landing. His companions laughed, and Mac exhaled as he realized that the alien told a joke. He motioned for the team to spread out and readied his pistol. The Iroquois moved silently, picking vantage points for the hasty ambush. Mac's eyes glanced at the two dead technicians and shook his head. Things are about to get hot. He clicked off his safety with the flick of his index finger. The aliens continued to laugh as they exited the stairwell 20 meters from Mac. The maintenance team exited the stairwell nearest the strike team, and it took a moment before the first Belega saw the blood. Irindri? the alien asked, shock resonating in his voice. His eyes left the blood, focusing on the bodies, then his gaze slowly rotated to look down the corridor. His ice-blue eyes locked with Max and widened. The alien opened his mouth to yell. Mac pulled the trigger. The stolen pistol bucked lightly in his hands as it discharged a bolt of high energy. The bright purple beam flashed down the corridor in the blink of an eye, slicing through the chest of the alien, his mouth wide open. 
The whine of the shot echoed down the corridor, the smell of ozone wafted into Mac's nostrils. A hail of Iroquois arrows followed a heartbeat later. The two-foot-long flint-tipped projectiles sliced through alien flesh. Three aliens dropped from the barrage. Two others staggered back from the impacts, wounded. Mac adjusted his aim and fired, the bolt slamming the nearest alien in the throat. She fell over the stair rail, disappearing from sight. The last remaining Belega turned and ran up the stairs, his footfalls reverberating in the quiet passageway. Mac ran in pursuit, Gillen and the rest on his heels. He pumped his legs, taking the stairs two at a time. He could hear the alien above him, pounding on the tile corridor. He had to keep the alien from raising the alarm. He made it to the top of the stairs and rounded the corner and saw the alien squatting in the corridor holding a rifle, a squad of armored Belega behind him. The alien fired. Bulltree felt more alive than he had in years. The elder Kaya stood a few meters into the forest. Belega energy beams, their winds filling the air, sliced into the trees, igniting limbs and leaves as the aliens advanced. Blue bodies littered the landscape from the edge of the trees through the open field where six alien ships sat. The sun sat low on the horizon, long shadows stretching deep into the woods. Despite the sun in his eyes, a wide grin split his face as Bulltree pulled back the bowstring, held it for a moment, and let the arrow fly. The projectile hit an advancing alien in the throat. The overseer fell grasping at the arrow protruding from his neck. Bulltree put his back to the tree and pulled another arrow from his quiver. As he set the weapon to fire again, he looked at the warriors assigned to him. A few lay on the forest floor, charred burns scorching their bodies as crimson blood stained the leaves and straw. But only a few. The majority of his warriors lay in wait, dozens of meters, into the wood line, while Bulltree and his handful presented a token resistance. All part of his plan to lure the aliens into a trap. Another energy bolt slammed into the tree at his back, and Bulltree pulled the arrow to his ear, left his cover, aimed, and fired in a heartbeat. He felt the heat of a near miss and returned to his hiding spot, unable to see if he hit his target. He rearmed and executed the same maneuver, this time rewarded by an alien scream as the arrow sunk deep into the arm of an overseer. Fire lit his right side. Bultry slammed his back against the tree and looked at his right side. Blood dripped from a dark and scorched wound halfway down his ribcage. Two more inches and I would be dead, he thought. He looked to his right and made eye contact with another warrior and saw the concern in his eyes. Bultry simply smiled and nodded. Best time he had had in years. Fall back, the elder Kaya ordered, pointing deeper into the forest. Fall back! Sucking in a breath against the pain in his side, Bultry left the cover of the tree. The bow in his right hand, his left covering the wound, he sprinted away from the aliens. He zigzagged along a winding rabbit trail, surrounded by small saplings and thorny bushes. Purple bolts flashed past him, and he watched them explode against the forest foliage. Plants and trees sizzled around him. The barrage lessened, and he knew the aliens pursued him. A quick look left and right showed that his remaining delay force ran with him, delving deeper into the forest. He passed a rough line drawn in the dirt of the forest and pumped his legs harder. His heart pounded, and his ragged breathing rang in his ears as he passed the rest of the Iroquois warriors lying in ambush. He topped a small rise, heard the whine of an energy bolt, and dropped to the ground. He rolled three times, coming to rest against a downed log, his body aching with exertion and his wound. He placed his back to the log and readied an arrow. From his perch, he could barely see over the small rise and the aliens that followed. They never knew what hit them. Dozens of warriors opened fire from both sides of the trail. Spears, arrows, and energy beams from the stolen Belega rifles tore through the running aliens. Arrows bounced off the overseer armor. The long spears dealt glancing blows, causing the blue Belega to stumble and fall. Energy beams sliced through armor, skin, and bone. Aliens crashed to the ground, their momentum pushing them several feet before they came to a rest. Those that did not die in the first few seconds took cover, their blue bodies and armor contrasting the brown and green foliage. 
The aliens did not wear camouflage outerwear like their predecessors, their blue jackets contrasting with the dark green foliage, easy targets. The Iroquois continued to rain arrows and energy beams upon the aliens. Paslichi, one of the overseers called, and the alien assault team began to withdraw in teams. Two teams provided covering fire, while a third retreated. The Iroquois pursued, slowly pushing the blue aliens from the forest. Bulltree rose from his vantage, picked up a discarded alien weapon, and joined his warriors as they pursued the overseers. The ground grew slick with blue blood, the air thick with the moans of the dying and the whine of energy beams. Despite the pain in his right side, Bulltree still smiled as he pulled the trigger on the short-barreled Belega rifle. He watched another alien fall, his back awash in flame from the Kaya shot. Darkness now shrouded the landing zone, and the aliens left the forest, fleeing toward the blinking lights of their ships. The glow of the engines provided a perfect backdrop for the Iroquois, silhouetting the Belega. A hail of gunfire lashed from the forest, striking aliens, ships, rocks, and grass indiscriminately. Only a handful of Belega made it back to their ships. Engines revved and the ships lifted. All four of the craft spun on their axis and headed north, over the distant lake. Fall back into the forest, Bultry commanded. He watched the glow of the engines disappear as the ships turned in a wide arc. Deep into the trees, go, now! The ships, low on the horizon, grew larger. The elder Kaya hefted the short-barreled rifle. The roar of the engines grew, and the first energy beams lashed out from the ships, exploding in the forest. Trees erupted, sending shards of wood in every direction. Heat washed over Bulltree as he stood his ground at the edge of the forest. The pain in his side forgotten, he raised his rifle and fired. Chapter 24 Gillen tackled Mac, both men skidding across the old tiled floor of the refurbished school. A hail of energy beams flashed above them, thumping into the wall down the corridor. A wall of student lockers stopped their slide. Mac, tangled with Gillen on the floor, fumbled to bring his pistol to bear on the belega down the corridor. He stared at the alien barrels tracking them and knew he was too late. A chorus of battle cries drowned out the whine of energy beams. Mac watched as the aliens paused, their heads turned, distracted, as the rest of the Iroquois strike force charged from the stairwell. A volley of arrows flew down the hallway, most of them off the mark. The Belega, still staring at the humans, tracked their weapons toward the charging warriors. Mac fired as fast as he could pull the trigger, the pistol bucking lightly in his hands. He didn't really aim, although he did hit a couple of the Belega. His mind set on distracting the aliens enough for the Iroquois to reach them. His plan worked. Halfway to the Belega, the warriors dropped their bows and drew long daggers. They continued their war cry and closed on the enemy. Mac stopped firing and, still entangled with Gillen, watched a massacre. Steel hacked and slashed in the light from the overhead illumination strips. Belega screamed. Energy pistols whined. Grunts of effort echoed as the Iroquois stabbed. One overseer blocked a downward thrash with his pistol. The dagger connected, knocking the weapon from the blue alien's grasp. With nothing to block the next attack, the overseer fell, struck through the chest. Mac shot an alien as he attempted to flee, his purple beam flashing down the hallway. It lasted less than a minute. Mac and Gillen untangled themselves and rose from the floor. Gillen stood, wearing a maniacal grin, Fire lit his eyes as he offered Mac a hand and lifted him off the floor. Blue and red blood mixed on the floor, creating a slick purple mess. Gillen joined his warriors, gently separating the wounded from the dead. Serena appeared from the stairwell and began treating those she could. You three, Mac pointed to a trio of warriors with cuts and abrasions. Stay here and assist Serena. Gillen and the others come with me. The trio nodded, displaying looks of disappointment. Gillen offered them a nod of assurance and whispered something to each that brought a smile to their faces. Gillen joined Mac at the head of the column as they proceeded toward the far end of the school hallway. What did you say to them? Mac inquired, dropping the energy pack from his pistol and slapping in a new one. I told them to protect her, Gillen replied with a grin, and that we would do our best to run a few of the Blue Devils toward them. Mac smiled. 
You are a good man, Gillen, and a great leader. He patted the Iroquois on the back. Now, let's see if we can keep your promise. The eight men separated. Mac led three down the right side of the passage. Gillen led the rest on the left. Mac heard the squeak of his shoes on the tile, the breaths of the men around him, but nothing else. He looked at Gillen's feet, then at the rest. The Iroquois were barefoot. He shook his head, suppressing a smile, and continued down the hallway. Heated voices broke through the quiet, and the strike force slowed. Approaching carefully, they arrived at the last door in the hallway. It sat slightly ajar, a sliver of light beaming into the passageway. Mac stole a glance through the small window in the door and felt his heart rate spike. Banks of controls, computers, and monitors filled the room, displaying games from around the planet. It resembled the director control station on the Extrinsi on a smaller scale. Mac scanned the monitors and identified the big game safari in Africa, the Gladiator Coliseum in Europe, a snowy landscape with a handful of shivering aliens, and a forest battle. Mac narrowed his eyes at the last screen. Despite the darkness, he could clearly see the Belega retreating under fire. The ships lifted, flew in a wide arc, and returned to the forest, firing into the dark trees. Explosions and fire lit the night. A single Belega stood in the room, pistol in his hand. He stared at a full-size hologram of Stith as the two engaged in a heated discussion in their native language. The alien, obviously angry, shouted something, pointing toward the door with his pistol. His eyes remained locked with the hologram, daring, defiant. Stith's image bristled. His menacing response did nothing to dissuade the Belega's hostility. Mac glanced at Gillen, nodded, counted to three, and burst into the room. He fired once killing the lone Belega with a shot to the head. Mac stopped a few feet in front of the hologram, satisfied at the shocked look on Stith's face. The rest of the strike force fanned out, searching the room. Mac heard a solitary scream, followed by metal striking flesh, then silence. Gillen joined him, and they stared at the hologram. The Iroquois reached out, his hand passed Stith, blurring the image. He jerked it back, shaking it. His eyes narrowed studying the image. Gillen did it again. The image blurred, and again pulled his hand back sharply. I'm not really there, Savage, Stith said in flustered English. He looked at Mac. Explain it to him. He's not really here, Mac mocked, and turned to Stith, studying the image. You've been promoted. Congratulations. Thanks to your escape, Stith admitted. Command is most pleased with the ratings. If this continues, I stand to gain a great deal. Thank you, Captain. Don't thank me yet, Mac countered. I now control your main broadcast hub. With a flick of a switch, your entire broadcast goes dark. Stith turned and uttered something in Belega. The monitors in the room flickered. Every view changed to split screen, showing both Mac and Stith. You are now live, broadcasting throughout the galaxy. Sentient beings from hundreds of worlds are now watching the final moments of the final season of Harvest Day. You wouldn't dare cut off the broadcast. Try me. Stith's image stared at Mac, anger and fear in his eyes. Suddenly, his features softened. What do you want? I want the Belega gone, Mac stated, off of Earth forever. The Belega has spent considerable resources taming the planet. Stith shook his head. There is a lot of investment in infrastructure, the games. I'm afraid I cannot grant that request. He turned and said something else in Belega. Another blue-skinned alien appeared at the edge of the hologram, nodded, and disappeared again. That is my condition, Mac reiterated, raising his pistol toward a bank of controls. Leave or go dark. Captain, if you are going to kill the transmission... What's to stop me from simply blasting the NCC from orbit with you in it? Stith's smug, condescending voice gave Mac pause. You won't, Mac said, and heard the hesitation in his own voice. Would he really blast the facility? Cut his own throat? Is there a backup NCC? Yes, there has to be. If you leave me no choice, Stith smiled. I assure you, Captain, the last thing the audience will see is your destruction. You won't risk it, Max said, wishing he actually felt the confidence he put in his voice. 
your galactic consortium would have your head on a platter. Stith laughed, a hacking sound that set chills down Max's arms. That is funny, Captain. That is exactly what I promised my superiors. Your head. Mac turned his attention to the control stations, readouts, and monitors. He learned a lot from the pilot during his escape and thought he recognized several words on the controls. Only one way to know for sure. He turned to Gillen. Take your warriors and leave. I will disable the facility. If they do bomb us from orbit, they will do it without an audience. No. Serena's voice called from the door. Mac turned to see the woman, her eyes gazing at the hologram. She stepped into the room. I will not leave you. You must, Mac said. I do not want you here if things go wrong. I am not leaving. Defiance dripped from her voice. Mac took her by the arm, putting his back to Stith. Whatever happens, I do not want them using you to promote their games. Go with Gillen. He will keep you safe. A quick look at the warrior drew a curt nod. Go. Max smiled and gave her a wink. I'll be fine. Don't bet on it. Stith's hologram interjected. I love you, Serena declared. And I love you too, Mac replied. Yes, cried Stith jubilantly. Profess your love. Ratings just jumped another two points. Mac ignored the hologram. Go. Take care of the wounded. I'll be right behind you. Gillen took the woman gently by the arm and led her away. Mac stood there for a moment, staring at their diminishing shadows in the hallway. Touching, Stith's hologram mocked. Very touching, and ratings gold. Mac took three steps to the nearest control panel and tentatively flipped a switch. Nothing. He touched another, and one of the split-screen images flickered, returning to the forest battle. A solitary figure stood at the edge of the wood, firing a seemingly unending stream of energy beams at the attacking ships. The trees behind him blazed, silhouetting him against the flames. After your death, and the death of your friends, Stith continued, taunting, I'm going to find out why my predecessor was so enthralled with human females. I'm going to kill you, Mac murmured, still studying the control board. No, Captain, Stith replied. Not today. Mac touched a button. The monitors went black, and the hologram winked out of existence. The day isn't over yet. I'm going to kill you, the human said, his holographic back to Stith. The commander stood in front of four monitors. One showed Mac in the NCC control room. The other three showed different images of the battles raging below. The forest, the exterior of the NCC, and the now destroyed villages of the Tuscara and Kaya. He had already ordered another dozen camera drones to the surface. He wanted nothing to escape the view of the audience. No, Captain, Stith replied. Not today. The human touched a button, and the hologram vanished. Stith turned and looked at the ratings, saw them rise another three points, and smiled. Viewership was nearly off the scale. He shifted his gaze, watching his ships make another pass at the forest. The four ships flew in formation, blue energy beams piercing the night. The trees, most already on fire, exploded under the onslaught. Stith stared at the sole human standing in the field, still firing at the ships. They flew directly over his head, and he hit one of them three times. The craft veered to the left and lost altitude. It almost righted itself before nosediving into the trees. The resulting explosion sent flaming debris high into the air. Destroy that human, Stith said, and get a camera working in the NCC. I want the audience to watch as the good captain tries to thwart my plans. Many of the screens in the control complex flickered. A few died completely, cutting off the feeds from the big game safari and Solo, the island games. The Harvest Day feeds continued but grew grainy. What is happening? he demanded. The signals are being stopped at the source, a technician replied from a nearby console. The North Continent NCC is no longer transmitting eight channels. Make that nine. The Belega cursed. Call off the forest attack. We will deal with them later. Stith sneered as the ratings fluctuated for a moment. Send our remaining forces to the NCC. Have them retake the facility. Kill whoever gets in the way. And disable the air defenses around the NCC, Stith nodded. They can land inside the compound. That should keep Captain McMillan occupied.
The three remaining airships strafed the forest, blue energy beams igniting anything not already on fire. Trees exploded under the barrage, scattering burning debris into the air. They turned, maintaining a tight V formation, and lined up for another run. Return fire from the ground, the single human with a rifle, glanced off of the lead ship's cockpit. The pilot flinched, sending the ship off course, its energy beams missing the mark and igniting the grasslands. All ships, this is command. The communication system crackled. You are to immediately proceed to the network control center south of your position. Air defenses are down. Land inside the compound and eliminate all hostiles. Repeat, eliminate all hostiles. Retake the facility. Acknowledge order. The pilot of the lead ship stared out the cockpit window at the human standing in the inferno below. Fire surrounded the human on three sides, leaving only one route of escape. A momentary thought of closing the trap surfaced and quickly discarded. The order said immediately. Acknowledged, the pilot snarled and adjusted course. We will be there in six minutes. We're down to three ships, less than a dozen troops. Reserve status? We are launching the reserves now, command answered. They will arrive ten minutes after you. By order of Commander Stith, you will land and proceed into the complex. Kill all humans and regain control of the NCC. En route, the pilot confirmed, and the communication circuit died. The clear starry night beckoned the pilot. A slight crescent moon shone brightly to his left. He recalled a recent expedition to the lunar surface, the only R&R the Belega received in this God's forsaken backwater part of the galaxy. If you call walking around in a spacesuit R&R, he smirked. Still beats staying aboard the ship the entire tour. He let his mind wander as the dark landscape passed by below. Six minutes of flight south passed quickly, and a warning tone from the console brought him back to his current mission. Blue eyes scanned the controls, and the Belega reopened the comm line. Command, this is Assault Force. I am being tracked by the NCC air defenses. Confirm the system is shut down. Stand by. Silence filled the cockpit. Distant lights drew his attention, and the pilot adjusted course. The NCC complex grew quickly. He saw the main three-story building and the smaller outbuildings. The perimeter fence came into focus, the exterior lights offering an unobstructed view of the surrounding area. The pilot pulled back on the throttle. The warning indicator beeped again, a red light on the console flashing in time with the alarm. Command? Abort! Abort! The voice from command screamed in panic. The human has... Bright orange beams leapt from the four small buildings around the main tower. The anti-aircraft fire converged on the three ships. The craft to the pilot's left exploded first, peppering his ship with flaming debris. He jerked the controls to the right and up, slamming the throttle forward. Energy beams tore through the fuselage, igniting the fuel reserves. He heard the whistle of the hull breach for almost two seconds before the world ceased to exist. By order of Commander Stith, you will land and proceed into the complex, kill all humans, and regain control of the NCC. Mac heard the command and swallowed the lump in his throat. His heart pounded in his chest so hard it hurt. He stared blankly at the console before him, wishing he knew more of the Belega language. Been lucky so far, he said aloud, and began studying the controls again. He moved to the next console, determined it controlled auxiliary transmission lines for the main antennas, and continued to the panel on his right. He brushed the hair from his eyes, his hand coming back slick with sweat. He rubbed his hand on his animal hide shorts and kept moving to his right. The next panel contained a small diorama of the compound, complete with the four outbuildings. Heat level indicators fluctuated on each of the buildings, and Mac paused to study the information. He recognized the words climate and temperature from the thermostat aboard the Belega ship. The lines on the display showed a massive amount of heat generated from the buildings. He unconsciously wiped away the sweat on his brow. Thoughts of the six-month harvest timetable surfaced. Mac placed both hands on the console, leaning forward as he stared at the controls. Terraforming. They are terraforming the planet to make it more hospitable for them. He shook his head. Raise the temperature, increase crop yields, more shows. And they can leave the jackets aboard the ship. Bastards. 
He turned the dials down and watched the indicators fall. He stepped back, raised the pistol, and fired. He pulled the trigger three, four, five times, watching the console melt under the barrage. Smoke bellowed from the circuits. Sparks arched skyward, dissipating in the warm air. He holstered the pistol and stared at the destroyed control panel. The silence in the building suffocated him, and he wished he had not ordered everyone away. No one should die alone, he mumbled, moving to the next panel. He almost bypassed the dark controls, took a step toward the last panel in the line, and stopped in mid-motion. He centered himself over the blacked-out console, and a smile crept across his face. The console reminded Mac of the fighter weapons console he blasted three days earlier. A center screen, flanked by gauges and indicator lights, sat in the same configuration, and he thanked a long-forgotten deity for military standardization. A single faint amber light offered the only indication that power flowed to the controls. He touched a button beneath the amber light. The system flickered to life, power gauges slowly climbing as the system recharged. Indicators flashed and buzzed. Multiple buttons blinked for attention all at once, and Mac stared, fingers poised, confused. Which one does what? The energy levels turned blue, indicating full power and all of the buzzing stopped except for one indicator under the center screen. Three small icons appeared on the screen closing in toward the center of the view screen. The button flashed about once a second with an accompanying buzz. Mac's finger reached for the button, hovered over it, and paused. Just a little closer. A worried voice echoed in the room, and Mac jumped at the sound. Command, this is Assault Force. I am being tracked by the NCC air defenses. Confirm the system is shut down. Stand by. Mac counted down from five, watching as the three icons closed in on the NCC. At zero, he touched the button. Command? Abort! Abort! The human has... Mac heard a thunderclap outside. The building shook, and dust rained from the ceiling as the compound's defenses opened fire. He turned his head to the left, watching one of the drone feeds that still broadcasted. Bright orange beams streamed from the four buildings that surrounded the three-story school. Each ship took a hit before the fire converged on the ship on the right side of the viewer. It exploded, raining debris across the landscape. Mac flinched as a piece of fuselage bounced off the lead ship. The ship nosed up and banked to starboard. The orange energy beams hit the underside of the ship, one after another, in rapid succession. Mac winced when the ship disappeared in an expanding ball of gas. Glass shattered in the school as pieces of the ship crashed into the building. The last ship roared over the compound, fleeing south. Orange beams reached for the ship, but missed as it began to corkscrew. The laser fire missed again, growing closer with each volley. Mac stood watching the screen, mesmerized, as the bolts found their mark, sliced through the fleeing ship's engines, and reduced the last Belega ship to flaming dust. Chapter 25 Commander Stith stared disbelieving as the last ship of his strike force fell from the sky in flames. Stunned silence filled the control room of the Extrinsi. Only the normal beeps and sensor echoes fought the quiet. He sat down heavily, watching as his entire reserve force, six ships and three dozen soldiers, streaked toward the planet. Two rows of technicians, each responsible for a drone camera monitoring a game, sat at their consoles. Stith noted that many of the monitors remained dark, thanks to the human in the control center below. He watched as a few removed panels from the console, crawling deep inside the circuitry in an attempt to override the blackout. Sir, his female adjutant pointed, breaking his thought. Look at the ratings. Stith turned his head, eyeing the monitor attached to his command chair. The ratings climbed with each second. He smiled. The commissioner is calling, she continued. His smile vanished, replaced with a sneer. He quickly hid that and touched a button on his console. A holographic image from the waist up of the consortium commissioner appeared before him. Ice-blue eyes stared at Stith, contrasting with the Belega's black suit. 
the commissioner stood in his office, the window behind him, offering Stith the view of the barren landscape of home. What in the ice mines of Grinsel is going on there, Commander? Sir? Don't play games, the Belega spat. We are getting intermittent signals from the game, Stith. What is going on? The humans have revolted, Stith replied, calm washing over him. I told you they were dangerous. We are losing equipment and personnel, the commissioner said, and Stith noted the order of precedence. It was his own, and his respect for the bureaucrat edged up a notch. What are you doing about it? I am committing genocide, Commissioner, launching an all-out assault on the humans. They will be extinct within the hour. Stith flicked the switch on his chair. A small icon appeared above the hologram's head, flashing steadily. But more importantly, I direct your attention to the ratings. The Commissioner stared at the flashing indicator for a moment, mouth slack and eyes wide. Is, is this accurate? Even with the partial blackout, Stith crossed his arms smugly. I have the highest rated show ever. Can you sustain this? Until the humans are wiped out, yes. After that, Stith gave the Belega equivalent of a shrug. You must regain control of the NCC. My forces will be on the ground in less than ten minutes, Stith replied. I was about to go to the last commercial break before the finale. If I may suggest, tell the advertisers, now is the time to pay. The commissioner turned and barked orders at someone off screen. When he returned, his face was flush with excitement. Give us three minutes. If I may, Stith rubbed his ears and thought, now may be the time to discuss my next assignment. What? I want a governorship, he mused, uninterrupted. Some place closer to home, say Alpha Centauri? Now is not. It is the perfect time, Commissioner, Stith interjected. He leaned forward, closer to the hologram. My orders here and now determine the ratings. I am sitting on the largest rating score in history. That has to be worth command of a planet. The Commissioner stared back, the excitement in his face turning to anger. His eyes stared at the ratings and the time. Commander, we can discuss this after... I need your answer now, Stith stated, his tone leaving no room for discussion. He stared, unblinking, at the Belega hologram only inches from his face. The hologram nodded. Go to commercial, Stith ordered. Three minutes. I want us back on the air two minutes before those ships land. Yes, sir, his adjutant replied. There is one stipulation, Governor, the commissioner scoffed. What's that? You personally kill the human. Captain... Captain McMillan? Yes. The commissioner nodded. You go down to the planet and you kill him for the cameras. Stith smiled. With pleasure. Gillen squatted behind a large pine to the north of the compound. The distant lights and flaming debris at his back cast long, flickering shadows. The crescent moon sat high in the sky, adding little illumination to the night. A slight breeze stirred the trees, cooling his skin. Nothing moved in the wood. No animals stalked the darkness. Nothing called out into the night. The earlier firefight and crashes drove them away. The Iroquois shifted, readying his stolen alien rifle. Five Belega ships sat in an open field a mile north of the NCC. A sixth ship lay in a flaming pile of rubble deep in the trees to his left after venturing too close to the aerial defenses. Alien soldiers exited the ships and formed into three groups of fifteen. Several others stood before the formation giving last-minute instructions. Gillen strained, listening, but could not hear the words from his perch. The Belega formed three V wedges, spread out, and began moving south. Gillen turned his head and made eye contact with each of the nine warriors around him. In the pale light, he read anger and determination on their faces, but no fear or remorse. He knew that they would fight beside him to the death, and the thought gave him comfort. Recalling something that Mac told him earlier, he offered a smile. If you fight for what you believe, then today is a good day to die. The nine warriors returned his grin, brandishing their alien rifles, and disappeared into the night. Gillen watched them go, 
knowing they would spread out along the ridge they occupied, a ridge that offered a perfect ambush on the approaching aliens. The Iroquois, now alone, sighed and let his shoulders slump. Fatigue plagued his muscles. He drained the last of the water from a water bladder, tossing the empty container aside. He scooted toward the edge of the rise at the precipice of a four-meter drop to the valley below. At Mac's request, Gillen led his warriors north, figuring on the most likely approach by ground forces and a little intel gleaned from listening to Belega transmissions. The NCC computers maintained a very helpful translator program, and even though it may have been a diversion, Mac asked the warrior to delay the ground assault any way he could. Gillen moved north, found the likely landing zone, and then backtracked far enough to keep eyes on the area. A scout found the small rise topped with trees, and Gillen decided to make their stand there. With the roar of approaching engines, he found a fallback position and then instructed his warriors on the plan. We hit them, officers first, as Mac instructed, Gillen explained. Once they begin to counterattack, we fall back to that small rise, he pointed into the darkness behind them, and then do it again. Remember, do not fire until I do. The Iroquois nodded, and Gillen turned back forward. The mild, humid evening created a gleam of sweat on his brow. He wiped it away with his arm. The blue aliens stepped from their ships, and he shook his head at the thick winter coats they wore. Now, those same aliens entered the valley where Gillen and his warriors waited. The Belega moved quietly, but not tactically. The three V formations tightened inside the confines of the valley, the distance between elements shrinking. Most of the blue aliens slung their weapons over their shoulder, shuffling along as if on a stroll instead of a march to contact. In the middle of the center V, three officers chatted quietly, oblivious to the world. Gillen waited. The first element passed his spot on the rise in a slow, sauntering pace. No one looked at the ridgeline around them. Most simply stared at the ground, watching their footing in the dark. Sighting down the bulbous barrel of the rifle, the Iroquois aimed at the center officer in the formation. Gillen moved the rifle, tracking the officer, until the alien was directly in front of him and four meters below. His finger tightened on the trigger. Gillen fired, adjusted his aim, and fired again before the first alien fell. Bright purple beams lit the night, streaking from the ridge and creating a deadly strobe effect in the tight valley. Screams replaced the whine of energy beams as wounded Belega fell. Gillen pulled the trigger as fast as he could, raking his rifle back and forth across the formation. The energy beam struck arms, legs, the valley floor, and the resistant body armor the aliens wore. Many Belega staggered backward under the impact of the high energy beams and fell injured. A quarter of the aliens, including two of the three officers, lay dead or wounded. The rest rose from the dirt, weapons in hand. Gillen ducked as return fire strafed his position. Small superheated explosions covered him in debris, the whine of the lasers sounding like angry hornets as they blew chunks of dirt, trees, and rocks into the air. He heard a scream and saw one of his warriors stagger backward, his chest charred from several direct hits. The man fell backwards into the trees, small flames licking at his wounds. The Iroquois rose and fired a handful of beams randomly. He felt the heat of a near miss flash past his left ear and dropped back down out of sight. Fall back, he cried and ran into the woods. He sprinted along the ridgeline and heard footfalls behind him but did not look back. He knew they had to fall back to the next position. He also knew that the next ambush would not go as well. Engines roared behind him but he did not look back. He pumped his arms and legs, concentrating on running and not tripping on the roots and bushes in the forest. The engines grew louder, directly overhead. Purple beams sliced through the night, igniting trees and leaves around him. He heard another scream and knew that a second warrior had fallen. The firing around him intensified. Flashes of light, bolts of heat raced past his body. A searing pain lanced through his left leg, and Gillen fell. Light bathed the area spotlighting him from above. He slid on the dried leaves of the forest floor, pain radiating from his leg and coursing throughout his body. He lay flat, rifle out front, and began firing at the muzzle flashes approaching him. He watched a third warrior fall under the onslaught of alien fire. 
The sight of his man fallen fueled his anger, and Gillen fired as fast as he could. The aliens ducked for cover, and Gillen rolled off the ridge. He fell three meters, landed on his left leg, and screamed in agony. The sound echoed off the valley walls, and he heard return shouts as the aliens moved on his position. Gillen gritted his teeth against the pain, raised his rifle, and fired at the shadows moving toward him. The air buffeted Stith's fighter as it traversed the atmosphere. He nosed the craft into a steep dive toward a large body of water. The crescent moon's sparkling reflection shimmered in the lake's waves. He pulled back on the throttle, slowing the craft before leveling out at 500 feet. The horizon to his left burned, and he altered course, the ship banking that direction. He reduced airspeed, watching a raging inferno engulf a forest at the edge of the lake. A smile crept across his face as he touched a button, activating his forward cameras, sending a direct feed to the extrinsic. This should garner a few more points from the ratings, he thought, as the ship left the water for dry land. He sat up, leaning over the controls to get a good look at the fire. He saw dozens of people running across the grassland between the inferno and the lake. They still live, he smirked, and reached for the firing controls. Laser beams flew from multiple locations across the landscape, the impacts tossing his fighter back and forth. Stith sat heavily, cinching his harness tight. Sparks flew from the weapon station, alert indicators lighting his board. He pushed the throttle forward, creating another shower of sparks, and the fighter left the forest behind. He turned to his right, staring directly into the eye of a camera drone sitting on a shelf. There will be time to round them up later. For now, let them enjoy themselves. It will make their defeat even more delicious. He continued south, the dark landscape irritating him. He longed to see the sprawling cities of the civilized planets, the endless city lights. The darkness mocked him, reminding him that he commanded a ship on the fringe of the galaxy. That would soon change. Galender Stith his female adjutant's voice called to the communication system. We have a report. Ground forces have met resistance north of the control center. They have sustained casualties, but have the situation under control. Recommend you fly to the east and make your approach. Splashes of light ahead drew his attention. At this distance, he could not make out the details of the fight, but he did note that most of the fire went one way. He smiled and ordered command two drones to record the fight. Stith looked beyond the firefight and saw the lights of the NCC in the distance and the smoldering embers of the craft brought down by the air defenses. His smile waned. Stith adjusted course and headed for a small clearing east of the NCC. He set the ship down with barely a bump and powered down the controls. He made eye contact with the camera drone, smiled, and left the cockpit. He grabbed a short-barreled rifle from the main compartment, activated the ramp, and stepped out into the night. He shivered at the cold 70 degrees, pausing long enough to pull the collar of his coat over his neck. Hefting the rifle, he charged the weapon. Now, Captain McMillan, he smiled for the drone following him, time for you to die. An energy beam tore Gillen's rifle from his grasp, his hands numb from the impact. He fell back against the valley wall and turned his head away from the harsh light from above. The roar of the engines drowned out all other sound. Fire burned from the wound in his leg. He collapsed, slowly sliding his back down the dirt wall until he sat on the ground. Today is a good day to die, he repeated Max's phrase, only to have the words evaporate in the rumble of the engines above. He raised his left hand, shielding his eyes, and watched shadows and silhouettes close in on him. The images morphed into the long-necked humanoid bodies of the Belega. Rough hands grabbed his arms, hauling him to his feet. Gillen winced at the fire in his leg, but did not cry out. He stood as best he could, an alien on either side supporting him. The overseers spoke in their native language, yelling over the din of the ship above. Dozens more aliens arrived, milling around, the battle over. Another Belega arrived, blue blood staining his coat. Fire lit his blue eyes. 
Gillen recognized him as one of the officers he shot. The malicious gleam in the alien's eyes sparked the fighting spirit within the injured Iroquois. The officer issued an order, and the rest of the crowd formed a semicircle around the Iroquois. The officer raised a pistol, pointing it at Gillen's chest. The warrior stood tall and stared the alien in the eyes, unflinching. Gillen snarled. He saw a flash, heard the whine of an energy beam, and a scream. The belega to Gillen's right fell. The Kaya watched the blue alien crumble, then turned his attention back to the officer. The world slowed. The belega's eyes narrowed in confusion, and he looked past the warrior. Another beam flashed through the night, striking another alien. Dozens of energy beams followed, blasting from each end of the valley. The officer turned his head to issue orders. Gillen found renewed strength and charged. He drew a dagger from his belt and plunged the blade deep into the overseer still holding him. The alien gurgled, releasing Gillen as he fell. The Iroquois withdrew his blade and turned to face the officer, standing less than two meters away. The Belega had his back to the Kaya, issuing orders and firing his pistol into the night. Energy beams lanced upward from both ridgelines, raking the bottom of the ship with fire. The spotlight exploded, plunging the valley into darkness once again. The engine pitch changed, the shuttle listing to port as one engine died. The ship turned to escape, exposing its starboard engine to the fire. The craft exploded in midair, hurling debris in every direction and lighting the area one last time. The crisscrossing energy beams in the valley created a strobe effect, with the Belega strike force caught in the center. Gillen spun his dagger to an underhand grip and charged the officer, despite his wounded leg. The Belega, his eyes still locked on the expanding gas cloud of his ship, never heard the Iroquois, nor did he make a sound as the blade slid deep into his back. He simply raised the pistol and tried to turn on Gillen. The Iroquois twisted the knife as he grabbed the alien's gun hand. He stared, eye to eye with the overseer, both men locked in place. The strength faded from the belega, the life draining from his eyes. Gillen laid him gently on the ground and pulled his blade from the alien. He grabbed the officer's pistol, stood, and turned to face his next opponent. There were none. Small fires, set from the ship's falling debris, offered enough light for Gillen to see the carnage in the valley. Alien bodies littered the landscape, some still alive, writhing in agony. None posed a threat, and Gillen leaned against the valley wall again. He heard the triumphant cries of the Tuscara and the Kaya split the night. He smiled. Borta. The heavy trod of horses, accompanied by running human feet, filled the valley. Gillen watched as Iroquois warriors flowed from both ends of the battlefield, systematically and ruthlessly killing everything not human. Gillen closed his eyes and leaned his head back against the dirt wall, creating a small avalanche that sprinkled his face. He smiled, then laughed, the stress of the battle flowing away. In all of his battles, he had never been so close to death. The thought sobered him and he opened his eyes to see Chief Borda standing over him, hands on his hips, yellow headband glowing like a beacon in the darkness. Gillen struggled to his feet, favoring his uninjured leg. Is that all of them? Rest, Borda instructed. He moved in, grabbed Gillen by the arm, and lowered the wounded man back to the ground. Is that all of them? Gillen repeated. He sat, his leg throbbing in pain. Here? Yes, Borda answered. One overseer ship flew east. Mac, we need to go now. We will handle it, Borda cautioned. Stay here with your men. Rest. Your fight is over. Gillen shook his head. Your daughter is there with Mac. You need us to show the quickest route. Borda's eyes bulged slightly at the mention of Serena. His confident demeanor wavered slightly. Can you ride? the chief asked. Try and stop me. Chapter 26 Commander Stith gripped the rifle in both hands as he stalked the perimeter of the network control center. Bright lights lit the exterior, but he saw no guards, no humans, nothing. The animal creatures slunk away from him, a predator among predators. He listened intently but heard nothing but the steady whine of the generators that powered the complex. His communicator buzzed, and he froze. 
He dropped to a knee and pulled the small device from his belt. Stith. The ground forces have been destroyed, his adjutant reported without preamble. Recommend that you withdraw until we can call on reserves. There is a ship en route. It will arrive in three days. Stith looked up into the camera eye of the drone, programmed to follow him. Knowing the adjutant watched, he shook his head. Send whoever we have left, he ordered. Blast them from space if you have to. This ends tonight. It's the series finale. The generators changed pitch from a steady rumble to low growl, growing into a whine. He snarled. The good captain has found a way to overload the generators. We don't have three days. He flicked off the communicator and tossed it aside. I'll call them back from the NCC. Stith, rifle in hand, entered the compound. He ran from building to building, unopposed. He paused at the door of the school long enough to drop the heavy coat. He wiped the sweat from his neck. The exertion and stress of the movement warmed his body. He twisted left and right, feeling the freedom of movement, and stepped into the open doors of the first floor and came face to face with Captain McMillan. Both men jumped, recovered from the shock, and brought their weapons to bear. The human knocked Stith's weapon off target, losing the grip of his rifle in the process. Both weapons clattered across the floor, out of reach. The camera drone entered the room and took up a position above the door, watching dispassionately. The generator whine continued to rise. Stith stared at the human, his mind racing with possibilities. His hand twitched toward the pistol on his left hip, but knew the man would be on him before he could draw. He took a step to his left. Mac mimicked the movement. You have cost me greatly, Captain, Stith began. He recalled the interrogation, looking for an angle to get under the human skin. But, as with any endeavor, there is now the possibility of great reward. I offer you a chance to save what is left of the human race. No deal, Mac replied, his foot snapping at Stith with a front kick. Stith jumped backward, the attack barely missing. The commander put his hands out, blocking the next kick by pure luck, and moved out of range. He circled, wringing the stinging and numbness from his hand made by the impact. Stith's confidence waned. He had never, in all of his years of service to the Belega, fought someone using kicks like that. He had to stall, to think. You, you haven't heard my offer yet. Don't need to, the human taunted. You came here to kill me. That does not endear trust. Circumstances change, Captain. Stith grunted, kicking with his left foot like Mac. The human blocked the clumsy attempt easily, slapping the alien across the face. Stith fell to the floor, his left cheek on fire. He scrambled to his feet quickly. You can save your entire race, Stith continued, a plan forming in his mind. He needed Mac to hit him again, but did not relish the accompanying pain. All you have to do is surrender. He kicked again. Mac blocked the kick, hitting Stith again, this time in the abdomen. Stith staggered backwards, fell, and crawled away from the human. He gasped for breath, the blow landing perfectly on the Belega version of the diaphragm. Stith placed his hand on the wall, slowly pulling himself up. He stayed there, leaning against the wall, for several heartbeats. With a practice draw, Stith pulled the pistol from its holster, spun, and pointed it at the human. He breathed a sigh of relief as Mac held up his hands. The human took a step forward. Stith shook his head. As I said, circumstances change. You have done me a great service, Captain. With your arrival and interference in the harvest, you have given me a great opportunity for advancement. So, as a reward, I will kill you quickly. And the Iroquois? They too will perish, Captain, Stith confessed. You are not their savior, despite what they believe. The Iroquois nation is united once again, Mac replied. They will destroy you. Ah, Stith smiled, lowering the pistol a little. The prophecy. Let me tell you a secret, Captain. The prophecy is false. They think I know exactly what they think. We implanted the idea of the prophecy into their legends three hundred years ago, Stith laughed. Why? Mac demanded. Why? because humans need a reason to live. They need hope. After our initial attack, your race was destroyed, demoralized. Cities were destroyed, entire continents reshaped. Humans were unfit for the games. 
The survivors needed something to cling to. So my grandfather, Taryn, invented the prophecy. Max smiled, undermining Stith's confidence. Taryn was a very intelligent being, he confessed. He knew that my trajectory would bring me back. He also knew that humans posed no threat to your burgeoning empire. Your grandfather foresaw the downfall of his own race. No, Stith snarled, disregarding the human's words. He knew how primitives think and simply gave your kind a glimmer of hope, a hope that is about to die. He raised the pistol again. For the camera, Mac murmured, looking up at the drone above the door. Stith involuntarily looked upward, realized his mistake, and quickly pulled the trigger without looking. The energy bolt flashed down the empty corridor, exploding harmlessly against the far wall. Stith felt the human bowl him over. Both fell to the floor, sliding across the ceramic tile. The wall stopped his slide with bone-jarring quickness. Somehow, he managed to hold onto the pistol. He saw the human jump to his feet and face him. He looked ready to charge, eyes wide with rage. Stith raised the pistol, his hand shaking. He climbed unsteadily to his feet, the impact with the wall making him quiver. Good try, Captain, Stith offered, breathing heavily. Thank you for the effort. It only helps the ratings. He raised the pistol and let a smile crease his lips. Time for the finale. Pain seared his left hand, and Stith screamed, dropping the pistol. He grabbed his left hand with his right, eyes bulging at the sight of an arrow protruding through his palm. He looked from his hand to Mac, who appeared equally astonished, and then to the door. Serena stood with two warriors, bow and arrows in hand. Time seemed to slow, and Stith watched in slow motion as the woman reached behind her back and produced an arrow from a quiver slung diagonally across her back. She notched the arrow onto the bowstring, pulled it back, and held it, the arrow tip pointing at Stith. The show is canceled, she said. Stith saw the arrow fly, felt it slice deep into his chest, and watched the world fade to darkness. Go! Go! The whine of the generators grew louder with each second. It burned through the night at an ear-splitting pitch. Mac, along with Serena and the two Iroquois, ran from the main building in the NCC complex. Fatigue gripped Mac. It had been a long night, but he leapt upon a waiting horse like he was twenty again. He gripped the reins, kicked the animal in the flank, and held on. Each bounce on the horse's spine brought a wave of pain through his tailbone, but he held on. It reminded Mac of why he always used a saddle growing up. Maybe he would show the Iroquois how to make them, if they survived the upcoming explosion. The four passed through the main gate to the compound and rode north, the overloading generator whine decreasing with each minute. They turned west toward the same ridge where, only hours before, Mac launched his attack. The horses slowed to a trot, struggling up the rise. Torches and fires lit the ridgeline. He heard the victory yells before he saw the gathering. His eyes locked onto a yellow headband in a sea of tanned bodies. Chief Borda of Iroquois. Mac pulled on the reins, stopping the horse, and slid from the steed's bare back. He rubbed his butt absently, happy to be off the jarring animal. Mac greeted Borda and dozens of other warriors. He saw the wounded Gillen standing with the help of a small sapling. A handful of camera drones circled the mob, filming every aspect of the victors. Mac wondered briefly what the alien races throughout the galaxy thought of the uprising on Earth. A smile creased his lips as he thought of the galaxy revolting against the Belega. I hope their reign is over. A rumbling explosion drew everyone's attention to the network control center. Smoke billowed from each of the four outlying buildings, drifted lazily into dark and starry sky. The center building, the three-story school, appeared to shimmy for a moment before ceasing to exist. The explosion obliterated the building, leaving a meters-deep crater in its wake. The shock wave reached Mac and the Iroquois a moment later the sonic boom shaking the hill where they stood. Debris rained for miles. Brick, block, wood, ceramic tile, and electronic components scattered across the countryside. The remnants of the compound burned, the flames lighting the night. Mac turned to the nearest drone, watching as the machine wavered, then fell, inoperative. 
the other handful of drones followed suit, crashing unceremoniously to the ground. The Iroquois yelled in unison, a triumphant war cry that Mac believed the aliens could hear in orbit. Mac felt a hand on his shoulder and turned to see Borda standing beside him. I thought you would like to know. Zemish is awake and asking for you. Relief flooded Mac. Where is he? The forest near the village. The overseers burned most of it, but killed very few Tuska. Iroquois. Thank you, Chief, Mac smiled. That is great news. A warrior approached, holding a drone in his hands, a puzzled look on his face. Why do they not work? Mac shrugged. Maybe they drew their power from the generators, he said, pointing to the flaming complex. When they blew, the power was lost. The overseers cannot see us? he asked. No, Mac said. You are finally free. Another joyous cry from the crowd. Will they return? A voice called out as the noise subsided. I don't know, Mac said truthfully. He looked to the smoke-filled sky. The stars appeared to twinkle, giving him hope. I have a feeling they will have their hands full for a while. Another whoop from the crowd. Serena gripped his hand tightly, and the two stood quietly, staring at the flames in the distance. She laid her head on his shoulder. The woman who saved his life. Twice. Is it true? Serena asked. About the prophecy? I don't know, Mac replied, pulling her close. But you believed it, and now you are free. That is all that matters. She snuggled her head onto his chest. He stood, watching the flames engulf the remains of the network control center. Mac held her, content with life for the moment. He did not know what the future might hold. But he knew two things. He could face anything as long as Serena was by his side. He was home. This has been Harvest Day, written by R. Kyle Hanna, narrated by Rick McVeigh. Copyright 2019 by R. Kyle Hanna and Jumpmaster Press. Production copyright 2020 by R. Kyle Hanna and Jumpmaster Press.